Okay, so first of all, I, I invite all the people to, to sit down. It is uh, time to start uh, this uh, EBC 2022 edition. The, I mean, we like uh, to start uh, uh, focusing on techniques, so first session will be on new and uh, old te techniques. The, uh, the organization was uh, still a little bit influenced by coronavirus, even if we are happy to see each other on presence uh, in, for many of you, of you. But there is some other people that has not been able to reach uh, Madrid, and uh, their contribution will be uh, delivered virtually. So uh, in the program, you will see in red uh, the people that uh, will not be physically here, and in black, the people that uh, is uh, together with us. In this uh, session, uh, I will be uh, sharing it with uh, also Rajiv Bhagat, Bhagwat from uh, India. And uh, we have also on remote Caroline Frangos Noble. The, the panelists on site will be Jul Julien uh, Ajedi, Sergi Fucato, Sonia Salinger, and uh, Shidara, very difficult, Copa Lasatri. I hope that I did it uh, correctly. And on remote, we have uh, Abid Assali and Mazuran Segalian. Okay, the first presentation will be on remote from uh, one of the speakers. So thank you to all of you remotely uh, connected. Uh, a, a speaker that contributed a lot to the EBC from Japan, Dr. and friend Yoshi Murasato. He will uh, speak about the feasibility and the efficacy of an ultra short side branch dedicated balloon in coronary bifurcation stenting. Yoshi, it's for you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, the, uh, we are sorry to uh, attend uh, the in person. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, my presentation, uh, upload, please. Thank you for invitation to EBC 2022. I'm Yosem Murasato from Kyushu Medical Center in Japan. My topic is the feasibility and efficacy of an ultra short side branch dedicated balloon in coronary bifurcation stenting. It is my disclosure slide. Pot side pre-pot sequence has been reported to have a superiority to conventional spinal kiss bone inflation in terms of less overstretch, less stent obstruction inside the ostium, and less stent uh, mother position. However, side branch dilation with a long balloon has a risk of the stent to deformation indicated in the slide. Therefore, report uh, is mandatory for the correction of this kind of stent deformation. Therefore, we propose using the ultra short balloon for the dedicated side branch dilation. Glider balloon, its length is uh, 4 mm. It's only dilated in the side branch ostium and we can minimize member stent deformation. This is the bench testing to compare the conventional side branch dilation by a long balloon and that by a short balloon. In the conventional side branch dilation, guideway deviation to the inner side at the side branch ostium is maintained during balloon inflation and stent deformation in the opposite side of the side branch is likely to occur due to the balloon straightening. On the contrary, side branch dilation with a short balloon could correct the guide wire deviation and provide optimal side branch osteo size dilation with less stent deformation. Recently, our study concerning the side branch dedicated ultra short balloon glider balloon has been published in the Euro Intervention. This is a single center prospective observational study. We enrolled the 194 patients in the 207 regions. Higher prevalence of male gender hypertension dyslipidemia was found in 80%. Diabetes mellitus also frequently observed in 40%. Region location is 42% uh, the left main and 40% the left anterior descending artery. 
and the true bifurcation region was enrolled in 46%. In terms of the procedure, average stand size is 3.1 mm, glider balloon size is 2.7 mm, which was relatively larger than previous studies. Port or port like inflation was performed in 85%. In terms of final size ventilation, glider balloon alone was performed in 92%. All procedure in all of the cases was guided by imaging. In the imaging analysis using the OCT, OVDA, and IBAS, stent malapposition and stent deformation is not likely to occur at the opposite side of the side branch. This kind of stent failure is likely to occur at the side branch side. And stent malapposition and under expansion was presented at the proximal to the bifurcation in 13%. Uh, this is an additional procedure except for the pot plus side ventilation. In terms of side ventilating, the frequency is quite few, 1.4% due to uh, using the ultra short balloon. Uh, stent deformation due to the side ventilation was found uh, in uh, only uh, 8%. Main finding is the Carina shift. Uh, this stent failure was mainly corrected by the report or members' direction. KBI only used 0.5%. In the non bifurcation site, any kind of the bifurcation stent failure uh, was found in the 24%. Uh, this stent failure was mainly corrected by the report or members' direction. Uh, KBI used only 1.9%. Therefore, Free from any additional procedure, uh, was found in uh, 68%. This is a clinical outcome at one year follow up. Uh, target region revascularization 7.2%, cardiac death 2.1%, myocardial infarction 2.1%, stent thrombosis 1.0%. So, all major adverse cardiac events, including uh, them uh, showed a 10.3% feature acceptable for the uh, bifurcation region. There were only three cases uh, which required the side stenting due to the dissection after glider balloon dilation. However, one case is a catastrophic case. That was the uh, left main case. We performed the uh, crossover stenting from the left main to the LED and the pot was performed, electric direction uh, with the uh, glider balloon was performed. However, in the angiography, a obvious uh, geographic miss was uh, presented. This short balloon slipped into the distal, which resulted in the spiral dissection in the LCX. Therefore, we should confirm the position of the glider balloon with the marker at the side branch ostium. Since this case, uh, we routinely perform this confirmation as a magnified view. Therefore, we have not encountered this kind of catastrophic spiral dissection. Cardina shift is a concern after side branch dilation long. It is likely to occur LED diagonal bifurcation, which has relatively narrow bifurcation angle. This is a typical case of the Carina shift. In this case, there is a rich plaque burden at the opposite side of the side branch. Without uh, enough uh, modification of the plaque, a member stenting was performed uh, that results in the under expansion of the stent expansion and Carina shift to the side branch. After side branch dilation, Carina reshift to the member cell occurred. Therefore, uh, this kind of condition uh, such as rich plaque burden in the opposite side of the side branch or hard calcification there or, or uh, kind of tip angle is very narrow was bifurcation point to the tip length is very uh, short. In such condition, the kissing balloon inflation has a priority uh, to the pot plus side branch dilation procedure. This is my conclusion slide. Combination with pot plus side branch dilation with an ultra short balloon provides an acceptable, acute, and chronic clinical result. 
This simple procedure also provides rest member stent deformation and overdilation and rest side bunch injury. Report is not necessary in 70% of the cases. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, the, the, thank you, uh, Dr. Murasato. Uh, if we have a question in the audience uh, or in the panelists, you, we, we may have. I have uh, a, a, um, a question. So how important is uh, imaging to uh, perfectly size this balloon and uh, minimize the shift? I mean, the position is intuitive, but I have the feeling that any time with even regular balloon, we undersize, there is higher chances to have the slippage. And as soon as the balloon gets very short, the risk of slippage seems to increase, at least in my practice. So, Yes, uh, imagine it's very important for uh, the bifurcation intervention, especially this uh, procedure, the pot plus uh, side vaccination. So uh, pot balloon uh, size is very important, uh, especially a polygon area, bifurcation core area, uh, sufficient expansion is necessary uh, to uh, get the optimal cell for the side branch and the optimal side branch uh, direction. Uh, if we perform the uh, kissing balloon inflation, we can get uh, enough uh, uh, extent expansion in the uh, bifurcation core area. However, this procedure, uh, pot only is uh, uh, expand, extent expansion in the uh, polygon area. So uh, we should confirm the uh, enough uh, sufficient expansion in the proximal member cell and the uh, pot, uh, polygon area. And uh, the optimal size uh, side branch uh, balloon should be uh, selected. So imaging is very important. Yeah, Lord Yoshi, I'm, uh, I have a couple of questions for you. One is uh, Dr. Francesco mentioned the slippage of the side branch balloon. Now the slippage does it depend on the angle? If you have a narrow angle, the slippage is less. Pronounce if you have a wider angle, the balloon slips, it doesn't anchor well at the ostium side branch. Number one. Number two, you uh, showed there is a 30% need for pot or kissing balloon, which is a large percentage. So, uh, balloon slippage uh, it's uh, only one case uh, that is the uh, left main, uh, relatively a uh, wide angle bifurcation. Uh, at that time, uh, we can uh, we could not confirm uh, the uh, actual, uh, accurate uh, position of the uh, glider balloon. Uh, so uh, after that case, uh, that catastrophe case, uh, we confirm the uh, glider balloon position at the side branch ostium uh, in the magnified view. So that is the point. After uh, that case, uh, we have not. Uh, encounter such kind of slippage and uh, the, uh, uh, some pulling uh, the side branch balloon uh, is a uh, tip and tricks uh, for preventing uh, such kind of uh, uh, slippage and, and the second question the yeah there was a need uh, there's a 30 percent need for pot part and kissing balloon which is a significant uh, percentage of, uh, of cases kind of question. So I think that there is uh, some... Uh, Yoshi, we do not hear you, but I think that we discussed, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the paper, so in the interest of time, uh, we go on. So next uh, speaker will be still on remote, uh, is Dr. Teru Yoshi Kuma and uh, he will report novel side branch uh, dilation, proximal balloon edge dilation, PREB technique. It is a great honor
to be able to speak to you today. I'd like to talk about our bench study entitled Novel Side Branch Dilation, Proximal Balloon Edge Dilation, PBED Technique. COI disclosure information are shown here. As for single crossover stent implantation in bifurcation lesions, our previous bench test showed conventional balloon dilation for side branch opening might cause stent deformation toward the side branch, resulting in an incomplete stent opposition at the opposite side of side branch osteo. We previously reported that proximal balloon edge dilation, PBED technique, might minimize the deformation of stent cells at main branch during side branch dilation. This time, we compared among the three different stenting optimization protocols using a fractal coronary bifurcation bench model that was designed with lumen diameters of 3.5 mm for the main branch and 3.0 mm for the side branch. Branching angle was 70 degrees. First, 3.5 mm stent was deployed in the main branch. Pot was performed by using 4.5 mm non-compliant balloon. Then, we compared among long overlapping kissing balloon inflation minimum overlapping KBI, and PBET groups. As you can expect, proximal LTCD ratio was significantly better in PBET group in comparison with long or minimum overlapping KBI groups. Between long and minimum overlapping KBI groups, LTCD ratio was significantly better in minimum overlapping KBI group. On the other hand, gelling ratio was not significantly different among the three groups. This slide showed the comparison of incomplete stent opposition. Incomplete stent opposition, both at the proximal and distal segment, was significantly fewer in PBET group compared with long overlapping KBI groups. And also incomplete stent opposition at the proximal segment was significantly fewer in minimum overlapping KBI groups compared with long overlapping KBI groups. This slide shows the representative video scope images after side branch dilation. Side branch ostium was directly visualized using a video scope like this. You can see nicely opened side branch ostium after side branch dilation. Gelling ratio was similar among the three different protocols. This slide shows the representative OCT images at the proximal main branch. LTCD ratio was relatively high and incomplete stent opposition was frequently observed in long overlapping KBI groups. On the other hand, minimum overlapping KBI and PBET groups shows maintaining circular geometry and stent opposition. To summarize, Proximal LTCD ratio was significantly better in PBET group in comparison with long or minimum overlapping KBI groups. In addition, incomplete stent opposition both at proximal and distal segment was significantly fewer in PBET group compared with long overlapping KBI group. There are some limitations in this study. The bench model can never entirely represent in vivo coronary anatomies. 
The present experimental study uses one type of coronary stent. The limited sample size may have influenced the conclusions in conclusion, in comparison with long and minimum overlapping KBI. The pot pivot protocol significantly optimized the final results of single crossover bifurcation stenting, maintaining circular geometry and stent opposition. Thank you for your kind attention. So, uh, do we have uh, the connection? Are there questions from the, do you have questions? Okay, we have a question from the audience. Yes, this is, can I have a question? This is Asali from the panel. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> um, my question is, yes. I can understand that there might be a proximal problem, especially when you're doing the kiss or the uh, just side branch, but how do you explain that there was a problem in the distal segment? Um, because the distal segment you don't touch. I mean, you've deployed the long stent across. So why, how do you explain that you had mallet position, et cetera, in the distal segment in your trial? I'm going to the co-author uh, of uh, this paper. Uh, the, uh, this, so uh, imaging, we use the imaging, uh, uh, especially so uh, first the uh, attachment stent strut at the vessel wall. Uh, so uh, the first uh, stenting uh, should be uh, deployed it as optimally. Uh, we confirm, uh, after confirm confirmation of the standard position, uh, we uh, perform uh, the uh, side branch dilation. Uh, this uh, technique is very similar as my presentation at the proximal edge, not to touch the opposite side of the side branch. Uh, it minimizes the stand deformation uh, due to the balloon stretching of the side branch balloon. Hmm. Yeah. So, what is the size of the balloon you you use one to one, or you undersize the side branch balloon, and at what pressures you go? Uh, the side branch balloon size uh, it's uh, uh, as uh, the di difference of the side branch. Uh, so, oh, not uh, small uh, smaller balloon. Uh, so optimal size for the side branch. And uh, if you use a non-compliant balloon, uh, the nominal pressure, uh, and, uh, if you use a, a very small balloon as we, uh, as I presented four millimeter or six millimeter, uh, the uh, six uh, to uh, eight uh, atmosphere uh, is enough uh, to uh, wide expansion in the side branch ostium. But at 6 to 8, if you don't go nominal, you use a non-compliant balloon? Are you using a non-compliant yeah, balloon? Uh, my uh, presentation, uh, the glider balloon, the same glider balloon. Uh, however, uh, Dr. Kumet's uh, uh, presentation is a non-compliant balloon. So, uh, um, it, hmm. I think the connection is a problem. Are you using ultra short side brand balloon or standard short balloon? Ultra short previously presented. But the problem is that uh, Yoshi is freezed, I think. Yoshi, Yoshi, are you hearing us? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, okay. Okay. So we have another question. 
from yes. uh, the, the remote the panelists. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you think that if you are performing a pot inflation after long overlap kissing balloon, the, the result would be different? Yoshi, yes. it's for you. Uh, lo uh, long overlapping uh, kissing balloon inflation uh, uh, cause of the elliptical strength deformation in the proximal side. And uh, such kind of elliptical strength deformation uh, is likely to cause the matter position in the proximal side. So uh, we uh, uh, avoid uh, such kind of the long overlapping. So a minimum overlapping KVT is better than long overlapping KVT. Uh, however, a pot plus uh, p bed technique is better uh, for the symmetrical uh, expansion in the stent, ex uh, stent expansion in the uh, member cell. Okay, thank you. So we move forward. The next presentation is by uh, Yutaka Ikiki. Thank you. Happy to see you. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm very happy to see you again. Uh, uh, please start my presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My disclosure. There are important studies show us that LCX opening after left main simple crossover stenting did not make better outcome. The result made a strong impression on me. All we have to do is implant a stent as a simple region. No more bifurcation region. No more EBC. However, wait, I picked myself up. There is a bifurcation region that does not work well with a simple crossover stenting. The pathological findings show us an important answer. Thrombosis instant implanted, left main shaft and left main bifurcation are extremely infrequent. However, once they occur, they can be fatal. It shows that this thrombosis can occur for a long time after treatment regardless of the version of the ES, and that the main pathological predictors for left main stent failure are marrow opposition and strut crossing and osteal side branch. This pro visualization study demonstrated that marrow opposition between outer wall and stent strut increased through flow region. Turbulence flow and low blood flow area always appeared on the back of the stent strut that is jailed the circumflex ostium. We should aim to improve the side branch expansion method. Then, outcome in left main bifurcation may be getting better. We verified possibility of the stent size selection affecting the acute result. In the same model, final KBI was performed with the same size uh, balloon and same pressure. By compare the left and the right image, you can see the difference in the form of the stretch stent strut. The red part showed the ISA area at the left main shaft. ISA volume can be calculated by integrated each slice. We also compared ISA area at the circumflex ostium after performed KBI under the same condition. Here are the results of experiments with 3.5 and 4.0 mm synergy. The red area indicates the ISA area. It can be seen that the result of the ISA volume of the left main shaft and the ISA area of the uh, LCX ostium are significantly higher in 3.0 mm group. This is my first conclusion. There are my 
bench study image, many conditions must be met in order to success. Bifurcation angle, stent size. A right side stood image show overstretched stent strut. Guide wire recrossing point. Side branch expansion method. There are many requirements. All the methods show hereafter are link free and distal rewiring model. Although they are uh, of different generation, both are two link stent and have the largest expansion diameter in the series. The upper row is the old version of Archmaster Tansei and lower row is the new version of Archmaster Nagomi. In Tansei, the stent strut was already stretched in 30 degrees and as the angle gradually increased, marrow position increased. On the other hand, Nagomi uh, has a different design, so that is still room. And difference in longitudinal strength density are also noted. This is a topic for today, a case of acute myocardial infarction with shock. Using IBUS after thrombus aspiration, reveal that the distal end was a little over 3 mm and left main shaft, uh, which is a, a proximal end, was about 5 mm. A 3.5 mm diameter Nagomi, which was the largest expansion capacity in the series, was directly stented. Uh, used the three times inflation method at 8 atmosphere, so that the distal end does not over direct and can be safely deployed. The left main shaft stent is always marrow opposed, so fast performed pot with a 5 mm NC balloon. Next, it is important to additionally direct the distal side which an NC balloon that much distal, which is called the distal optimization technique. Dot. I first proposed this name at the EBC a few years ago but no one has used it since. Finally, kissing balloon inflation is performed using the NC balloon that was just used and the semi compact balloon for circumflex. This process is a combination of methods that have been demonstrated at EBC in the past. There is a no dissection at uh, either end no mole oppose and no jade strut at any site. This is a final image. This is the final conclusion today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ishiki. I think that the idea of DOT was uh, really I mean, let's say appropriate, and uh, I think that we should uh, uh, think about inserting in our nomenclature. So, uh, the, uh, I think I learned from, uh, from this uh, presentation the fact that uh, the stand platform is really important uh, to, for the result as soon as we have big differences. So, I think that uh, all the images you showed convinced us about the fact that it is important and thank you for that. Are there questions? I see in that case uh, impella actively there in the left yes. ventricle. The patient must have been quite sick. So was it in the same uh, uh, procedure the thing was completed or the, you got back the patient the next day? How it was? It was in the same thing? Maybe if you are difficult even after imaging to size the vessel because in an acute situation there may be spasm, thrombus. I don't know how he sized the distal vessel LED. Yes, uh, um, this is, of course, I did acute, acute case, so I performed the uh, same day the inserted uh, uh, impera. And the uh, distal size always uh, performed and checked in the using the IBUS and the angiography and the uh, uh, 
this patient, uh, and after the uh, impera, the pressure and uh, uh, condition is stable. So I uh, in, uh, injection some uh, vasodilator, and I checked the, uh, the uh, uh, diameter and the length uh, of the both side, uh, both the di diameter and the length, and uh, using uh, uh, IBAS and uh, angiography. Hello. Hi, I'm Dr. Himanshu from India. I wanted to ask a question regarding the previous presentation regarding deformation of the main branch stent which happens after we dilate the side branch. Uh, in addition to the length of the side branch balloon which was discussed in the first two presentations, probably isn't it uh, also important where the connector lies in according to the carina? So if the wire goes proximal to the connector, we have more deformation. If we have a distal crossing, then we have less deformation irrespective of the balloon length that we use for kissing or for side branch dilatation. So there are so many yes. factors at play. Hmm. Uh, very important and difficult point to the, your, your answer and question. The, and the uh, uh, very important point is uh, the, uh, one of the important point to create, uh, we can create the, the uh, problem is the uh, link connection. The, uh, the, this is a very uh, difficult point. And the uh, guide wire recrossing point is, I always perform to the, uh, two choices this, this are part because the, uh, uh, if we, we perform the proximal part of the crossing, the, after then the KBI was side branch expansion made that deformation, the especially the side at uh, left main and the uh, uh, main best through uh, center deformation. And, and I always perform the KBI, not side branch, not use the side branch or the expansion and on the, on the, all the situation. The, because the uh, side branch on the expansion sometimes make a longitudinal deformation. So I firstly inflation the main vessel and uh, expansion side, side branch uh, 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 gradually. Uh, this is my uh, uh, technique or my side, uh, bifurcation technique. Thank you. Uh, I think we move forward. Next uh, presentation is by Tommaso Gori. Randomized non-inferiority trial comparing reverse tap versus decay crash for the treatment of complex left main bifurcation lesions. Thank you very much for inviting me. Dear Dr. Stankovic, thank you very much for inviting me to present our results of the paper Randomized Non-Inferiority Trial Comparing Reverse Tap versus Decay Crush for the Treatment of Complex Left Main Bifurcation Lesions. It is a true honor to be part of this meeting. Um, I am perfectly aware of the fact that there are different phenotypes here on the left side of left main uh, lesions. And of course, an individualized approach to each patient and each anatomical subset is necessary. Now, I'm very thankful and grateful to your club for institutionalizing and describing the different techniques that are available for treating these types of lesions. Of all those techniques, probably my favorite one and the one that has more randomized data to support it is the so-called double kissing crush technique. This is a rather complex but very safe um, technique that requires two rewiring procedures, a little amount of crush in the, in the side branch, and then is concluded by a proximal optimization technique preceded by a kissing um, PTCA. Now, in order to simplify this uh, technique, our group came up with the idea of proposing an alternate version of the so-called T and protrusion technique, which is, is usually a bailout technique to treat or, con or conclude a provisional stenting um, intervention. Now, this technique this is, is described in our methods paper. This was published in the BMJ Open 2019. And this slide comes from, this, uh, from that paper. Now, I simplified this description into this table, and those are the differences between DK crush and reverse tap. DK crush requires a little bit of protrusion of the uh, side branch stent, about two millimeters or so, 
while reverse tap is supposed to occur with a minimal pr protrusion of this uh, stand. In the decay crash technique, the side branch balloon and the wire are removed after the implantation of the side branch stand. In the reverse tap, this step, this step does not occur. The stand balloon, the side branch stand balloon is retracted halfway and inflated at very high pressure, followed by sequential high pressure inflations of the um, of the sentinel balloon placed in the main branch and of the um, stand balloon placed in the uh, side branch of course this skips one of the uh, rewirings rewirings that is, that is necessary in the dk crash technique so that there are, there are two side branch rewirings in the dk crash and only one side branch rewiring in the reverse step this simplifies simplifies a little bit the uh, procedure. In order to compare those two um, uh, techniques, we designed a randomized control trials where we plan to include 50 patients with complex left main uh, lesions. And we set a, a primary endpoint based on non inferiority uh, that is the stent expansion of the side branch uh, stent at the level of the um, ostium. Again, we published a, a methods paper, so you will be able to read all of the um, um, primary and secondary endpoints. This is the uh, power calculation described here. And we based our calculation on the results of the DK crash one trial, assuming a standard deviation of 11 in the endpoint side branch uh, stand osteal expansion and a non inferiority limit of 11%. That is, uh, we hypothesized that the, that the uh, reverse step would be at least 50% as efficient as uh, the improvement of DK crash versus traditional um, crash. This is a standard uh, way of proposing a, a non-inferiority uh, study. The primary analysis was performed on a per protocol uh, population of uh, course for a non-inferiority trial. So this is the workflow of the study. We have um, screened 208 patients to finally include the uh, 50 that provided the data. This is very short and very hard to read to show that both populations were similar, the DK crash group and reverse step with regards to uh, all procedural and uh, clinical characteristics. Because the, the reverse step technique is simpler, requires only one rewire, the procedural time was definitely shorter with reverse step as compared to uh, DK crash. In terms of uh, um, efficacy of procedural success and complications, the two techniques were absolutely uh, similar with a very high uh, um, um, rate of device and procedure uh, success. So those are the results of the primary endpoint. As I said, the study was designed as a non-inferiority study. The reverse tap technique showed non-inferiority and actually superiority as compared to DK crush. So the side branch stand osteal expansion was actually higher in the reverse tap technique, which also required less time to be performed as compared in the DK crush technique. All other parameters were essentially the same, similar main branch opening, similar rate and of malaposition and so um, on. Those are the six months OCT follow-up data, um, which showed, just said in a very, uh, in a very uh, short time, a larger opening area in both the main and the side branch, larger, less neointima proliferation in the reverse step as compared to the uh, DK crash group. However, a larger percentage of malapose strut in the reverse step as compared to the DK crash um, group. So in conclusion, a reverse step strategy for the interventional treatment of complex left main bifurcation lesions was in our study non-inferior and superior to DK crush for the primary endpoint side branch osteal expansion, required less time. At six months, it showed similar clinical endpoints. The study was of course not powered for those endpoints. However, the, uh, the um, treatment with reverse tap was associated with less new intima proliferation, larger um, uh, opening, and more malaposed struts. So 
Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take your questions now. Yeah, I have a question for you, Dr. Gori. What happens to the Karina in reverse tap? Well, we, um, it's an important question. We do have OCT images. We, uh, we haven't done a, a, an in vitro study with a, a micro CT, so I can only answer partially. Um, the, uh, our goal, uh, our primary endpoint was uh, a side branch uh, ostium uh, expansion and main branch ostium expansion exactly to measure what the, what the impact on the carina was. Um, and there was no difference at the level of the main branch, but there was a larger opening of the, of the side branch. Um, what happens otherwise to the Hrina, it's, uh, um, I don't have in vitro data to, to answer that. The second question is, uh, do you find, uh, if at all you need a re-intervention uh, for a reverse tap, you find these malapos uh, they they would hinder a re-intervention? In case no, you no, there was, there, there, there was no, there, there was no larger rate of uh, of reintervention due to the uh, malposition. There was uh, uh, a few uh, patients that required reintervention because of restenosis, but this was more mm -hmm. or less spread across the, the two groups equally. Did you compare the number of balloons and wires in both uh, groups? Yeah, this this was one of the this was one of the uh, originally uh, uh, planned endpoints, and uh, at the end there was no difference. Um, just a question: Did you maybe <clears throat> do a subgroup analysis to see whether the angle of the side branch plays a role? Because just looking at it simplistically, is that you know if it's a smaller angle, you're going to protrude much more into the side branch if you want to cover the whole area. So you're going to cause a much bigger neocarinum, and it's probably I would see that as a problem. Whereas if your angle is much greater, 70, 80, 90, um, you'll be able to almost land it flush, and you're not going to run into that problem. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. This is my uh, my current practice in the in the cath lab. If the angle is very uh, shallow, so say below 40 degrees or something like this, then it's a it's a DK crush by rotation if the, if the angle is larger than um, safe to go with either uh, technique. Absolutely, absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to make a Another comment in very yeah. wide angle bifurcations like a left mini, we protrude very less while we're doing a crush. You can never crush the stent of the side branch because of the wide angle. So it always becomes a T irrespective of whether you think that you are doing a crush, but actually it is a T because you can not compress the stent axially, whereas in DK crush they protrude a lot more to compress to the side wall. So whenever we do minimal crush, actually it becomes a T in the end, if you do a imaging. So probably the reverse tap is actually a very mini crush, because you never crush that one or two cells which are in the left main because of the angle, especially in a very wide left main angle. Yeah. Yeah, you actually, um, the, the reverse step is my, is my own definition. Of course, you may call it nano crush or whatever, whatever you like. It's a just term of, of uh, labels, so to speak. Um, the point is uh, that the, 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 the rationale behind the, the reverse step is that you need only one rewiring because you have uh, implanted the, the, the first stent in the side branch so at the edge with so minimal protrusion that you then only need to, to do alternate uh, dilatations to uh, to spread the struts across the circumference of the of the ostium. So uh, it, it is in, indeed inappropriate, probably, or, or not the best technique for shallow angles. Very last yeah. question. Yeah, uh, Thomas, a congratulation to your data. Uh, what I wanted just to to say you, we have now on the market uh, biomine branch uh, uh, device, which is. A Triton stand, which we know from uh, all the all the days, and the Triton now has Serolimus saluting. Um, uh, it's a DAS uh, stand, and uh, I already tested now last week two two, uh, two stands in in uh, through bifurcation lesions, and it's really working very nicely. I personally believe this will be a suitable option for many dicky crush patients, from my point of view. 
Okay, so this was mainly a, a, a comment and not, and not a question. Okay, we, we move forward. The next speaker will be Gianluca Rigatelli, and he will report on feasibility, safety, and long-term outcomes of complex left main bifurcation treatment using the nano-inverted T-stent. Thank you so much to the ABC board for the invitation. All right. Um, we have to go through some facts. Uh, I, I gave this speech uh, three years ago, uh, not exactly the same speech, but the preliminary speech about the preliminary series of our patient. At that time, we call it the nano crash. If it said that no good, so we change the name. <laughs> I, I think the nano, but we, uh, we, we put inverted T because actually we didn't, we do not crash probably uh, nothing. Um, so some facts, I don't want to go uh, through everything, but we try to uh, think a technique, to simulate the technique, and then to apply the technique uh, uh, on our patient in different conditions, and then we uh, try to evaluate uh, the performance of the technique and uh, some uh, um, in uh, the, the different settings. Uh, the technique is uh, really simple, uh, just uh, wiring both branches, um, uh, put the stent uh, slightly protruding with the one portion of the first ring, so we do not need to cover all the ostium on the side branch with the side branch stent, just one portion of the first ring, and uh, that we push, not crash, we push against the wall, uh, with the balloon parked distally in the LADA, and, and then we withdraw it and they push the portion of the ring to the wall just for anchoring the stent to the side branch. Then uh, we put the main branch stent in. We do the first part. We are rewiring the side branch. We perform a snuggle kissing or a T kissing that I like much more than the full kissing. That, that final part. The, at the end of the case, uh, it should be that uh, uh, the coverage of the ostium, the side branch, is partially uh, by the side branch stand and uh, for the majority by the main strand uh, struts protruding into the uh, side branch. So uh, really, as uh, maybe uh, a version of the crossover with a stand, I don't know how. <laughs> Uh, how to define it, but uh, it's true, we do not uh, crush anything. Uh, which is different with the other crossover, you do part, culotte, final kissing, mini crush, there is a stent crush, a real stent crush, a final, a final kissing, in the DK crush, there is double kissing. In the non invertity there is a double, uh, double part. And uh, the the side branch ostium has a dual coverage and uh, so we do not need to uh, cover all the ostium of the side branch with the side branch stent. Um, this is uh, some demographic of our patient and now the patient are increased and are uh, most, uh, more or less uh, uh, 400 and I do not uh, waste time for these. The angiographic characteristics are the uh, Medina 1-1 bifurcation the, in the more than 40%, uh, uh, trifurcation in uh, uh, 60%. There is a, a radial assess always. Uh, the IVUS angiographic characteristics are shown here, and you see that uh, uh, the uh, post-tenting, the number and the, the uh, cross-sectional area is, uh, is good and encouraging. The stand type uh, was for the majority the Orsairo, for the rest uh, Onyx and Science Sierra. Now we apply other kind of stent because in the market uh, the stent uh, diminishes the strut uh, uh, thickness so we can apply to this technique. And uh, uh, this is some, uh, uh, IVUS is uh, uh, important when we do this technique, uh, but is important uh, in any case when we, you do um, left main uh, bifurcation uh, stenting, just uh, for putting some imaging, but it's not uh, really important. We have uh, we had uh, zero stent thrombosis at uh, 
uh, mean uh, follow-up of uh, four years, more or less than the, uh, uh, the follow-up is five years now. The TLF rate was very good, and the LR rate also. Uh, cardiovascular mortality rate was uh, eight patients, but no uh, cardiovascular death uh, occurring during, during the first year. Clinically driving angiographic uh, follow-up was uh, in one-third of the patient, because in Italy, you know, we have uh, some uh, limitation, uh, ethical uh, committee limitation. And uh, significant restenosis was 3.3%, uh, majority at the L6 uh, ostium, uh, uh, most of the time uh, to a calcification of the side branch ostium. We uh, tried to compare to the culotte, and here you see that the culotte was uh, uh, worse in terms of uh, X-ray contrast and uh, even uh, overall result, and uh, again, uh, in a patient with non-STEMI, the, nano, the, nano, the nano crash, but is nano variety, and uh, was very appealing as a final result with very few TLR rate and TUR rate also in this kind of uh, uh, patient. In, um, uh, in non-STEMI patient, uh, uh, comparing uh, with T or TAP and CULOT, uh, the nano variety confirmed to, uh, to have a very a good profile and uh, to be also more safe than uh, in, uh, the other technique. Uh, if uh, we go to the uh, difference with, uh, within the sex, uh, uh, we saw that yes, double stent has got uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, less uh, favorable result than that uh, in, uh, in, um, in a single stent, but among women treated with the double stent technique, the non T has got the uh, better profile in terms of the TLI rate and TUR. This is a, a typical kind of a female with a, a, a very complex uh, disease, and the final result was good with non T and very, uh, I mean, very quick result. This is another case. Uh, challenging also this one, and uh, after all, uh, the final result uh, was this one. And uh, so, in conclusion, if we get the conclusion, sorry, uh, uh, the non invariety technique in left main show that improved long-term outcomes with low TF, low mortality, and zero thrombosis compared to other double stand techniques. NIT in left main provide easy and faster revascularization, less contrast, less time, less X-ray exposure, and there can be an alternative to decay crushing complex left main bifurcation disease. The fact that we do not need to cover all the ostium with the, the side branch stent and the coverage is mixed, uh, explaining why from a, a computational flow dynamic uh, study the profile of nano invariety is so good compared to the DK crash and culotte. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Rigatelli, does the angle of the uh, side branch affect your placement of the stand of the side branch osteo? Uh, sorry, I do not understand. Can Does the angle of the side branch affect the but placement? We, we, we try to uh, put the, 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 the performance technique in a very wide range of uh, angles. Uh, for sure, what the angles uh, is uh, uh, around 90%, uh, uh, you have to put all one ring into the, into the uh, ostium, so it cannot be called an invariety because uh, you really, you put all one ring and uh, then with the balloon you crash. So in that case, uh, probably it's better to call him a very uh, mi minimal crashing. But uh, it's very in unusual to have a 90 degree. Is um, most of the case uh, you have uh, 30, 40, 60, or uh, 100, but 90 degree is, uh, <laughs> is a little bit difficult Possibly to have. Okay, so other questions? Okay. If just, just a comment. So what Gianluca said us, just, you see, Ziv, recognize me? <laughs> so said us is that the, your technique is, uh, is good for all the angles? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, we move forward, uh, so next speaker uh, will be our friend uh, Jasdivar Singh, and uh, he will report on Jail Stent Balloon Technique, a novel to stent technique for com complex bifurcations. Thank you, Goran, Eve, uh, Francesco, thank you for having me. Congratulations on another live meeting. Uh, I'm going to talk about, similar to our previous speakers, uh, a sort of simpler technique uh, in double stent complex bifurcations. These are my disclosures. So, like our previous speakers discussed, uh, DK Crush has shown data, especially in complex bifurcation lesions, uh, according to the definition criteria that two stent technique may be better, and uh, the data data is good, but they still, because of the need for inverted T, nano inverted T, whatever, we are still talking about it because there's multiple steps. It's not as easy of a procedure. There's still significant overlap. And then we are talking about angles also. So looking at all those things, you know, this was our provisional stent. Uh, Francesco did initial work with it, and then we followed long-term 406 patients with provisional with the jail balloon uh, uh, instead of jail wire, and we had significant improvement in outcomes. So according to using that, we actually, this is a six, seven French technique. I'll go over the six French a little bit later. Uh, so we wire both the side branches. According to definition criteria, both we make a determination that they need to be stented. So obviously we treat them. And then, um, and then what we do is we have an unexpended, it's seven friends, so unexpended stent in the main branch. All of these cases are done with intravascular imaging. Uh, this is sort of like a nano crush. We, we mark the ostium by ivus of the side branch and then place it so that it covers in the slight protrusion, not like a DK crush. And you can see here when visible heart lab, we have stent placed precisely on one uh, part of the vessel and then slight protrusion in the other part. And then what we do is uh, we pull back the balloon. We don't take the stent balloon out. We pull it back halfway uh, and make sure the balloon is in the ostium of the side branch. So then we deploy the main branch stent at a very high pressure, whatever pressure we usually do, 15 to 20 atmospheres, depending on the size. And you can see then a little part of it is if you look at invisible heart and like our previous speaker said, you really don't crush it that much. You have longitudinal deformation and then you have some circumferential deformation, but actually the stent then becomes where it's exactly supposed to be. All right, so we're doing that. And then you deploy the main branch stent. And you, like you'll see here, there's a little dissection on that model there and you can see we then have a balloon trap behind it. And then what you do is after you've deformed that side branch stent, you then have a balloon in there, then you correct it within the bifurcation. So you actually inflate at high pressure, then you're deforming the stent, main branch stent. So you take the balloon out and then reinflate the main branch stent. So that actually automatically creates and corrects your deformation, which then allows you to then cross with the wire easily and with cross with a non-compliant balloon for kissing balloon inflation. So we can see that here. And then uh, this is, the next step is obviously part. And then we take a short overlap kiss and then repart. So that's, that's pretty much what it does. And this is what it looks like on the visible heart lab. You look, look like there's not much overlap. It looks like a dedicated bifurcation stenting. And you can see, obviously, standard crush and DK crush, you still have slightly more metal in the bifurcation than anything else. So six French is very similar. Instead of the stent underexpanded, you just have a balloon sized on Ivers, and you do very, very similar techniques. And so you use imaging. You have precise coverage of the side branch. You correct the deformation right away with easy jailed stent balloon uh, step. You preserve the carina and the angulation of the main and side branch, and very easy, uh, as I'll show you in our preliminary data, it's 100% crossing with a non-compliant balloon and can be done with uh, six French 
uh, or a seven French sheetless guide through radials or seven French guide through the leg. So this is our preliminary data, very preliminary raw data, 180 patients, very high risk patients, very high. So you can see uh, a lot of patients with acute coronary syndrome, 25% had hemodynamic support. Uh, and uh, you can see about 70% were Medina 111. And the other slide is so busy, obviously it's, 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 it's preliminary. And you can see compared to DK crush in the complex uh, our data with TLR, it looked very, very good. We still have to analyze the composite endpoints, but at three years, the TLR still is 91%, which is, which is, which is very impressive. We have 75% uh, percent of the patients who were left main. Obviously, you can see all, it was 100% imaging in this, uh, in this uh, subset of patients, and uh, there was no side branch closure in either non-left main or left main and uh, similar data uh, to, uh, to what I showed you previously. So you can see compared to DK crush with the complex, where they had 43 patients in complex, we can see the TLR rate is actually very, very comparative. In, and they excluded arthrectomy patients. We had arthrectomy, shock wave, mechanical support, and all those things. So pretty high risk subset, but encouraging data. Preliminary data, but encouraging data. So it's not risk suggested. We still have to do propensity matching. Uh, and uh, obviously, the next steps are to do that. And then obviously, similar to our previous speakers, to a non-inferiority randomized trial to DK crush versus jail stand balloon technique. So <clears throat> I'm just going to go over the case real quickly. It's a long case. But a complex case, a uh, lady with an ejection fraction of 20% presented with non-STEMI. And uh, you can see the anatomy here. Mid-LED very calcified. Left main is very, very calcified. Ejection fraction is low. And uh, right has disease downstream. So obviously declined surgery. She was sent to us. We went through the leg. And you'll see here, that's our seven French guide. We did a CSI arthrectomy, very complex. The CSI had a very hard time going through the mid LED. The left main was okay. So we opened that up, stented this area, and then I'll just show you what we did. We did shock wave into the ostium of the second flex after we did arthrectomy, marked the ostium like we discussed on IVIS. And truly where the ostium is, it's very hard to see because of the angulation and overlap in left main. So we marked the ostium uh, on IVIS and then stented the mid LED. Then here you'll see that we are then, we stented the side branch, we pulled the balloon back, main branch, and then you can see there uh, similar steps that we talked about. And then, uh, and then you can see pot, and then recrossing, you'll see next. See his non-compliant 3-5 balloon follows beautifully after rewiring, and then we we report it, and this is your result. It looks pretty good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Mm -hmm. what, what about the angle of the parkation? Do you see it uh, well performed with acute angle? Let's say 10, to 10 degree? What was the question, uh, Nicholas? What was the question? What about the the angle of the bike. Angle. So the impact of angle is uh, repeatedly coming out. <laughs> so for each technique, yeah. the, the impact so, of angle. So here, you know, we don't really, like you said, we don't really worry about angle in here because we usually image Treatment those. is uh, the EBC classification of treatments. The purpose of this presentation is yes, to sorry. classify. Can you block? Okay. Eve is there. He's not talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... Yes, so once we image that, we know that the side branch is covered. I think that we really don't, we can do it pretty much on most of the cases. We really don't let the angle really decide this. Other questions? I have just a small, a small question. How do you check the, I mean, the, the, uh, the, um, precision of your stent implantation during the first one? Just angiography or, I mean... No, with, with both IVUS and OCT in cases. 
Okay. Yeah, pre, so you pre systematically apply uh, uh, some imaging technique? Absolutely. Every okay. step is imaging, pre, during, and recrossing, and all okay. we do 3D reconstruction, and also we do co-registration on IVIS uh, just to cross the distal stand strut. So every step is guided by imaging, and all these cases that we did, 100% was imaging. So I, I think this is a very important uh, message to deliver because, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 all these kind of techniques uh, stem from the possibility to overcome decay crash, but still uh, complexity is over there and to check the appropriateness of each step uh, really, I mean, uh, is uh, advisable. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. We move to the last, last presentation by a, a man that, that doesn't deserve introduction. He is uh, one of the fathers of EBC. So, Yves, which are the 2022 advice by you on maths? Yes, uh, I, I have registered the lecture because I'm not able to see the, the screen and I have a potential paper. So. Okay, go on. With the sound, please. Back and the sound. MADS is uh, the EBC classification of treatments. The purpose of this presentation is to classify the recently proposed technique. In Massy, we had the classification of techniques in 1996, proposed by Thierry Lefebvre, and presented at the biggest French international cardiology meeting, ITEC, in Marseille in 1997. Maths classification was proposed by myself in 2006 in EBC meeting in Roma, named by Ron Kornowski, modified in Valencia in 2007. It's a strategy classification, each strategy defined by the position of the first stent in the bifurcation. In M, a stent is implanted immediately proximal to the bifurcation. In A, a crossover from proximal to distal main segment is performed. In D, it was distal, now it's double. One or two stents are implanted creating a double channel, small to long. And in S, a stent is implanted in the side branch first, with or without a proximal main stent protrusion. Then an additional stent can be implanted or not. The inverted bats contain techniques where the side branch is considered as a distal main in the straight bat. The classification was published the first time in 2008. In 2020, Francesco Borsotta and myself reviewed the classification, suppressing some uh, forgotten techniques and introducing different kinds of ballooning after the first stand, and also adding some uh, bifurcation dedicated steps. Here are the inverted techniques. In M strategy, the first technique is proximal to distal Y stand. It was published in uh, 1997 and named in MADS Extended Square. So it is not new. And this is, extend, this is certainly in, in M and this is Extended Square. In A strategy, I found several new techniques. The first one is the reverse single string stenting, which begins with a crossover stenting followed by a side branch stent. Then the side branch wire is pulled in the main vessel and pushed inside the uh, protruding uh, a most distal cell in the main vessel, which seems to be easy in this schema. But this schema is wrong. If the main stent was sized uh, to the distal, seg uh, uh, distal main segment and a port perform, then there is no more protrusion, except in the intentional if the side branch was not entered through the most distal cell. 
This is the true anatomy of the bifurcation. We can compare the name of this technique with the one proposed by John Armiston, the beaver sport, changed by him in the internal uh, crush. So this technique is a variant of elective distancing and can be named reverse or internal. In this strategy, I found several variants of modified distancing described in 1998 by Kobayashi and Colombo. I classify here the single string technique with the same comments uh, uh, as previous. Here is the sabot technique, where a second wire is inserted in the most proximal cell of the stent to block it exactly at the ostium of the sideband. The double kissing nano crush is a crush technique with a minimal protrusion of the sideband stent, where following John Ormiston, I can recognize a specificity which is uh, the axial crushing of the stand by pot, named, named concertina. More complex, but explained by uh, Jazid Darsing, is uh, the gel semi inflatable technique, GSBT, which is uh, a variant also of intentional uh, uh, distancing. At the end, the most controversial controversial new technique is the reverse T and protrusion. If you look at the arrow, you can immediately that see that this is a crush. And we cannot use the same name as a technique which is provisional, described by Francesco Borzotta and uh, Dr. Gwon. So not sharing and not sharing the same difficulties. So this is crush or mini crush. As a conclusion, why a classification of coronary artery bifurcation static techniques? The first is one technique per name, for one name and one name for one technique. Teaching and learning based on technique similarities inside families. Assistance to core lab analysis for randomized trial protocol violations. And more for big registry analysis. And this can be part of a more, more, more complex project, which is a technical ECRF. Thank you very much for attending. So, thank you very much. Uh, Eva. I think that uh, even after a session like that, uh, where you have, uh, I mean, uh, so many uh, proposals, a uh, small uh, change of uh, the technique, uh, small changes in, into the sequence. It is very important to have a mainframe that uh, allows people to understand uh, immediately which is the technique that is facilitated, modified, improved eventually. And uh, I, I mean, this was your vision. Uh, I think that you are keep doing and it uh, it is also, I mean, your presentation shows how easy it is to find the correct spot for, the, for each new technique inside a comprehensive approach like you proposed with the maths. So thank you very much. Is there thank other you. question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, here, Yves. So Eve is... Uh, absolutely right about the fact that it has to be in the ECRF as a cartoon. Yeah? And I can tell you that in the global leaders, 16,000 patients, that's the biggest trial that I've ever done in my life, the first things, which was completely for 98%, fill in properly and without queries and without question, was the maths classification because they just have to tick what they have done in a logical uh, way and with the correct chronology. So that's the best demonstration that I know that uh, ECRF visual following the maths with all the modification that you want to have is the way to go to have 
a, a good report and avoid what you said, the protocol violation. Because once you get protocol violation with this complex technique, you don't know where you are. Yeah? So that, that's yeah. M2. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I, I would uh, just add that uh, this is, uh, as usual, this is what is declared by the operator. It can also be useful to have a core lab analysis of what, what was really done. And sometimes we can find some differences. It is true. So thank you. I think that uh, we discussed uh, uh, several times uh, what is uh, the message that EBC may provide outside EBC. And I think that Matt's classifications seems really something that uh, is very easy to be translated, uh, I mean, into the uh, experience of anybody. And I think that even, I mean, most of the people that is here probably has uh, one more idea about the future of interventions. And I think that uh, to try to fix and explain their modification inside the frame of MADS will uh, also improve uh, the understanding of their uh, technique. So in the future, I think that this is some of the message that as EBC we should propose. So, since time is our main enemy at EBC, we should close the session. I thank all the participants and we go on with the, the session. Hola. Hi, how are you doing? Very nice to see you. You are our host.
So, good afternoon, uh, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, for the sake of uh, puntuality and to be in time with the program, we are going to continue to the next session, which is uh, dedicated to uh, coronary bifurcation physiology. My name is Javier Escanet. I have the pleasure of being with uh, Marek Ferenc uh, and Bon Concu as co-chairs. And we have also Carlos Colet, uh, Chris Girasis, Peter Kala, Gary Mintz, Sanjay Sastri, and Yolanda Siler Matula with us. Uh, thank you for all to being with us. And with this, I think that we will move uh, to the first speaker. If you want, uh, Manek, to present the first speaker. So we have, we have first. Uh, so we have uh, first uh, presentation comparison of adenosine independent pressure into this incidence um, indices of to a fractional flow reserve in stent gel bifurcation side branches. And uh, this will be um, held by Johannes Michael Altstiedl. Welcome. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present our study that compared adenosine independent pressure indices to fractional flow reserve in stent gel side branches when using the provisional stenting approach to treat coronary bifurcation lesions. Now, IFR is equally recommended to FFR and angiographical intermediate stenosis with two randomized control strides, proving non-inferiority of IFR when compared to FFR. Nevertheless, for provisional cyprin stenting, which currently remains the preferred technique for simple coronary bifurcation lesions, evidence is a bit different. FFR-guided and angiography-guided provisional cyprin stenting showed about similar clinical outcomes. Nevertheless, FFR was not able to prove superiority. Nevertheless, experts regard FFR as more accurate to determine the severity of the side branch lesion after main vessel stent implantation than angiography. For IFR, data currently is sparse, however. So our study aimed to um, determine the correlation and agreement between pressure indices in stent gel side branches to determine the impact of altered hemodynamics due to the stent implantation into the main vessel on the different pressure indices. We enrolled 49 patients with a total of 51 stent jailed side branches into this study at our institution. In most cases, the indication for the intervention was chronic coronary syndrome, and in most cases, the transradial approach was used. Most, car, uh, most epifications were located at the left coronary artery, with only two located at the right coronary artery, and 14 of the epifications were true bifurcations. After the interventionalists determined the diameter stenosis using angiography, the two adenosine-independent pressure indices, IFR and PDTPA, were measured, and then after adenosine was administered intercoronary, FFR was measured. All three pressure indices were then successively measured a second time, and then it was at the interventionist's discretion to treat or not to treat the side branch, which resulted into deferral in 34 cases, into angiography in 12 cases, and into stent implantation in five cases. All pressure indices were highly reproducible, as you can see on those charts, on which compares the two consecutive measurements of the pressure indices. IFR correlated strongly with FFR and agreed with FFR in 78.4%. Likewise, PD to BA um, correlated strongly with FFR and agreed in 74.5% with FFR, which is slightly less. The two adenosine independent pressure indices, IFR and PD to BA, also correlated very strongly and even agreed in 88.2%. As I just said, PDGPA agreed slightly less with FFR than IFR. However, with um, statistical analysis, that was not significant. The study also determined the optimal cutoff values of IFR and PDGPA when using receiver, receiver operating characteristics when with using FFR as the reference and thereby determined um, a cutoff value of less or equal 0 0.885 and less or equal 0 0.935 as the optimal cutoff values for IFR and PDGPA. So those cut of values are close to those used in clinical practice. When analyzing the relationship between the adenosine independent pressure indices with FFR when using a cut of value of less than 0 0.75 instead of the less or equal 0 0.80, um, there were similar agreements um, with a higher negative predictive value at the cost of a lower predictive value. Um, when analyzing the relationship of the diameter stenosis with um, the pressure indices, there was only a weak correlation with each of the pressure indices, and agreement was also poor, ranging from 58.8 to 68.6%. In a summary, we found that the adenosine independent pressure indices, FFR and IFR, agreed highly with um, FFR in stent side branches, 
the highest agreement among all pressure indices was between the two adenosine independent pressure indices and with a value close to 90 percent and there was a poor agreement between the physiological and the angiographic assessment. When uh, comparing uh, the agreement of IFR and PD2PA with FFR with uh, those reported in other lesions previously, there was no substantial difference between the shaved side branches in our study and the other lesions in previous studies. So hemodynamics due to the stent implantation seems to be negligible for the physiological assessment of shaved side branches. Therefore, IFR can be regarded as a recommendable alternative to FFR for guiding provisional cyprine standing, having the two large randomized controlled trials in mind that have proved non-inferiority of FFR when compared to FFR. Nevertheless, the randomized controlled trials comparing the outcomes of IFR and FFR guided provisional cyprine standing currently remain lacking. PD2PA may also become an additional alternative that does not require proprietary software. However, with non-invasive physiological assessments like QFR upcoming, PD2PA may not be required anymore in the future. Furthermore, physiological assessment may benefit from complementing it with intracoronary imaging to rule out reversible impairment of flow, like may be the case in vascular wall edema or intramural hematoma, where intervention of the side branch may also be not required. The study, of course, had many limitations. First of all, it was only a small study that included a small number of patients and only had a low number of bifurcations located at the right coronary artery. Furthermore, the diameter stenosis was only visually estimated as QCA is not routinely performed and was not retrospectively feasible due to technical limitations of our cath lab system and it did not investigate any clinical outcomes. So, in conclusion, um, IFR agreed and correlated equally well in stentate side branches than other types of lesions and therefore can be regarded as a recommendable alternative to FFR to guide provisional side branch stenting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Maybe a comment of Dr. Ko. Okay, so, that, yeah, I think it's a great study and the, it's a kind of regeneration of previous study which showed that discordance between FFR and NGO in geo side branches and also that the regeneration of reproduce, reproducing the same results between FFR and IFR results in GFSI branches. And I think it's very straightforward results to show that the, the benefit of physiology, where we can apply the same principle to the bifurcation, non-bifurcation, side branch, and main branch, where the, the kind of similar principle cannot be applied with the imaging drive simple cutoff value. So great study. Thanks. Do you believe that there is some impact of uh, stand device uh, and, and pressure uh, which you use to implant um, the stand to avoid malaposition and to have a really nice crossing to the side branch? I don't think so, but of course we can't rule it out. With 50 patients, there are of course many options that can influence their outcomes. Right. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Uh, I would like to congratulate you, obviously, on the work done. Uh, just a brief comment about doing um, some injustice <laughs> to the angiographic leg. I was just about to ask you whether you uh, compared that with uh, 2D QCA or 3D QCA derived data, but then in the end you just said uh, that it was based on visual estimates, so you can uh, rule out or we can draw no conclusions about uh, how it related uh, to, to, to angiographic uh, estimates, but of course this was not uh, the main topic of your uh, presentation. Uh, correct, and there have been past studies that used visual estimation. Mm -hmm. so. Fantastic, thank you very much. So we move now to the next uh, presentation by uh, Yoshi Onuma, which is uh, about IBUS FFR in the left main coronary artery. Uh, Yoshi, thank you for being with us. Well, he is already here and should yeah, We come. cannot see in the stream. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's yes, just coming. So okay, so I think that the, 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 I'm, I'm informed that uh, there's been a change in schedule that he's presenting tomorrow. So let's move then to, uh, to Patrick Sarrice, who is going to speak about the Murray low base a quantitative flow ratio for assessment of left main bifurcation derived from a single angiographic view compared with FFRCT. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, uh, Gabier. So, uh, 
As you could see, you have uh, Nozomi Kotoku, which is a female interventional cardiologist working with us. Um, the Murray Low Base Quantitative Flow Ratio derives a fractional flow reserve simulation from a single angiographic view by applying fractal flow division according to Murray Low. Calculations solely based on a single projection might increase the feasibility of the analysis but might be impacted by the selection of the angiographic projection. FFRCT is a well-established non-invasive method of simulation of FFR based on finite element and Navier-Stokes equation derived from CTA. And the objective is to evaluate the feasibility of micro QFR in left main bifurcation, 300 patients, the impact of the optimal fluoroscopic view derived from CTA and the diagnostic concordance with FFRCT. This is the Murillo low base quantitative flow ratio published by Sanven2 in CCI uh, last year. Obviously, we have what we call the step-down phenomenon in diameter at the bifurcation. We led to inappropriate calculation of reference diameter. We know the Murray Low. What has been done is on a single angiographic view, you take into account all the side branch diameter. So you see that you have the micro QFR for each branch. If you look at that plot here, the yellow line is the reduction in reference diameter along the vessel. The shade area is the contour of the vessel and superimposed you have the QFR curve color coded. So this is uh, cine angiography and you see at the bottom the RAO2 codal 45 Distal left main QFR 0.70, proximal LED 0.47, proximal circumflex 0.55. In another projection, showing clearly the intermediate, you have a similar value, distal left main QFR 0.63, proximal LED 62, circumflex 46. But in the third one, you can forget about that because as you see, there are superimposition between the uh, projection and now the QFR of the distal left main is 0.93, the circumflex 0.81, the LED 0.81. So if you go to the heart flow, of course, it's always the same value for the left main, 0.57, less than 0.50 uh, for the circumflex and 50 for the LED. Now, what we have applied, what is the optional, optimal views angle in CTA? What we use here is the perpendicular orthogonal X-ray incidence of the en face. That's a term that Niccolo Piazza is always using, en face. And that's the plane with the circle here, the orange circle there, which is created by three dots in the left main LED and circumflex located about five millimeters from the point of convergence of the left main LED and LCX. And this view is defined as the optimal viewing angle of the left main uh, because you have a maximal opening angle and the bifurcation, of the bifurcation, and the minimal shortening. We are applying the uh, version 3.2 of the fluorocity of the circle cardiovascular imaging, and that has been created by uh, Niccolo Piazza and his colleague. So this is the optimal view angle defined by CTA, 24 degrees, codal 52. It's here. Now you could see that this one is quite close by 16 degrees. That's the one in blue here. This is suboptimal, uh, 44 and codal 40, but it's a difference of 99 degrees between these two. And that's the one which is really not good 
89%. That's the red point here. Bad projection, suboptimal projection, suboptimal projection. Now, if you look at the optimal viewing angle defined by CTA, you will realize that some of the angulation are not possible too much cranial for fluoroscopy of X-ray gantry. And you realize that the majority are too much caudal. You cannot put the X-ray gantry in a caudal 40, 60, 80. So that's the problem. And as you could see, the optimal viewing angle by CTA is for ARIO 15 degrees and caudal 45 degrees. But if you look at the angiography, you see that it's quite different. We cannot do this view, and you could see the best fluoroscopy angle closest to the optimal viewing of the CTA is an LAO 0 and a caudal 20. Now we have the cumulative curve of the FFRCT for the proximal LED and the proximal CERC. And you have this famous threshold for FFRCT and micro FFR below 0.80. This is all the projection have been analyzed. 805 in 300 patients. By the way, the single view of the micro FFR was always possible in all projection. And you see black dots, blue dots, and uh, orange and red dots. Basically, the blue dots is the best projection, the orange and the red at the bad one. And let me illustrate one point. Here, for instance, in a bad angiographic projection, the micro FFR is 0.83. The next suboptimal is 0.80. And the best in blue close to the FFR city is 0.72 uh, versus 0.57. Obviously, we have 24.1% of the measurement, which has a discordance in micro FFR in different angiographic projection, one value being positive and the other being negative. So I'm finishing by showing the correlation an agreement of micro FFR versus FFR CT in suboptimal projection. You can see a quite poor sensitivity, 46, 71 for the LED, uh, six, seven, uh, 67 for the circumflex, and as I said, 46 for the left main. But if you go in the best projection based on the multi slice CT scan, then you see your sensitivity jumping to 81, 86, and 80. And basically, if you use the best projection, you have an area under the curve, and that's the comparison of rock curve of micro FFR with FFR CT less than 0.8 as a standard reference in the best and suboptimal projection. You see that an area under the curve of 0.94 versus 0.89, and by the, the long test, you see that there is a difference. The only limitation that I would give today is that the accuracy needs to be cautiously interpreted, since our population is limited in terms of prevalence of significant disease in the left main bifurcation, defined by FFRCT less than 0.8, and observed in distal LM, proximal LED, proximal circumflex, with a prevalence of 5.2, 17.3, and 15.3, which is not so bad because that's the number that you found in the literature. So conclusion, the computation of micro FFR in the left main bifurcation analysis using a single angiographic view has a high feasibility, and we are quite pleased with that technique uh, in the core lab. A Taylor optimal fluoroscopic view is critical for the physiological assessment of the left main bifurcation using a single angiographic view. And evaluation of diagnostic accuracy of micro FFR warrants further analysis of the left main after prospective planning of the optimal fluoroscopy 
view based on the selection of the best CTA view. Thank you. Patrick, uh, thank you so much. So we have a quite good coloration, col correlation, but we still have some, some patients uh, on the list which we don't uh, um, accurately see as a potential uh, patients. Uh, what, what should we do then as next step if we failed here? I think we thought about uh, another type of uh, X-ray gantry. After all, we start with cradle bed, then we have a C arm and the table was rotating, then we have the C arm that could do everything. Basically, you could try to modify the angulation of the table. But if I talk to the industry about that, they are not very, very uh, enthusiastic. I think that what we see these days, and the decade will be like that, is that the CTA is coming continuously. Just in simple trial of stent, I see as a sing single test CTA, CTA increasing months after months in the trial. So I think at some point we will start by the CTA, and when you see something, you go to the cat lab. The cat lab has to be liberated from these 40% of useless uh, uh, diagnostic and geography. That's the second step. And then I think the message of that paper is that from the multi slide CT scan, you can find something which is useful for angiography. It's not perfect, but it's quite good. That's the conclusion, the area under the curve. So I think that we can use this technique, machine learning, uh, taking the Murray, and rely a little bit more on the angiography. And the remark of Chris was a very good one. Thank you. Can I make a quick comment? Yeah, yeah Gary, go ahead. Gary. Sure. So, at least in my experience, there are some patients who simply do not obey Murray's law. Yeah. And it's hard to figure those out prospectively, but they clearly exist. And I think you have to remember that Murray's law was developed in the peripheral vasculature more than 100 years ago. And the remodeling in the peripheral vasculature is very different from remodeling in coronary arteries. The peripheral vasculature doesn't have the same degree of negative and positive remodeling, which may account for um, those patients who do not obey Murray's law, whether it's the left main bifurcation or even the LAD diagonal bifurcation. Yeah, I think it's good, uh, good remark, but I would like to make some compliment on that. Murray made the law in 1927, okay? And he died in 1947. And the year he died, he made his last, last textbook of physiology. I don't know if you have read this book of physiology. I read a lot of time. So the first sentence in the book of Murray is, what comes in, comes out. What comes in, comes out. I can tell you in the bifurcation of the main stem, what came in the main stem, get out in the LED and the circumflex. Whatever you do, that's the conservation of the mass. I agree with Gary that when you go more distally, it might be less and less precise. But at least in the main stem, there is no escape road. You go to the LED or you go to the circumflex. That's true for the flow. Is that really true for the pressure? That's something that has to be, because you know, in, in this loss of kinetic energy at the exit, you can have a, a bump in the, in the shear stress, very complex. So probably what, what Gary is saying is partially true, but what comes but, in comes out. Yes, yes but okay. Patrick, the balance between the LAD and the circumflex may not always be the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, thank you so much. Gary, stay with us because probably if we have more time, we will come back to the, to the discussions. But now we need to move forward because we really have to... Yeah, we, we can take it. Keep, please keep it for the end because then we will have time to discuss. But let's secure that everyone can present uh, their presentation. Yeah, we have to be here with the program and I think later on we can uh, still discuss. So. Um, I would uh, like to 
uh, present Nin Guo and uh, she will give us a uh, lecture predictors and three year outcomes of compromised left circumflex corner artery after left main crossover stenting. Please welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to present our study here. Uh, it's the predictors and the three-year outcomes of compromised LCX after left main crossover stenting. Previous Iowa studies have indicated that plaque or corona shift are the two main mechanisms for compromised LCX after left main to LAD stenting. FFR-guided LCX interventions have been proposed to improve clinical outcomes by reducing unnecessary procedures. However, there are few IWAS predictors of decreased FFR in the LCX after Lifeman to LED crossover stenting. This study to provide IWAS-guided predictors for low FFR at LCX after Lifeman to LED crossover standing and to compare the different treatment strategies for compromised LCX and their long-term outcomes. Here uh, showed inclusion and exclusion criteria. The main inclusion criteria included elective PCI for de novo distal Lifeman bifurcation lesion with mild LCX a stenosis less than 50%, and uh, an initial strategy of provisional LED to left main crossover standing. The significant osteo LCX lesion, more than 50% uh, stenosis after main vessel standing by angiographic diameter stenosis. And both pre PCI and post PCI, I was imaging of left main LED and CX and post PCI FFR of LCX were performed. Here are flow chart. Altogether, there are uh, 1,974 consecutive patients uh, in our hospital from uh, February. 2015 to November 2020 were included in this uh, study. And uh, finally, there are uh, 563 patients showed a significant osteo LCX lesion after left main to LED standing. Uh, over this, uh, around 80% patient with FFR more than 0 0.8 and uh, around 20% patient with FFR less than 0 0.8. Uh, during this kissing balloon inflation technique, drug eluting balloon technique or two stand technique uh, were performed according to doctor's choices. The primary endpoints were three year miss in incidents including a cause of mortality, MI, uh, is chemia driven TVR and uh, stent thrombosis. This slide showed baseline clinical and uh, lesion characteristics, and uh, we can see the uh, data uh, in FFR more than 0 0.8 group and less than 0 0.8 group were very comparable. And this slide shows both the baseline and the post Lifeman LED standing IWAS parameters. And there was no significant differences uh, for baseline uh, uh, parameters between two groups. But for the post Lifeman LED standing, we can see in um, uh, FFR less than 0 0.8 group, uh, the MLA uh, was smaller and the plaque burden was bigger uh, and the diameter uh, was smaller. The multivariable regression predicts for low FFR after Lifeman to LED standing. Uh, there are four parameters altogether. Uh, post standing LCX MLA, post standing LCX plaque burden, 
Posters standing Leftman MLA and Priest standing LCX MLA. However, the ROC analysis uh, showed only two parameters to predict uh, post standing FFR than less than 0 0.8. Uh, there are two cutoff values, uh, which is post PCI LCX MLA less than 0 0.8. 9.5 and the uh, plot burden uh, of uh, LCX more than 55.6%. The cumulative three EMAs according to FFR in LCX very comparable between the two groups, no matter maize mortality, MI, or TVR. The three-year clinical outcomes according to different treatment strategy of the compromised LCX, uh, we can see uh, DEB group, KBI group, or, or additional standing group, there, uh, there were no um, difference uh, in maize mortality, MI, uh, TVR, or uh, stent thrombosis. But uh, in DEB group, the, the maize uh, uh, less than the KBI and the uh, standing uh, group, but without a significant p-value. The limitations of this study uh, are this study were a retrospective analysis of a single core. Limited pre- and post iOS parameters regarding vessel size and the lesion assessment were analyzed, and the stand and the blown diameters, lens, and the MSA of the subgroups of patients with low FFR were not included in the final analysis. The cases available for subgroup analysis in patients with low FFR after main vessel stenting were underpowered. In conclusion, FFR-guided LCX interventions may be useful in avoiding unnecessary complex interventions. Post standing MLA and the plug burden of the LCX, as well as post standing MLA of the left main and the pre standing MLA of the LCX, are uh, I was guided predictors of low FFR after left main to LAD standing. And the three year mass rates were comparable between patients with high FFR in LCX and patients with low FFR who were managed with DEB, KBI, or another stand deployment. Thanks for your attention. Dear and Nim Guo, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and very clear data. Any comments or questions? Uh, thank you for your uh uh, excellent study. I think it's uh, a comment, I suppose, first is that it shows the difficulty of doing sizable studies in this group and putting together large enough cohorts. It, you've equally said, and I think very honestly, the limitations of such a study when it's not randomized and when the numbers in the groups that were treated are quite um, small. And I think the other thing that you've uh, pointed out, which is also important, is the other parameters like calcification uh, and uh, other important information that we would get from IVUS that will impact on the outcome of these kind of procedures and taking that into account above and beyond whether we intervened or not and what the FFR is would be important. There are multiple factors in play. Yeah, Gary, maybe uh, you could uh, comment the study? Well, I mean, I, I take the point of um, patient numbers um, once you talk about treatment. But if you take the step back and look at predictors of an FFR less than 0.8, the numbers become you know, somewhat more robust. And the one conclusion that I would have added was that the two strongest predictors of an FFR less than 0.8 were the post crossover stent, MLA, and plaque burden at the osseum of the circumflex. And these are quite consistent numbers um, with other studies that have been published. So in many ways, um, this information is, is highly useful 
when um, dealing with um, stent crossover for left main lesions. Yes, okay, thank you. Javier? Yeah, the, the, the comment I will make is that I think that obviously the physiology is evolving very quickly. And I think that now what will be mandatory is performing a pullback to make sure that the pressure loss is located at the osteum of the circumflex. I mean, that's certainly very, very important because otherwise you may be actually treating something that has nothing to do with an abnormal FFR value. I don't know if that was done. I assume that in one way or the other uh, should be performed, but I think it's an important remark for future studies. I mean, nowadays, unless you perform longitudinal vessel analysis and you really ensure that you have performed precision optimization of the, of the, of the vessel, then, you know, maybe treating the wrong segment. The question is, the, do we have to perform in the future um, FFR and IVUS guided left main PCI? Dr. Ko, what do you believe? <laughs> I think the result will be the same, but it will be very much complicated because that the you know, flavor trial, no difference in PCI group, but the left main, when you are dealing with the two stenting, I think that the importance of imaging should be stressed more than non-left main in comparison to physiology. But we have probably, um, there was a skip presentation, I was FFR in left main, so I think tomorrow we will hear uh, more, we will get more information. Okay, thank you uh, to Nin Gua. Thank you so much. And um, now we go ahead. Yes, so we move to the next uh, presentation that is uh, determinants of functional significance of coronary bifurcation lesions and clinical outcomes after physiology guided treatment by Dobrin, Dobrin Vasiliev. Dobrin, thank you very much for being with us. Dear organizers, Thank you for inviting me to give you this talk about the determinants of functional significance of coronary bifurcation lesions and the clinical outcomes after physiological treatment. There is a, a scarce data about uh, the functional significance of bifurcation lesions before PCI. All the previous research was focused mainly on the FFR measurements of side branch osteostenosis significance after main vessel stenting. And uh, on a historical basis, we know that uh, FFR is uh, significant in only half of all angiographically significant lesions. So the aims of our study was to identify the anatomical predictors of uh, functional significance of coronary bifurcation stenosis to determine the proportion of bifurcation lesions that are angiographically significant but functionally non-significant and to assess the clinical outcomes uh, between uh, these cohorts. We recruited uh, 171 patients more of them were with the functionally non-significant lesions that are 93 patients and uh, 78 patients had a functionally significant uh, coronary bifurcation stenosis and those patients were uh, followed for a medium of uh, three years. The patient uh, characteristics uh, are presented here. As you can appreciate, uh, around uh, one third of our patients were diabetics and had uh, some extent of uh, renal failure defined as uh, GFR uh, less than uh, 60. Our um, patients uh, had uh, resolved uh, Oh, another lesions in uh, another uh, coronary arteries. This is the reason why uh, half of uh, our patients' cohorts in both groups uh, had a previous uh, PCI, and uh, probably that was the reason why uh, the uh, patients were very well medically treated with the beta blockers uh, were. Um, taken more than 80% of our patients and ACE inhibitors and IRB blockers uh, were taken in um, around 90% of uh, the patients. 
there was a significant uh, difference between the proximal main vessel stenosis, uh, distal main branch uh, stenosis and uh, side branch uh, osteostenosis in lesions uh, with uh, functionally significant uh, coronary bifurcations. In uh, all these uh, three places, uh, the group with the uh, functionally significant stenosis had uh, higher degrees of uh, stenosis. The lesion length in main vessel was uh, twice as uh, length uh, as the uh, lesion length in uh, patients with FFR uh, more than 0 0.80 and uh, it was interesting finding that uh, the area at risk of uh, side branches with uh, functionally significant stenosis was uh, greater than uh, the patient the side the area of the side branches in patient with functionally non-significant uh, coronary bifurcation stenosis this is a functional medina score with the distribution of the functionally significant uh, distribution of uh, our lesions it should be taken into account uh, when uh, uh, when we assess the mind vessel mind vessel negative and side branch positive uh, functionally significance that means that probably there was a s also some effect from the proximal main vessel on this uh, side branch osteo uh, functional significance. This is the distribution of the functionally significant uh, and functionally non-significant lesions. As you can appreciate, more than half of the lesions which were angiographically significant were actually functionally not significant. The predictors in uh, multivariate analysis of functional significance were uh, proximal main vessel diameter stenosis of more than 55%, uh, distal main branch diameter stenosis of more than 65%, side branch diameter stenosis of more than 50%, main vessel lesion length more than 25 millilit millimeters and the syntax core more than 11. These are the clinical outcomes between the two groups. There were no difference in uh, regarding the OCOS death, cardiovascular death, and uh, the rate of uh, MACES at the more than even more than three year uh, follow up. And in the conclusion, I can say that the severity of coronary bifurcation lesions is often overestimated based on angiographic assessment. When assessed with FFR, only half of all angiographically significant lesions were functionally significant, and there were no difference in clinical outcomes in the mean time of three years follow-up in treated and deferred lesions, which give us uh, additional assurance of FFR guided, uh, guided strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dobrin, for the elegant presentation. So, any questions, comments? Um, maybe a comment from our center, from Brad Krotzkin. So, we, we, we have a very similar um, information. Uh, so, we usually perform FFR measurement if we have borderline lesions and not really very conclusive patient symptoms or not clear ischemia. And what we have found, we have even over 65% uh, practically uh, normal FFR um, value and patients don't need um, PCI. Yeah. I think one interesting you know, uh, concept you proposed was the functional Medina 001 like that. But the, we know that the, if we measure in side branch FFR, no matter what kind of pressure indexes you're using, unless you do a pullback, it's combination of the main and side branch, so that the, that's one of the reasons why we do not systematically measure the FFR in the side branch. So do you still think without pullback, 
that discrimination between functional significance of side branch and proximal main branch when you measure the any physiologic indices in the side branch? And this is a question to me? Yeah. Uh, in my view, uh, it depends on the degree of the proximal main vessel stenosis. If it is uh, less than 50%, I think that you can assess by FFR only side branch uh, FFR. In our study, we had only six such a patients from uh, 170 patients. So this is a very rare occasion when you can assess only side branch uh, FFR. Otherwise, uh, the situation is as you uh, described, you have to do a pullback and to see, and even with the pullback, it is not uh, sure that uh, the pressure drop is uh, at the side branch ostium. So in those cases, we accept that it is, uh, if uh, it is significant, uh, we accept that it is significant in both branches, main vessel and side branch. Right, so the reason why I'm stressing about this is that the, I think one of the reasons why we have so many conflicting results for the 001 lesion is that the, unless we do the imaging IVUS OCT or unless we do a very careful pullback, we cannot discriminate whether this is really a 001 lesion or the 101 or like that. So that the, that's my comments. So any more questions, comments? Okay. Um, I would like to co congratulate, obviously, Dr. Vaslev for the results. Again, the self-repetitive, at least in my mind, question whether those angiographic indices were based on uh, dedicated QCA software or not. Yes, that was a QCA measurement. Uh, uh, ded dedicated QCA? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Great, so now it's move on, uh, time to move on. Uh, thank you, Dr. so that uh, we are going to learn from uh, Dr. Francesco Hidalgo about the drill pressure wire technique. Dr. Hidalgo, please. Thank you. I'm going to present you this study about the use of the jail pressure wire technique uh, for the assessment of the cybran result during the provisional stenting strategy. As you know, the j wire is a useful tool during provisional stenting strategy. It reduces the rate of cybran occlusion, facilitates the cybran reopening when uh, there is an acute closure. Our group demonstrated that polymeric coated wire suffer a significant lower incidence of microscopic damage regarding the non-polymer aquatic wires. However, in this group, the percentage of severe damage was low and any case of fracture was described. Regarding the side ground result, it's difficult to standardize the need for treatment. For this reason, the use of physiological evaluation seems very interesting to establish the need for treatment, to establish a physiological baseline classification and to assess the cyber result after main vessel stenting or after cyber post dilation if needed. As you can see, uh, there is a poor correlation between the angiographic and the physiological result, as you can see in these two studies, with FFR and with IFR. It's possible to use the pressure wire as a jailed pressure wire to simplify the procedure. Well, we studied it in a pilot study where we included 40 patients uh, using the Volcano Berrata wire and the IFR as index. We observed three interesting things. First, that there were no case of pressure sensor damage. Second, that there were no case of wire fracture. And third, that there were a discordant between angiographic and physiological result in 35% of the case. So we aim to compare the structural damage of pressure and non-polymer quartet wire after j wire technique. And second, to evaluate the midterm clinical outcome of patients with bifurcation lesion 
treated by IFR guided versus angiography guided. We performed a prospective study enrolling selective patients undergoing PCI of five bifurcation lesions in whom provisional extending was the chosen strategy. As control group, we selected the cohort of patients randomized to non-polymer quartet group in the specific randomized trial. Here you can see the protocol of the procedure. After pressure normalization, we pass the wire distal to the cybran Austin or distal to the cybran lesion and a basiline IFR measurement was performed. Main measure and cybran predilation was left to operator criteria based on angiographic and physiological findings. After main vessel stenting and pot jailing the pressure wire, we perform uh, the cybran evaluation with a new IFR measurement. To confirm the IFR uh, obtained, we remove the wire to the main vessel ostium and we check the presence of drift. If the IFR obtained at the main vessel ostium was 1.0 plus or less 0.02, we consider the IFR value as correct and we perform cybran post dilation or not according to this IFR value. If there were drift, we perform a new normalization, cybran rewiring, and new IFR measurement, and we perform cybran intervention according to this new value. Final IFR measurement was uh, obtained after cybran intervention, and in that case, uh, in whom the IFR was lower or equal 0.89, we consider the need of cybran stenting. Finally, we uh, uh, analyze microscopically the wires to uh, assess the uh, percentage and the severity of the damage. We included a total of 99 patients uh, in the study. There were no significant difference between the control group except in the percentage of chronic coronary syndrome that was higher in the IFR group. After main vessel extending, the IFR was higher than 0 0.89 in 67 patients and no further action was taken. In the remaining patients, a cybran post dilation was performed and after that, all patients presenting a final IFR higher than 0 0.89, so cybran extending was not performed on any patient. Regarding angiographic and procedural data, there were no difference regarding the bifurcation location. However, the percentage of true bifurcation lesion was higher in the control group and the cybran action was higher in the control group predilation and post dilation. We think that is probably due to the uh, discord between angiographic and physiological result and due to the difference in the plaque distribution between groups. Regarding microscopic analysis, the IFR guided group presenting a significant higher indice incident of moderate damage regarding the control group. However, the percentage of severe damage was very low and there were any cause, any case of, of fracture. Here you can see three images of the microscopic analysis. The red arrow showed the pressure sensor. There were any case of sensor damage or breaking. And it's interesting to say that all the damage occurred distant to the pressure sensor. Regarding clinical outcomes at two years of follow-up, uh, the IFR guided group presenting a significant lower incidence of, of maize. However, after balancing both groups, this difference did not achieve the statistical significance. So, in conclusion, the IFR can be used to assess the cyber result and to guide the PCI decision making after provisional sending strategy. Volcano pressure wire was less resistant to jailing than conventional non polymer quartet wire. However, Severe damage was anecdotal and there were no cases of wire fracture, supporting the use of daily pressure wire technique in selected patients. The IFR guided resulted in less cybran intervention, but this patient had similar two-year clinical outcomes than those guided by angiography. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Dago, for the you know, continuous efforts for you know, probing this issue. So questions, comments? The J jailed FFR or IFR wire is a standard in your center? Yeah, uh, we use this wire because uh, this wire was the, the only wire uh, that we have in our center. Uh, now we have the new generation of this wire, that this is the only wire, 
but during the study period, the, the wire that we had uh, was the volcano Berrata wire. Yeah, that's uh, something that is interesting. The new generation of wires, the Omni wire, is of course excellent because it is a solid uh, core. Uh, but the conduction, the conductors, is, uh, the, is in the coating of the wire. So my question is, do you believe that in this new generation of the wire, the stent may damage the coating and therefore damage the transmission of the signal? Um, I, have to, I, I have to tell to those that do not use it that this wire requires a, speci a special torker made of plastic, so it does not um, interfere or can induce any damage in the coating. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have experience with the new generation about the using as yellow wire, but the technology is different. So we need to check this new wire and to confirm if there is drift or no drift when, when we use as yellow wire. Uh, with this new technology, probably uh, the use as yellow wire uh, will not be possible, but I don't know. It's an it's a interesting point to future studies. May I ask you, maybe I, I have missed uh, the information. Congratulations to the, uh, to the results. And uh, my question would be about uh, the, the pot technique and uh, the pressure that uh, you have used. So what was uh, the proximal optimization technique uh, pressure? Yeah, in our clinical practice, generally we perform the pot, uh, the pot with the with the jailed wire, uh, maintain the, the, the wire at the side branch. And we decided to do the same with the gel with the gel espresso wire. Uh, we we need to check if this wire is equal to other non polymer coated wires using the, the the same the same the same technique. So we a pot was performed in more than seventy percent of the case, left to e operator criteria. It was higher than con the control group because it was a old study uh, performed in two thousand and fourteen. Uh, but we decided to do the same uh, uh, that we do in our clinical practice. I think you should definitely be uh, cautious if you overstand the FFR wire in very calcified lesion and uh, with postulation you could have really some trouble. So I remember one case I spent uh, one and a half hour to reconstruct everything. And yeah, it was selective patient trying to avoid very calcified bifurcation and, and, and other risk factor to, to, to wire fracture. So thank you very much, Francisco. And now we have 12 minutes, actually, that we can dedicate now to, um, to discuss. Oh, uh, Habib Samadi. Is Habib is with us? Sorry, sorry. I think that Habib is with us. Yeah? Or Maybe, maybe slides? Recorded presentation? No? No, I don't think that Habib is with us. Maybe. Good afternoon. Um, oh, okay, okay. okay so I'm going to try to talk to you about physiology to guide bifurcation PCI, given that this is a coronary bifurcation physiology session, but also just point a couple of updates regarding physiology in general to guide PCI. So the first question is, is what is a bifurcation that needs to be addressed in the cath lab? And I do think that physiology plays a very big role. This is an example of... Um, physiologic and angiographic co-registration where the physiologic information is overlaid on top of the angiogram. And so it may be that many lesions that appear to have bifurcation complexity actually get simplified and one needs to only focus on where the pressure drops are. So in fact, understanding this informs your bifurcation strategy and can often, leave, often be deferred. And here's an example actually from Ju Myung Lee who nicely demonstrated in this example of an LAD diagonal bifurcation where you can see that angiographically there appears to be a stenosis and actually on IVIS there appears to be a significant anatomical narrowing with a minimal luminal area of two square millimeters and yet physiologically this is non-significant with an FFR of 0.85 and this patient also had no evidence of non-invasive physiologic ischemia. And we know that there is discrepancy between anatomy and physiology um, a 
across lesions, but in bifurcations, this is even more the case. Um, here is an example of a 94 patient study uh, by Quan, uh, Von Quan Ku's group, um, where they looked at FFR compared to angiographic diameter stenosis and bifurcation lesions, and actually, if a stenosis was between 50 to 75 percent, um, none of them were hemodynamically significant. And in diameter stenoses um, over 75 percent, two-thirds were non-hemodynamically significant. So you can see this really poor correlation between anatomy and physiology with a weak ROC of anatomy to predict physiology. We also know that in jailed side branches, physiology can be very helpful. And of course, the seminal work by Quan Ku and his group, but also some work by the Bifurcation uh, 3 Club. So as far as Quan's data, this is just a simplified uh, graph from one of his papers where he demonstrates that if you uh, stent across a bifurcation, very frequently you will have hemodynamically significant stenosis in the side branch. But when you do kissing balloon inflation, you often will relieve that ischemia. And if you look at follow-up, um, up to six months follow-up, um, that you don't lose that um, you know, gain that you got with kissing balloon inflation so that the FFR remains non-ischemic during follow-up. This suggests that a FFR-guided strategy for your side branch when you um, stent across it is, is an appropriate approach. Of course, um, you might ask, well, are there randomized data comparing physiology to angiography for bifurcation PCI? And actually, I'll, I'll describe to you sort of a, an observational study by, by Quan, uh, where he took 110 patients with a provisional stent strategy, uh, where the side branch was either treated in one arm with uh, balloon angioplasty if the FFR was negative, or in the control group was treated without FFR information. And what they found in that study was that the FFR-guided therapy of that side branch resulted in less frequent side branch intervention, 30% the FFR-guided group and 45% the angio group, and that there was no difference in target vessel revascularization at nine months. Similarly, the DK CRUSH trial was now a prospective randomized study where um, patients were assigned to an FFR-guided group of the side branch of the FFR, in this case, was less than 0.8, or an angiographic-guided approach. And recall that the treatment of the FFR and the FFR-guided group, the treatment of the side branch, um, had also significantly less angioplasty than when it was angiographically guided. And again, the MACE rates, uh, whether it was overall MACE, MI, or TVR, which were similar at one year, uh, suggesting that less frequent intervention of the side branch was better. Here's the uh, Kaplan-Meier for the MACE in the two groups. And then this is uh, looking at uh, MI at one year, and this is looking at T of TVR, again, suggesting that an FFR-guided strategy was equivalent to an angio-guided strategy, but you performed less side branch intervention. Let's pivot a little bit for the last minute or so and talk about some of the advances in just FFR-guided PCI. You all know that the Define PCI study uh, was a large multicenter registry of 467 patients where FFR, I, sorry, IFR pullbacks were performed after optimal angioplasty. And what was found that there was residual uh, ischemia with an IFR of less than 0.89 in almost a quarter of the patients, and the vast majority of those were focal. And when we looked at where those pressure drops were, and this was work led by Alan Jeremias, Greg Stone, Anesh Patel, and others, um, what was found was that um, the focal pressure drop was found in 80%, that a third of the time it was distal to the stent, a third of the time the pressure drop focally was inside the stent, and a third of the time proximal to the stent. And it was hypothesized then that if one could relieve those ischemia uh, producing residual stenoses, that one could reduce residual 
uh, ischemic IFR from 24% down to 5%. And as many of you know, this is the subject of a large randomized prospective clinical trial defined GPS with almost 3,000 patients. And the primary endpoint of this trial that's currently enrolling will be two-year MACE event rates as described here. There are a number of secondary endpoints, but really exciting. There's also very exciting work by Carlos Calais and group, which are, who are looking at uh, pressure pullback gradients using uh, an FFR approach where they've identified that certain cutoffs of pro pressure pullback gradient are associated with focal lesion, whereas others are more diffuse lesion. And if you treat focal lesions, you tend to relieve more angina than diffuse lesions. So we're really going to a physiologic guided strategy for guided, guiding PCI. Another exciting development in physiologic guided PCI is this idea of looking at residual pressure gradients. And this is a slide was taken for a very nice um, state-of-the-art paper um, that was published in Jack Intervention last year where um, it, it was suggested that if you use physiology to guide your PCI, you should also use final physiology and whether you end up using a PDPA cutoff of 0.96, an FFR cutoff of 0.86, or an IFR cutoff of 0.89, um, that can be, then be used to inform whether something should be done and the, and the proposal is that if it's focal instep pressure drops, you can either use intravascular imaging or post dilatation. If it's outside the stent, perhaps the adjunctive stent therapy and maybe imaging guided. And if it's diffuse, you leave it behind for medical therapy. So I, I hope that I've convinced you that FFR and IFR guided approach is very important to guide which bifurcations or which lesions require treatment and how physiology can be used to guide PCI, whether it's in bifurcations, uh, whether it's in deciding vessel versus lesion level ischemia, or whether it's looking at post stent physiology. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much. And there is still Gary online. Do you like to comment yeah. this uh, data? Well, there was one study that Habib did not mention, which is target FFR. It was presented at TCT 2020 and published, I think, in the European Heart Journal. And um, that was a randomized study of an FFR guided versus angiographic guided stenting strategy. And granted, it wasn't a big study, but it showed absolutely no difference in outcomes at one year follow-up. And it was primarily a, um, a post-stent FFR assessment um, strategy. Um, it was fairly carefully done, but as I said, it wasn't a huge study. Yes, um, thank you for your comment. Any more questions? Comments or questions, Dr. Ko? Yeah, uh, I think I think Dr. Mintz raised an important you know point in applying the physiology, you know, target FFR randomization after angiographic success of PCI, FFR guided versus non, and no outcome. But the, it is interesting to see that there was some improvement in physio uh, physiologic assessment. But the even after additional PCI, improvement wasn't that big. So I personally, I, I, I love physiology measurement after PCI, but it's more like a kind of a risk marker, not the risk factor for uh, correction. So if there's something, post PCI FFR is very low, pull back, unless you can find a very big step up, if you want to fix it, I think it's better to use imaging rather than you know, pure physiology dependent decision making. Yes, yeah, definitely. Patrick. I think very good comment. There is one more comment or question from Patrick. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that as interventional cardiologists, we will have uh, our life is going to become more and more complicated. You will see in Jack Intervention a wonderful uh, paper of uh, Carlos Collet. Uh, it's coming very soon, where he looks at the pattern of focality versus diffuseness. 
And obviously, there are some criteria, of course, based on PPGI and uh, the first derivative of the FFR and so on. And it's a pullback of the wire during hyperemia. So that's the top of the top. And you realize that these individuals who have a, a, a pattern of diffuseness, you don't improve the angina. And his number are really flabbergasting. I mean, 40% of these patients will not be improved. Okay. Then you go for the focal, okay? Now you are in, in a risk, a risk factor before the procedure. You should not do that patient, 40%, because he's diffused, forget about it. It has to be to the pharma. Now you do the treatment post, and you do the same trick post, and you do on top of that the IMR, and you realize that your IMR below 25 is also not improving, is also residual in China. So I'm, I'm curious to see the individual we are going to combine the 40% of Collet with the 25% that we have in IMR. What is the part we can still treat it as an interventional cardiologist? So that's what we are going to face in the upcoming years. And you will see there will be a lot of paper in these things. They are now separated, but they will be combined. And at that moment, people will do a, a, Orbita 2 and a, a Courage 2 and a Ischemia 3, etc. And we will have a difficult decade. That's what I predict. Yeah. So, Patrick, your words were so inspiring that I started hearing some music, which I don't know if it is true or it is just an announcement that the coffee break is, uh, is near. But um, uh, I think that yeah, uh, Mary, maybe, perhaps, yeah, maybe, final maybe, word for you. Yeah, final word, maybe final comment. What we have learned from this session, I think physiology uh, measurement, uh, pre-PCI, during PCI, and post-PCI play an extremely important role. And we have also some patient subs that they need both. They need very good, high-quality imaging and uh, additional uh, physiological measurements uh, to to uh, try to, uh, to achieve perfect uh, also long-term results. So thank you so much for your attention. Now it's a coffee break. Thank you.
So we will begin the next session in three minutes. So we're just are waiting for new people coming. So this, se this session is a classical of uh, EBC, bench and simulation. And uh, we may think that uh, after years and years, we will see less bench and much more mass simulation. This is not really true. So this, I will chair this session with, co-chair this session with Christos Brontas, working in UK now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Nicolas Fouin, working in Belgium, who, is, uh, still, uh, who was still doing recently bench studies. So. And please, uh, so unfortunately, we have uh, um, panelist uh, remote, so Kiyotaka, hello, nice to see you, Kiyotaka Iwasaki, here, Gassan Kassab, I don't know if he's, ah, Gassan is at top, top left, thank you Gassan, and uh, after that, John Ladisa, I don't know, he's here, and uh, uh, Jacques Tab Prashant is in the room, no? And the last, so our panel is completely virtual, so I think they will be active. And uh, Abib Samadi, Samadi, no more. I don't, uh, I say, ah, John Ladiza is here. Yeah, I recognize him now. Nice to see you. Yes, good to see you. So uh, it's time to, to begin. Maybe you can present the first, the first uh, talk, if it's not yours. Of course, with a pleasure. Uh, the first one uh, the, is from Susan uh, Beer, uh, and the title is Bench Model Bifurcation Stenting in CD Generated 3D Printed Plug. CD is coming more and more into the simulations. It's great to have realistic geometries well, well, from uh, Susan the normally is on the internet. Are we connection with Susan? Uh, it's here. Okay. Um, I'm Susan Bayer, and now I'll be presenting on bench models using um, 3D printed plaque for the first time in stent assessment. Now, the major drawback in any benchtop assessment of stents to date is that um, there's no disease in any of the models. And um, moreover, um, simplified, simplified materials have been used previously. For example, um, silicon, which is still more rigid than what we see um, in humans. And of course, it's uniform. So there's no differentiation between um, different um, plaque types or the vessel wall itself. Or some benchtop attempts have even been done in compliant and non-compliant vessels. Now, um, another drawback is that there is no anatomical variation. So a lot of the discussions um, evolve around uh, best stenting techniques and what kind of patients, side branch and so forth. But um, yeah, this has been, um, I guess, translated into the bench so far. Now here, we wanted to assess if 3D printing has the capability of overcoming some of these persistent drawbacks we've seen in benchtop assessment of stents and stenting. Um, now, first of all, um, a quick comparison between 3D printed versus the current gold standard um, silicon phantoms and benchtop. Um, 3D printing allows to use different material stiffnesses within the same print. Now, um, this, is, this is unheard of. Um, it's not done within silicon phantoms. And the other big advantage is that 3D printing allows rapid uh, production and um, easy customizing of the phantoms. Here on the right, um, you can see a simple breakdown of Typical um, engineering stresses we use to measure, measure versus the, stress, uh, the stretch. So we can assess the compliance of the phantom. You can see in blue shades um, are the 3D printed phantom components where we have the wall and the soft plaque um, being more compliant than uh, the hard plaque also in the phantom. Um, you can see it's non-compliant at all. So there's a, um, a horizontal line. Silicon phantoms, on the other hand, um, in comparison, have just one line. They are compliant, but there's no variation within the phantom itself. And this, it, they're still fairly stiff. So the line is nearly horizontal. Now, 
how does all of this compare to true in vivo artery properties? Well, um, there have been a lot of attempts in assessing how coronary arteries in humans really behave um, and vary from patient to patient, but also within the lesion region itself. Now, coronary arteries are described as hyperelastic strain stiffening, meaning they are nonlinear, so the line um, has a curvature, and also their different material properties, which vary significantly between hard plaque, soft plaque, and the arterial wall itself. So hard calcified plaque can be very rich, rigid and non-compliant, and soft plaques are usually classified um, through um, being assessed as lipid pool, which um, is not quite correct. Um, there's also a fibrous cap, uh, which is a little bit stiffer. So um, that line would slightly vary upwards and sort of moving along the arterial wall. However, um, in literature commonly, we just simplify it at soft plaque being 100% um, compliant, meaning being a liquid a lipid pool. Uh, and the arterial wall in the middle, non-compliant, um, sorry, non-uniform, non non-linear. Um, and then this is how um, everything compares together. So here, the same chart again, we plotted 3D printed phantoms versus in vivo versus silicon phantoms. You can see that um, the hard plug you know already is completely matched. The soft Plaque and the arterial wall is getting closer. It's still not quite accurate, but far more compliant than, for example, um, silicon phantoms, what we have had in literature as a gold standard to date. Um, and of course, using multiple materials. Now, what we have done with this methodology, um, we printed um, five phantoms in total, three LID models, two uh, left main models. Um, with hard and soft plaque, respectively. You can see the detailed dimensions, the variation in bifurcation angles um, here, and also the different disease classification. Now, 3D printing opens up this possibility of customized assessment. So we have uh, different disease classification, different dimension, different angles. And we went with a stenosis classification of 70% in both cases. Um, in terms of the analyses, you can see here the standard phantom on the left. We did OCT before and after, as well as micro CT reconstruction on the right, where you can see a little fly through here. Um, and the assessment. Now, for the soft plaque material, that was very interesting because for the first time, we were able to replicate clinical phenomena on the bench top, which we were not able to see before, which include the tissue prolapse, meaning the, um, the bounce back, so to speak, of the material in between the stem struts. And after the lumen was opened up, the tissue still protruded again between the mesh wire of the stents. And in fact, so much so that in some instances on the left top corner for the OCT images, you can see that the strut was completely engulfed and battered into the soft plaque. Um, so significant tissue prolapse and stent um, embedment. Um, yes, then interestingly, um, this was right at the center of the soft plaque, moving um, further down the bifurcation into the daughter branches, we saw as a result, significant strut miller position towards the osteum in the non-plaque region. Uh, which is quite fascinating. Now, in terms of the hard plaque case, um, you can see that there was significant stent distortion. The lumen was not changed at all as a result of the stent deployment within the phantom. Um, we saw no tissue malar position, um, uh, sorry, tissue prolapse at all, and complete opposition of the struts towards the hard plaque. Now, what that means is that 3D printing unlocks improved bifurcation phantoms. Um, for the first time, we can actually do advanced bifurcation testing, benchtop testing using diseased phantoms, which show much more clinically relevant results. And um, we can replicate tissue prolapse for the first time. Thank you so much for your attention. So I'm not sure that Suzanne um, 
is, is with us because this is the middle of the night now in Australia. So maybe we can, uh, we can ask our panel, our panelists to make a comment or questions. I, I can start. Suzanne's work is, is wonderful in, in the sense of having, you know, bench models that can replicate as closely as possible, you know, the real thing. I think uh, clearly the material properties is the crucial issue. I think we've been able to conquer faithful reconstruction of geometry, but it's really the material property because it's, it's clearly a composite material consisting of various elements. And, and I think she's making a good stride in that direction uh, in the sense of being able to, you know, simulate or replicate uh, the various types of materials that uh, are involved in plaque, whether it's soft or whether it's hard or fibrotic tissue or calcification and so on. Uh, so it's, it's, I think this is a great uh, direction to be able to validate more critically uh, some of the, the models, whether it's from a fluid mechanics or solid mechanics perspective. Thank you, Yasan. John? Yeah, I would echo what Lucas Yasan said. Uh, great work, really exciting, and, and I look forward to when we can sort of move beyond, you know, just what we have in the literature right now regarding the type of plaques, you know, according to whatever AHA or other uh, criteria we're using, and then look at, you know, more that's kind of undiscovered and also more material properties in combination, right? Because all of these, they don't necessarily break down very nicely into, you know, just lipid or just calcific, right? They're spatially heterogeneous. And, and so using a bench type model like this with a little bit more of this data as it begins to come out, I think it'll be really, really important for better understanding those local perturbations and get us kind of past where we're at on um, you know, suboptimal outcomes today. Kiyotaka, maybe a word. After that, we asked my panelist, my co-chair. What do you think of this, uh, Kiyotaka? I've seen what we have done in your, in your place with uh, perfused models, uh, very complex one. Is it, is it something which is interesting for you? Yeah, it's very interesting and it's really challenging work to reproduce human pathological property. And uh, I'm actually looking forward to see how to measure or how to adjust calcification property in human coronary artery disease. But it's actually very interesting and wonderful work. Thank you very much. Some questions in the room? If not, maybe my I have a comment to make uh, about this. It's an interesting work. In, indeed, the issue we have is boundary conditions and how you define tissue properties. But we should take the, the step, a step forward. There is some work that has been done in the past by Mortier that used CT to plan PCI in complex bifurcation. We should start doing simulation like this, identify limitations, and go back and reflect from the, how the procedure was done, and retrain the boundary conditions using artificial intelligence. Probably this is another perspective to Im improve things rather than going always to histology. So you mean you will, we will have to uh, uh, 3D reconstruct any uh, patient-specific anatomy to prepare our treatment? It will be very expensive. Yeah. Why, not, why not doing... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, simulation, CFD. Uh. Yeah, C CT, reconstruct the data from CT, do the simulation stand placement on CT, see what, how well you predict by having the final results post PCI, and then retrain CT from the results from PCI. This is another way to overcome the problem with the boundary conditions, because we'll never be able to solve this. Yeah. This is uh, the holy grail. And uh, does it work, this one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember when we were doing those 3D printed model, uh, uh, so Suzanne uh, referred to some of the old work when we had done some 3D printed model with Peter and with the team. Yeah, two material was always tricky, but then the, the key question was uh, that we got at that time was, okay, but then why, why you don't prep it? Like, why you don't prepare the lesion? So to, to, you know, not only put the stand, but also simulate, okay, w what happened if you break the calcium, if you do a rotablator, because in, in, in practice, you don't just stand a calcified lesion uh, like that, you will prepare it uh, first. But I think uh, if you can do those simulation more accurately, uh, you, you definitely learn uh, each time. Please move to the next speaker. 
Okay, so the next Stay with us. next speaker is Pierre Guillaume. I don't know if uh, he's here, so he's going to present us on fractal bench test evaluation of coronary stent performance in bifurcation lesion treated by the repot technique. Well, good afternoon, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Pierre-Guillaume Pierriou from the Nantes University Hospital. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for the invitation. And I'm going to speak about uh, bench test evaluation of coronary stents in bifurcation lesions using the pot pod technique, which is also called a report. This is a work uh, that we did uh, with uh, Professor Patrice Guérin in Nantes. I have no conflict of uh, interest. First, why to do uh, this kind of study? Nowadays, uh, there are several manufacturers engaged in the development of uh, new devices. They are evolving fast with new prosthesis and there's a lot of new techniques. We were interested in bifurcation lesions because uh, they are particularly complex to treat, uh, as you know, and pot side pot is popular. And we noted uh, a lack of data regarding uh, the stent's behavior when they are implanted using this technique. So we decided to implant some stents in a silicone model of bifurcation, which follows the fractal law uh, described by Finet et al. using the pot pot technique. We performed it, and then we used a microtomography, a microscan, uh, that, yet, that uh, you can see on the right to analyze the results. Here uh, you have an example of the kind of uh, images that we can obtain uh, with the microscan after the angioplasty endlings. You can, you can see the stent structure in three dimensions from the inside or the outside and you are able to analyze uh, the side branch ostium which was important uh, for our study. Using the microtomography images, we were able to determine uh, several things. The first was the strut-molar position after the pot side pot. As you can see on the image on the right, I'm sorry, but uh, it's hard to see with uh, the grayscale, but it's the same principle as with the OCT. We studied uh, several uh, stents on the market, as you can see uh, on the figure. Regarding results, strut-molar position was relatively low, less than 10% uh, for all stents, as reported in uh, previous studies uh, using the report approach in vitro and uh, in vivo. Even if there were differences, the ratio remained uh, quite low. We also studied uh, the side branch ostium coverage after pot side pot. To do this, we measured the covered by strut side branch area, which is the colored one on the picture. Then we measured the total side branch ostium area which is delimited by dotted line uh, on the picture. And then we were able to determine the side branch ostium coverage ratio for each uh, model of stent. It was quite different between uh, old stents. Uh, some of them, such as the Synergy, had a low side branch ostium coverage, whereas, uh, for example, OC Row uh, was very covering the side branch ostium. One of the explanations for all of these uh, differences was the difficulty to perform a successful side uh, as it really depends, uh, of course, um, on the ability to cross uh, the very most distal cell and not a uh, proximal one. Another parameter that we were able to determine, maybe the most interesting in our study, was the pot side pot effect on the stent cell area. We could determine the stent cell area before and then after the report. It was interesting because uh, it was really different between all stents. And we can wonder that a good increase of functional area means an easier crossing uh, by guide wire if you need to go uh, into the side branch. As I said, we can see here that the pot side pot effects were, were very different between all stents. On the left figure, you can see that uh, some of them have a greater cell area than ours. The lines represent the cell area before uh, pot side pot and the circles or bubbles uh, represent uh, after report, the stent cell area uh, after report. They are not increased uh, in the same way when you perform uh, this technique. And to highlight it, you can see the stent cell area increase ratio on the right, on the figure on the right. 
it's clear that uh, they don't have the same ability to expand and they don't have the same benefit from the Pulsar part. So, regarding uh, side branch ostium coverage and uh, stent cell area increase, we found major differences between all devices. They are related to structural characteristics. Several parameters influence their behavior, uh, such as the position or number of connectors or the shape of cells. For example, uh, the poor performance of the absorber in this study uh, in this bifurcation model may be explained by small cell size and large stroke thickness that are not suitable for a bifurcation uh, lesion. The bioresorbable bio material, which is uh, also different from the usual uh, metallic load, uh, may also have hampered the side branch opening, of course. With uh, all our images and measurements, we were able uh, to make a kind of stand design database, as you can see here. Uh, we determined for each of them uh, its performances when implanted by pot side pot, in particular the capacity of its cells to be open towards the side branch. And in conclusion, I would say that there are major performance differences between all stents uh, when they are implanted by pot side pot. Of course, uh, the perfect stent uh, does not exist for all situations, and favoring uh, one biomechanical parameter often means neglecting another one. It's a balance, of course. It was interesting to find uh, that stent cell area uh, increase was very different between all stents. It's important because uh, a good increase of this functional area uh, may facilitate side bench crafting. So we think that uh, bench test evaluation has a real impact for the clinician. It can help, it, it can, uh, help him in the choice of the good uh, device for the situation. And of course, on a bench test, uh, many other interesting parameters can be evaluated, uh, recall, rate opacity, uh, trackability, etc. Thank you. Uh, I start with one uh, question. Uh, so the, the pot side pot, uh, there are different way of doing it. And uh, one of the way that um, I think Finet had proposed it was uh, to put uh, a balloon for the repot, same position as the first pot. And we've learned with time that this is not the best idea because you then change, you can touch the carina, you will rechange the ostium, you can get. So, how were you positioning your, your repot uh, uh, balloon? We were using the, the, the same position. And did you observe some of the change that were like not as I mean detrimental basically because this was I think uh, John and his team that had shown uh, that if you replace the, this repot balloon all the way to the carina you 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 don't get a you push the carina again and you crush the stand etc yes but that's uh, one of the limitation of the model because it's a silicon one and so uh, we don't have the same uh, um, how to say um, it's not really the same as uh, in vivo, of course. And yeah. in vitro, uh, it was quite good, but uh, it remains in vitro, of course. And is it uh, flexible, the model, or it doesn't differ? Yes. We have Habib Shamadi as well joining, from what I can see uh, in uh, uh, the panel. Uh, welcome, Habib. Uh, so a any questions from the panel? Uh, um. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Great. Well, wonderful presentation and great in vitro work to inform the different strategies with the different stents. I guess one question I had is you you went uh, past your slide where you described the the gain in um, cell area uh, with the different stents that are on the market. You went through that slide pretty quickly. Um, and I'd, I'd like us to take a look at the ones that performed well. Um, you did point out in your conclusion that the absorbed one, obviously with the thicker struts and so forth, do not, but can we focus for a minute? You mentioned the Osiro, um, but also I was curious, I thought the, the Resolute Onyx showed a lot of gain. Um, maybe we could just talk a little bit about some of those stents and what aspects of them are more favorable? Was it just the 
thickness of the strut or is it the cell design or is it the lack of cross links between them that, that make them favorable? Yes, I'm not sure uh, to have understood the question, but uh, you're saying that uh, it's, uh, Onyx, for example, is a good scent for the bification uh, because it uh, earns, uh, it has a great cell area, that's it. And uh, it has also uh, some problems with its uh, strength thickness, that's it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I was wondering if you could go back to that slide where you actually show the demonstration of the different platforms okay. and maybe the panel could comment on why some are, you know, what is it about those certain um, design devices that may make them more favorable? Can go to that slide back, please? Yes, uh, I don't know if we can. I uh, I can't, but uh, maybe. Uh... Est-ce qu'on peut remonter un peu les slides? Can we can we go back to to the slides? And from the end to the to the beginning, just to catch the one which is interesting. No. When you, um, um, you is open it, is it, if we can't go back to the slides, did I read that slide correctly? That yeah. you got go forward quickly. It's the elements, yeah. I think. Go forward. Next. 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 You stop it, uh, please. Uh, this is this one. No. No. Next. This one. This one. I yeah, this one. Yes. Exactly. That I was very, this is very informative. I was trying to follow on, on the right of the screen where it says percent stem cell increase after repot. It's a ratio. Uh, yeah. The ratio. So maybe you could spend a couple of seconds on this slide uh, just for the clinicians to see what, which of these various devices, um, you know, perform better with the repot technique and could be considered for these bifurcation um, lesions. Yeah. yeah. See, the, one of the reasons why your onyx is showing such a huge rise in stent cell area is because the onyx is a coil stent. It's not a tube stent by, yeah. by, by design. So coil stents by design don't offer as good radial strength as tube stents do. These tube stents also tend to be more deformable. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing a complex bifurcation, when you have a lot of hard, uh, hard plaque, mixed plaque area, you expect more deformity in these stents when you do uh, complex PCI. And, and uh, it's very surprising, as Dr. Abhibad mentioned, there is such a huge difference between uh, the stents and just one onyx causing such a huge uh, gain. So I think this has to be discussed. Yeah, I mean, we need to move on, but understanding the methodology, what is measured and what is the stand area, I'm also intrigued uh, by the result because we, you know, measured similar stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it's very interesting and uh, definitely to be followed on. We move to the next, just in the interest of time. Okay, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, the, uh, the Dr. Alper Oner presenting on uh, side branch expansion capacity of contemporary DES platforms. Uh, is it with us, uh, Mr. Oner? Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to present the results of our work regarding the side branch expansion capacity of contemporary DES platforms. Percutaneous coronary interventions of bifurcation stenosis are complex and challenging. Stenting strategies share that the stent's side cell must be carefully explored and appropriately prepared using balloons. So far, stent manufacturers have not provided any information regarding side branch expansion capacity for their stent platforms. Given that drug eluting stent information regarding their mechanical capacity of side branch expansion is not available, we aimed to evaluate contemporary DES like Orzyro, Science Sierra, Resolute Integrity, Promos 
Premier Select and Superflex crews by their side branch expansion behavior using in vitro bench testing. The selected stents represent a mid-size workhorse dimension for coronary vessels. All but the Resolute Integrity stent platform display a so-called slotted tube design where a strut pattern is laser cut from metallic tubing. Concerning Resolute Integrity, this stand platform consists of a waved single strand of cobalt alloy that is laser fused at different locations, thereby forming an open cell strut pattern. All stand platforms share the property that their strut rings are linked by means of connectors which are relevant for the structure's longitudinal stability. The strut zigzag is defined as crowns or peaks playing a crucial role in stent expansion capacity and radial support as well. The array surrounded by a pair of connectors and strut rings is defined as a stent cell. Therefore, the number and array of cells are determined by the number of connectors, strut rings and crowns. Three samples of each of the five commercially available state-of-the-art stent platforms were initially deployed in a phantom silicon bifurcation model with balloons inflated at the nominal pressure as stated in the manufacturer's IFU. The side branch accessibility of each sample was investigated by means of post dilatations of one cell using a biotronic Pantera Leo non-compliant balloon inflated at nominal pressure 14 atmospheres. The balloon size was gradually increased. Initially and following each expansion step, cell opening was measured microscopically in the lateral view. The stand cell perimeter was proving highly variable among the stand platforms tested. Orzyro displayed the lowest cell perimeter with 10.97 and Superflex Cruise the largest with 19.10 mm. Furthermore, Resolute Integrity exhibited the highest standard deviation of cell perimeter, which quantifies the strut pattern's irregularity level post-deployment. The cell diameter enlarges with increasing balloon size, yet the expected target cell diameter is below the size of the non-compliant balloons used for each stand platform. The difference comprised between 5% Superflex crews at 4.0 mm and 35% resolute integrity at 2.0 mm. To reach the target diameter within the side branch cell area, the balloon employed had to be significantly oversized in all analyzed stents. Non achievement of the desired diameter is thought to result from stent compliance and local balloon pinching. Notably, the average differences between the attained cell size and target size branch diameter were not related to the maximum inner diameter given by the manufacturer. If the side branch cell is not properly prepared, the stent located within the side branch is at risk of under-expanding especially in the ostium region. Given this case, the side branch stent might not achieve complete opposition to the vessel wall at the ostium and cause major 
adverse cardiovascular events. Manufacturers are thus encouraged to provide further information on stand model design and labeled site branch capacity of their packaging information and IFU, even if the device is not explicitly indicated for use in bifurcation stenting. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions from the panel? I can kind of jump in and build off of Habib's comment, I guess, from, from the last talk, having seen, you know, now this one as well with, with similar um, sort of angles related to the side branch area. I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, we know these stent geometric characteristics, we know their shapes, we know their, their dimensions, you know, I'm wondering if we can sort of get to the point where we're you know, predicting what these areas are going to be, right, just based on the geometry and then you know, sort of selecting that based on local characteristics from a given patient, I, I guess, is the question that came up in my mind in the last talk and now again in this talk. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great point, John. And I think to that, um, although this is another great addition to uh, sort of our, our arsenal of bench testing, I think this type of bench testing would be most effective if it's combined with computational modeling because each has sort of its own niche. But when you combine those two together, I think you can start to answer questions like you're asking. Because fundamentally, we can't measure stress, right? Um, we can measure shear forces at the wall directly. We can measure intramural stresses within the wall or their distributions. So a combination of these type of bench studies uh, simulations along with computational simulations, I think will give us a more complete picture of the mechanics of these interventions. Um, just a quick comment and then we need to move to the next speaker. Um, we had looked at side branch expansion, Peter, myself, and, and with Peter as well. And the thing we had found was really that the capacity of the stand today was never really a limitation, but on the bench you always optimize, you know where to cross, etc. In reality, you don't know. And what we had found is that if you cross in not the ideal cell, then it's all over the place. And, uh, and that impacts a lot the, the final results. So, so that's an also uh, important point. We need to move on for the time, but the next speaker we have is Paul Morris. I don't know if he's, yeah, he's here. So he's going to, he's coming. He's going to talk to us about refining our descending of the flow through the coronary artery branch, revisiting Murray's law in human epicardial coronary arteries. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul Morris. I'm an interventional and academic cardiologist in Sheffield. And uh, thank you to Eve to, uh, for the invitation to come and talk to you about our work. I'm going to uh, be talking about a study we did looking at uh, Murray's Law, which of course is very relevant for understanding and treating coronary arteries, not least around bifurcations. Murray's Law is a fundamental law of biology. It's very nearly 100 years old, and it very elegantly describes the energy equipoise, i.e. the minimal energy cost function between the energy needed to pump blood and overcome viscous friction in the coronary tree and any arterial tree. And it balances that against the energy required to produce and maintain the blood volume. Now, in the uh, context of this bifurcation meeting, Murray's law is very relevant. According to Murray, flow is proportional to the third power of the diameter. And there's a very characteristic relationship between the uh, diameter sizes of parents and daughter vessels. Now, important for this talk is the, uh, the exponent of three, the cube, so that's the power of three. Okay? Uh, Murray's law was originally based on a number of assumptions, which don't really all hold completely true in the human circulation, not least the coronary circulation. And so the exponent of three in Murray's law has been challenged, and a range of other derivations and exponents have been proposed. 
And those, that, that works mostly based on theory, theoretical or anatomical analyses. So we applied a physiological study to look into it. And this relationship is quite important because, of course, it was Murray's law that was used to derive some of the MLA targets uh, in the guidelines. And we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. The aim of our project was to determine the optimal Murray's exponent in the human epicardial coronary arteries. We performed a retrospective analysis of uh, anatomical and physiological data from adult patients under assessment for chest pain. It was a collaboration and clinical data were uh, collected at the Katerina Hospital in Eindhoven, Netherlands. Uh, and there they measured fractional flow reserve, absolute coronary blood flow and microvascular resistance. And to do so, they used a continuous infusion thermodilution method with the Rayflow catheter. Now, along with the angiograms, these physiological data were exported to Sheffield, where we used our computer model to reconstruct the 3D anatomy and use a computational fluid dynamics CFD method to simulate absolute flow and absolute microvascular resistance. The picture here on the left of the screen is a screenshot from our computer modeling, uh, the software. Uh, this basic model uh, computes the parameters I've mentioned already in terms of physiology, uh, but flow rate is determined at the outlet, whereas with the Rayflow catheter and the continuous infusion thermodilution method measures inlet flow. And so we implemented a leak or a, a simulation of side branch flow. And this equation confirms what we heard in the previous session where we heard that what goes in must come out. Okay. Now, what's important here is the magnitude of the side branch flow, that's the, the, the blood leaking from the model along its length, uh, is critically uh, determined by the taper of the artery, um, but also Murray's law, and therefore the exponent. We uh, applied a whole range of Murray's exponents, uh, then we interpolated uh, the best fit of the clinical data. 48 cases were screened, 27 uh, made it through screening, uh, the, the numbers of cases here were modest, but we did quite a, a detailed analysis of these cases. We were very stringent with them. Now, the mean age was 62, 35% were male, mean body mass index 25, 10% current smokers, 40% hypertensive, and 5% diabetic. The mean invasive absolute flow was 219 mils uh, per minute and the median absolute microvascular resistance was 360 uh, millimeter minutes uh, per liter. Now these are the headline results. We, we optimize Murray's exponent both against flow and microvascular resistance. When we fit the data to flow, the optimum exponent was 2.15. That's the exponent that was associated with the lowest mean delta, the strongest correlation, and the best agreement, i.e. the narrowest 95% limits of agreement against the clinical data. When we did the same thing for microvascular resistance, um, the optimal exponent was 2.38. Now, I have to be honest and say some of the cases, because they were sometimes for Inoka, lacked a stenosis, and for technical reasons, that meant some of our accuracy wasn't as we'd like it to be. Um, but nonetheless, uh, if you split the difference between these two results, you end up with 2.3, which is exactly what the work of... Um, Gassan Kassab and Huo have predicted previously in their work, which is reassuring. So to summarize, we use a 3D CFD model of coronary physiology and anatomy. Um, the most accurate exponent in Murray's law uh, was determined both for flow and for microvascular resistance. 2.15 for flow, 2.38 for microvascular resistance. And although the cases weren't ideal, they were very close to some theoretical derivations. Now, what does this mean for bifurcation stenting? Well, broadly speaking, you know, this is a clinical meeting. The lower the exponent in Murray's law, the larger the parent vessel sizing comes out. And I'll just finish with an example. And I've used an example here that's based on, some, on the introduction at the Litro study uh, back in 2016, I think, uh, with a LAD and circumflex diameter of 2.25 based on what was thought to be the ischemic um, threshold. Um, and if you use Murray's original exponent of 3, you come out with a MLA of 6.3 and a diameter of 2.83. If you apply the lower exponent, the one we fit to flow, 
you come up with an MLA of 7.6 and 3.1. So we're not talking huge differences, but I think we are talking about clinically relevant differences when we tinker with the uh, exponent for Murray's Law. If you want to check out the paper, the reference is on the screen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting presentation. It's good that, in a way, in, uh, theoretical data are confirmed. Um, and, and one question, there were stenotic vessels. Do you have any concerns that the, the presence of stenosis may have affected the dimensions of the vessel of the, uh, in, in the simulation? Sometimes you can have reduction of the luminaria if you have a significant stenosis, etc., etc. The taper was determined in healthy sections of artery only. The way that the CFD model runs does require some stenosis in between to generate a discernible pressure gradient to drive the CFD. So that's important. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, then. So any, any other questions? Yeah. I, I have a question if, uh, yeah. at any time, yeah. So I think I, I really appreciate your talk. I mean, uh, I spent some time on that. So <laughs> um, I think we have to make clearly the difference between the left main and the other bifurcation. Because if you look at these classical pictures showing the secondary tertiary vessel, yeah, yeah. you realize on an angiography, even if the new uh, micro Murray fractal flow system, mm -hmm. we don't look at the vessel below 0.5 millimeter because simply the angiographic technique cannot do two contours on something which is 0.5 millimeter. So there's a lot of vessel there. I mean, don't forget that the epicardial is 5%. Of Absolutely. What you see, this, this is and only all the rest is there, yeah. Yeah. and it's even not detected by angiography. Yeah. But I think in the main stem, like I showed at the beginning of the afternoon, then it's, it's more reliable. And your, your, last, uh, your last slide is about the main stem mm. and the correction possibly 2.38 like CASAP has shown in the, in the world. So the question is, what are we going to do? I think uh, in the future, we will see more and more CTA as diagnostic test. There's no doubt about that. There will be further refinement. I mean, the photon scanner is there, et cetera, et cetera. We will go to the CAT lab, and then are we going to push wire, uh, flow wire, uh, continuously in the patient to know exactly what is the bifurcation can be used. Uh, are we going to stick about jailing a Y and destroying a Y? So really, at some point, we have to go back to this poor instrument, which is the coronary angiography, and try to adapt, adjust what we have learned since Murray about how can we do a surrogate of a simplification for this uh, fractal flow. And I think that what uh, San Van Tu has done, and I, I asked him in 2015, so we are now in 2022, is a first attempt. I mean, measure systematically all the side branch, which are measurable by uh, QCA, and try to have this uh, reference diameter going down. That's the kind of things which is clinically may be useful, we have to prove the point, but may be useful. Because, you know, if you look at a, a study like uh, a syntax, multivessel disease, two-thirds of these patients have one of multiple, uh, multiple uh, side uh, bifurcation, and it's a penalty, it's a terrible penalty for the interventional cardiologists. We just published that in, in Jack Intervention. So, do you have any way how I love what uh, uh, Kasap is doing. I love, love, love that, that kind of work. We, we are doing that with the University of Melbourne. But you have a way for the clinician to simplify. I think what Finet uh, da, did for us was already quite useful to resurrect Murray after so many years. And, well, and, and Kasap, of course, is the neck plus ultra, is the perfection. What, what, how do you see that in the context of clinical approach? Well, you've, you've, you've covered quite a lot of points there. Um, 
Yeah, I'd like to hear what uh, Gassan thinks about the work as well, because of course we referenced it heavily. In terms of your first point now about the position in the vascular tree, it does of course make a difference where you are. Our work was all in epicardial coronary arteries, including left mains and uh, LADs and circumflexes, not further down in microcirculation at all. So, and on your final point about FINE, um, if you work out the MLA based on FINE, the Hugo Kassab uh, law, or the new exponents that we've applied, they're all very, very similar. Yeah, if you apply an exponent to three, then the results are quite different. Yeah, because at one time, I mean, in this auditorium, we will talk about the Strahler model, because, you know, the Strahler is this geophysician who was looking at the river and all the side branch. I mean, yeah. that, that's also part of it. I see a smile on the, on the face of uh, Kasabi. Gassan? But it is beautiful how these, these rules go for the whole of nature. A comment, Gassan? Lots of great points have been raised. First, I'd like to congratulate you on a wonderful study. You know, as a, as a theoretician that makes predictions, we're always delighted to challenge those predictions with experimental measurements. And, and I think this was really, this study was true to, true to that. But maybe I'd like to make a couple of observations. There is a, another law that we really hardly talk about. And that is the following observation. Uh, after making thousands and thousands of measurements on coronary bifurcations, normal coronary bifurcations, we made the observation that the diameter between two bifurcations doesn't change very much. So meaning when you see tapering of the vessel, most likely that tapering is due to bifurcations, small bifurcations along the length of that vessel that you likely missed uh, yeah, I agree. because of angiography resolution. So exactly to Patrick's uh, point that you are probably missing, you know, half a millimeter or less vessels that are coming off of that main branch. Because again, if, if, if you measure uh, the, the diameter uh, between two bifurcations, that tends to be relatively isodiametric, meaning the changes are less than 10%. The main change occurs after a bifurcation uh, takes place. That's that's one point. In terms of practicality, Patrick, the the issue is really if you have a bifurcation and you know you know two of the diameter of the uh, of that bifurcations, and the third is diseased, then you could use, uh, for example, the two one third law. To, to, to determine what that third dimension is. And we developed a simple app where all you have to do is enter two of the diameters. The third will be computed for you in real time, very simply, and, and so that your bifurcation reconstruction is consistent with that optimization, that two and one third optimization. Finet's law tends to capture diameter ratios that are on the large side. 0.8 and greater and Murray's law tends to capture the the smaller diameter ratios and you know as as, as you mentioned really the smaller vessels for for smaller vessels uh, capillaries and and arterioles and so on we've actually shown that the exponent of three applies rather well because the assumptions of Murray's law are more applicable there they're much less applicable for the larger vessels so I'll, I'll stop there yeah Thank you, thank you, Yasan. So you send, you have to send us a link for this calculation. It may be, may be useful in a cat lab. Yeah, yeah, this was published, I think, with one of the papers with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah, thank you, okay. thank you, Yasan. We have to move. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have to move to a presentation by Nicolas Foin. Is poly polymer coating integrity, uh, thrombogenicity and CFD analysis of uh, provisional stenting technique in the left main bifurcation stenting in vitro model. So you see first, uh, Eve, uh, when I read the title, I cut it in half, uh, so it's a little bit shorter. But uh, yeah, I have a lot of results, so I'm going to go quick, so you'll have to, to follow. Uh, of course, from the bench, we've seen it. We had tons of interesting uh, learnings. You can put uh, plaque, material, you can couple it with CFD. We did a lot of work with uh, Yoshi and Patrick on that. So a lot of learnings that have been useful over the years. We learned about the, the, the model designs and how this was uh, important for expansion 
Uh, we learn also about uh, coatings and how those coatings react to the, the overexpansion. You can see here uh, different uh, latest generation stands and really uh, the coating handles much better than in the first generation. Also how the radial stiffness and the radial strength change with this overexpansion. You definitely increase the radial strength and, and stiffness as you uh, post that at the stand. We had shown this uh, uh, many moons ago, so I'm not going to go over it. This is not news. Uh, what we have put is thanks to all those efforts and the bifurcation club push. Nowadays, the manufacturer, much more often than not, have those data available. They've been also adding some new sizes. They have been uh, extending their podilatation limits. I mean, if you know that, you've been also uh, contributing to that. And also, we find more and more this information available on the box. So this table summarizes the different manufacturer data. It's not our own data, but it's helpful if you want to have it in your lab to, to compare. Uh, now, the, the meat on the bone was uh, after some years in, uh, in London and Singapore, we got a bit bored of just doing a, a CFD and bench model. So uh, we started to uh, uh, develop a model where uh, you know all about that, the relationship between share stress, platelet activation, share rate. It's very known in rheology to activate uh, platelet and it's a very well, it's actually a model to create clots. So I'm not gonna go over that. But uh, uh, um, we were interested to see how under expansion and malapposition affects share rate flow disturbance. And clearly you can see that in those two situations, share rate is a key factor. You get a jet or you get turbulence around stand strut. Uh, we had done great work with uh, Prof. Cyrus on that, but our key interest and question was, okay, uh, in bifurcation, we see a lot of those manapost strut proximal, uh, if you don't post dilate, or at the side branch ostium. Uh, you can see here an example. So the question was, what is the impact of those struts, uh, manapost on platelet uh, aggregation? And you can see here with the, the, this video that the more complex the techniques are, the more struts you have all over the place in front of the carina. Uh, uh, etc. So we had a perfused blood gender loop model. So the, basically, we just take blood uh, from pigs, and uh, then I will show some collaborators use the patient blood uh, in a protocol to do the same. So the results are very comparable. And here, what we did is that on purpose, we left the proximal part of the stent manaposed in those models. And when you look uh, down, on immunofluorescence, where is the clots forming? You see that it's exactly where the parts was malaposed. So this was very uh, uh, strong, very reproducible results that show that in that model, you need a substrate for the clots to adhere and, and, and develop. And this is uh, 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 some collaborators in Canada who then uh, took some uh, bloods from patients and they put different degree of mana position. And then what you see is that the more the mana position, the more the chance of stand occlusion. And if you had like uh, uh, 500 micron mana pose all over the, the stand, you basically had almost 100% chance of seeing the, the stand occluded. Uh, then the next step is we were interested, okay, there is all these clinical evidence that say under expansion is actually more important for thrombosis than mana position. So we did the same comparing uh, um, under expansion, so a lesion but well opposed, versus under expansion with a mana post segment. And if you look at the results uh, here, you can see that if you had only under expansion, so this model, you had no clots but you needed both uh, malaposition uh, to, uh, and, and uh, under expansion to get a clot. And the more the length of malaposition, the more the clot, which is to be expected, but this is uh, confirming it. Uh, so this is just the summary of that, that under expansion alone was not sufficient to create thrombosis in this model. I know the clinical data are different, but here that's what we observed. In the bifurcation, of course, we see the clots only in the strut that are at the ostium. So that was also expectable, but it's good to see it confirmed. And, uh, and the more 
uh, if you do kissing balloon and you open, in terms of thrombus area, you still get some uh, thrombus because you never completely oppose the strut. So that also might explain why sometimes you don't see the benefits of kissing in the clinical data. We compared TAP and uh, DK Crush with uh, Valeria and the team, then all the fellows in Singapore. No real difference, so I'm just going to jump uh, over that. Uh, and then I realized why if you gave me a, a, a talk title that was so long because when I digged, that, when I digged into the recent paper, we had a, a collaboration between the fellows in Singapore and the Polish guys, which is the title of the talk, but it's like three lines uh, long. We have been interested to compare uh, how post dilatation and kissing affect the coating of the stent. And um, the interesting part is that you can see here that basically when you do kissing a uh, balloon, you do have more coating damage than if you uh, deploy just a stand or if, if you just deploy the stand and post dilate it without uh, uh, doing kissing balloon. So interesting, uh, this is on the bench. Clinically, of course, uh, you cannot look at the coating, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, just uh, interesting that, uh, oh, it automatically moved, but uh, my takeaway was that, uh, of course, in theory, it's better to embed the stent. It, uh, uh, we know from all the work in animals, etc., that reunderutilization is better when you properly oppose the stent. What we don't know is, does it clinically matter always? Because they are contracting, contradicting data about malaposition. If you ask Gary Mintz, he say that it's, it's not important, only in their expansion matter, and I don't know. So that's uh, the, the fair uh, conclusion. So, but they, they, what is sure is that there is no cost in checking that the job is complete and, and done. So, you know, the conclusion clinically is that potentially all of this, and like all the bench studies, there is some interesting learning and insight, but we don't know how clinically relevant this becomes. And thanks to all the collaborator, put here some picture of the people who have contributed uh, over the years to some of the work. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's also great that we can travel and meet each other again. Professor Rausch, yeah. So uh, I like your, your picture with the fluorescence. I think uh, you can put these pictures in some cat labs. They will in order to remember the operator that uh, the most complex uh, the, the technique you are using, the most protrusion in the flow of the, these uh, struts is not good. So they have to adapt, adopt uh, reasonable techniques and not uh, highly metallic ones. So we don't have a lot of time. We are now going late. Just so except if there is a short comment, Patrick. Yeah, a short comment. And first, we have to thank uh, Nicolas for all the things that we learned from you. Uh, but I have one short question. Is that you spent a lot of time of CFD, okay, Navier-Stokes, finite elements, and so. And then today you say, I jumped to the thrombus, okay. Why, in the meantime, you didn't look at the non-Newtonian uh, fluid, at the viscosity, at the Quemada equation combined with the navier stock, you could have predict where the thrombus will come, no? Because there is one thing which is important, you know, in the left atrium, when you have a mitral stenosis, you start to see spontaneously echo contrast. Echo contrast is rouleau. I suspect the same things happens from time to time in the coronary artery, and that's the reason why to go to the non-Newtonian, because your viscosity suddenly increased massively because the shear stress became so low that you get the... Yeah, and uh, in the interest of time, I didn't show the correlation okay. with CFD, but all of those models, we have done CFD with Jarrell, with Rio, with the collaborator who do CFD and it correlates very well with where the shear yeah. rate. But the, the Quemada is, I mean, I showed that to uh, Chris Wednesday. Eh? You were quite uh, fascinated, especially with the drug coating balloon, you know, when you rupture everything and uh, 
you have very, very low shear stress at a certain point, and I guess the viscosity will come into the pictures. Yeah? Indeed, in complex geometry, it's likely to matter. Thank you very much, Nicolas. There is some data recently showing that malaposition does matter in predict events. There's a paper in Jack Manson publishing last year, so it, your um, data are supported now from clinical evidence. Let's go, go to the next presentation because we're running out of time. Dr. Susan Bayer presents on the secondary flow in bifurcations, important effects of curvature, bifurcation angle, and stents. And in this talk, I will address secondary flow and bifurcations. We'll talk about the important effects of curvature, bifurcation angle, um, in stented and non stented bifurcations. The clinical relevance. Um, arterial shape um, is very complex and varies significantly within a patient between the different bifurcations across the coronary tree, but also between patients. So understanding the combined effect of complex flow, uh, of complex shape, can tell us what flow, blood flow or hemodynamics are generated, um, which trigger adverse pathophysiological responses um, including endothelium injury and plaque um, progression and development. Um, now, flow <clears throat> and adverse flow is uh, particularly common in bifurcations due to the complex shape. Um, but in the literature so far, often only a single or very limited ranges of shape factors have been considered. Um, um, and often not holistically. So with this work, we try to um, generate a more comprehensive understanding of the combined effect of common um, shape variations within a population and how that affects adverse um, blood flow, focusing on curvature anger and stents in particular. Now, um, the flow measurements of interest or hemodynamic descriptors we used here a secondary flow. Um, the clinical relevance is not is still not quite clear, but um, uh, it generates a pair of opposing vortices within a cross section of um, of the bifurcation. So we get a lot of um, recirculation and high um, flow zones, which. Um, depending on the popular hypotheses in literature, must have um, an effect. Now, we also looked at helicity or helical flow, which describes the rotation of blood flow within the artery branches. So a continuous rotation motion of blood passing through the arteries. There are different um, descriptors for um, helical flow, including the local normalized helicity or LNH, including its isosurfaces and um, the, the helicity itself, H2, and in general, um, a high rotation motion is considered favorable um, for pathophysiological responses. And then, of course, the very well-known um, measures of arterial shear stress induced um, by the blood flow onto the endothelium as it passes, which can be described um, adverse when it's particularly low. So we're talking about the low wall shear stress and it's time average, the time average wall shear stress. Um, particularly the cutoff is commonly done at 0.5 um, pascals. Um, yes, so what we did, we generated 128 idealized and patient specific geometries which varied according to our population data. Um, we used curvature across 0, 45, 75, and 105 degrees, which um, is equivalent to a variation in the population of two standard deviations. So we captured um, the normal distribution. Uh, same with the bifurcation angle. We tested 38, 68, 98, and 128 degrees angles. And um, we analyzed stented and non-stented variations um, by looking at three different stent types. So the first one, uh, open cell and square cross-section. The second one, equivalent uh, design, but a circular cross-section. And the last one, a closed design with circular cross-section. 
to then um, analyze uh, helicity secondary flow and wall shear stress and all of these. Many of you might be familiar with torsorosity and its um, relevance clinically, but we used curvature and I want to explain why. Now curvature versus torsorosity, um, torsorosity index is the most commonly used quantity um, to I guess describe the twistedness of arteries. However, um, the torsorosity index uses the center line length, as you can see um, in the top here at the left image, the center line length divided by the shortest distance between um, the beginning and the end of the center line. Now, this might work well in 2D, but however, in complex three-dimensional shapes, as you can see the example on the on the right image on the top, we have the 2D plane in the middle and the 3D plane on the right. You can see that the shortest distance across um, the two points um, are very misleading in a three-dimensional representation, meaning that um, we get a much lower torsorosity index for a more twisted vessel simply because in some instances the two points, the beginning and the end point, could be closer together. So torsorosity index is actually a very misleading measure and should not be used in order to quantify the twistedness of the vessel. Now other possibilities to describe torsorosity are actually is actually curvature, which is the continuous um, description of um, the curvature and space added together, which I guess results in torsorosity. Now, um, in this publication here, we looked at different torsorosity and curvature measures and compared them, and uh, we suggest to use a specific um, curvature measure, which we done in this analysis as well, which is still a description of the twistedness of the vessel. It's just, um, I guess, going away of a of a inefficient measure of um, torsorosity index. Okay, so what did we find? Um, looking at the individual effects first, um, curvature just by itself without changing any of the other shape factors, we found that curvature or torsorosity has a very strong effect. Um, it affects secondary flow, it causes skewed and spin asymmetric and symmetric um, Dean vortices, so the two vortices in the cross section I was mentioning earlier. Um, especially in idealized models, um, and also high helicity in both idealized and patient-specific models. Smaller curvature does still have some effect of secondary flow um, in patient-specific models, which is uh, amplified due to complex cross-sectional variations, the difference between idealized and patient-specific. Now, um, if we look at the effects of bifurcation angle, Bifurcation angle used to be a very popular measure and um, has had a lot of um, clinical relevance attributed to it. However, in terms of flow, um, the precise effect and role of bifurcation angle is not um, very clear. And this work actually highlights why. So if we look at bifurcation angle alone, we found that large bifurcation angles, which not often have been studied, the two standard deviation within a population, so the whole range, um, larger than around 90 degrees, um, causes actually a more symmetric recovery of the vortices in the daughter branches, which is actually favorable, um, uh, contrary to, I guess, old outdated understanding. Now, there is a clear association between bifurcation angle and helicity, but I want to highlight here that this large bifurcation angle being favorable is not the full picture as we learn later on. So, um, yes, the effects of stent, briefly, if we look at all these different 128 geometries and we uh, stent them, and then we look at stented versus non-stented, you can see here in those cross-sectional um, <clears throat> flow views that the stents have had a significant effect across um, all the different variations um, within the stented regions alone, especially in terms of wall, she wall shear stress areas adjacent to the strut regions. Now, the combined effect, as mentioned earlier, the moment we combine curvature and bifurcation angle, it actually becomes quite interesting because large curvature has only an adverse effect for smaller bifurcation angles. 
And patient-specific models in general had a much lower adverse wall share stress distribution, which means that the non-uniform cross-sectional variations actually are somewhat protective compared to a straight idealized representations. Now, um, as mentioned before, stents increased wall share stress in the local regions uh, notably and actually outweighed any anatomical variations um, within the specific models. What it all means together, that large curvature is in general, or high twistedness is in general adverse, um, as it introduces a lot of asymmetric secondary flow and low wall shear stress. However, if you combine large curvature with large bifurcation angle, this effect is actually mitigated and it doesn't become as adverse. And interestingly, we find that a lot in the population. So a large bifurcation angle is only really, really bad if it's in a very straight vessel. Um, and then, of course, the effects of stents. The moment an artery is stented, the, the flow is completely um, reset, so to speak, and the stent itself in the stented region only outweighs any geometric effects. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. This is um, so from the panel, is there a pressing important comment? We are uh, a bit late on time, but if there is like a uh, really relevant comment. Nicola, I, I would just, just quickly just compliment um, Dr. Beyer for really a fantastic presentation trying to bring in all the different complexities and the biomechanics of stents. So just compliment her. Would love to see that talk again and look at the slides and look at the publications behind it. Great. Any other comment? Okay. We're going to, I'm going to pass on the mic to Eve. He's going to close the session. I think uh, for the majority of the room, maybe it was sometimes difficult to, to follow. So, but I, I'm always looking, I'm preparing the meeting. I'm always looking at this kind of uh, presentations because it, it, it gives uh, us information that are important for the type of technique we are developing. And also, just the last word will, will, will be, uh, I'm waiting maybe from the great scientist you are, uh, uh, a big project that can help, that will help in the future uh, how to treat the patient. So you have to maybe to be, to work together to, to push such, uh, such, such a project. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Patrick? A comment from Patrick. Very short, Patrick. We are late. Very short. very short. Along the line that you are using, I think this is very theoretical, and we clinicians said, how can we capture that? There is a way to capture. We all do OCT, and you know at the time the clearance gets bad, you see this rotational motion on the OCT. That's exactly what she's describing, because it's the red cell that you see basically there with the, the poor clearance. So with the bioengineering group in, in Rotterdam, I was pushing for uh, OCT looking forward, you know, so that because th this rotational motion that you see at the end of the clearance is induced by the presence of the catheter, is not related to the anatomy. So the only way to catch that for a clinician that was to have a forward OCT. So we built up one and we did something in the work, I'm talking about uh, five, ten years ago at least. Uh, the point is that you have to be quite far from the looking forward OCT not to disturb again the, the, the flow and then we abandoned the project. But that's the kind of idea that you were alluding to. How can we get from these things something that we translate and translate to, uh, to the clinical field, yeah? So, as a conclusion, please translate uh, all the knowledge you have accumulated uh, for uh, interventional cardiologists in order to help us to, to treat better our patients. That can be a project for the near future. And I hope this, that uh, next year we'll, you will, we will see you in, in person. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. The session is closed.
Yeah, that, thank you very much for being here and uh, happy to see quite some people coming in for another uh, nice case presentation. I would say it's an extensive case. Uh, uh, Tom prepared a nice case on the left main because the title is the right tools for the left main, which will combine imaging, potentially some physiology, but you will discuss that during the case, and uh, the right kind of stand. So what kind of stents are we using for the large left main uh, treatment. So, Nef yeah, Nefes is already in there as our uh, panelist. I will join you, but I think Tom is, doesn't need an introduction, and Tom, I'm really happy if you would start your case. Um, we have several, bl two blocks and some discussions in between, so I think this should be a nice interactive session. And we have some comments from both the panelists and from the audience. So, Tom, please start your presentation. Great. Thanks, Robert Young, and, and thanks for the opportunity to speak, the invitation. So this symposium was titled Complex Bifurcation, um, the right tools for the left main. My disclosures are as they are there. I, I would actually question the title, so highlighting the, com the complex and left main. We're all about complex at the moment. Everything's about chip, everything's about, as I see it, actually ego being the distraction. I don't care if it's complex or it's simple. We should be doing the same job regardless. And I often worry that the complex is more about us puffing our chests out and saying how good we are rather than actually thinking about the result. But maybe that will stimulate some debate. The toolkit, the need for vigilance, I think remains unchanged regardless of the case. Maybe this is just me supporting and defending the fact I'm not going to show you a particularly complex case. But the focus must be, regardless, as I say, on achieving the best possible outcome. So this is an 82-year-old female. The intention had been that we were going to share a recorded case, and I'm sorry that we haven't had the opportunity uh, to record a case in time for the meeting, but this was a case done actually by one of my uh, colleagues at the Bristol Heart Institute with me standing by his side badgering him about OCT. So this is an 82-year-old female who presented actually to another hospital with some ECG change, a small troponin rise, and importantly, preserved LV function on the echocardiogram. The echo as reported off-site was of an 80% distal left main stem stenosis, an 80% proximal LAD stenosis, and a large dominant but unobstructed right coronary artery. So the case was discussed locally and with our surgeons, and the plan was for referral to us and actually on then meeting with the lady, the, the feeling I think was a mutual one of being declined for surgery. So these are the images to share. I'm sorry the bright lights probably make that slightly harder, but even with the bright lights, you may well see that certainly in my mind, that's not an 80% distal left main stem stenosis. Sorry, I'll go back and allow it to play again. So in this caudal projection, we certainly see some plaque disease, but not anything truly critical. It is a large dominant right, and so actually the circumflex is relatively small. And in that spider projection, you see maybe slightly more uh, significant disease, but again, not the 80-80 that was suggested in the distal left main and proximal LED. So do we just proceed? She's been transferred to another unit. The intention was that she was going to be revascularized initially by surgery, and now she's been defaulted to percutaneous intervention. And I have to say that in our hands, with this ambiguous anatomy, we need more information. So Robert Young mentioned about maybe physiology or imaging. In this setting, albeit a small troponin, we elected to go with uh, imaging. So this is a, a cut-down OCT. I'm sorry, this is a, a, a GIF um, of the Ultrion system. But showing very nicely now what the new software is enabling us to see, which is that superimposition of uh, the calcium overlying the angiogram, and we see uh, down on the longitudinal that we've set this at 180 degree arc. It'll give us both the arc and the thickness of the calcification, and so allow us a real-time uh, kind of awareness of the, the complexity of this coronary disease. I'll just let that run again. What it highlights actually is that there's a, a more critical stenosis at the level of the osteal LAD. I'll show you some still frames that shows that actually the left main is potentially relatively unimpacted uh, by this disease. And the main burden of the calcium happens to be downstream in the less diseased proximal to mid-segment of the LED. 
So here are just some still frames. So we see this is the MLA at the level of the ostium of the LAD. Here are the bifurcation markers automating the um, presence of the bifurcations down the length of the LED, and we see that this osteal disease is of a severity of 3.3. But actually, in the, LA, in the left main stem, we have an MLA of 6.1, 6.18. So I don't know whether we pause there to discuss how to proceed with this lady. Excellent. So... Um Looking at Nefes, who is my co-chair panelist in here, I think we consider this as a significant lesion, a 3.3 square milliliter, uh, square millimeters as an area. Um, so, would you do an, an analysis, an OFR, or anything like this as a new kind of technologies to make it more absolute, or just follow because the MLAs have different cutoff values for different vessels, different uh, sensitivity and specificity if you compare to the FFR. What would be your comments on that? Yeah, and it's true that actually, um, especially for left main, there are not very well-defined OCT cut values. But I, I think that really we are here in an area of 3.3 in an osteal LED, so I don't think there is much doubt about uh, the severity of this stenosis besides this is a patient that presented with ACS and there is no other apparent culprit, so I think we are pretty sure that this is uh, the lesion that we need to treat. On the other hand, physiology, as uh, Tom mentioned, has the disadvantage in this context of uh, ACS, no, of um, having some problems, especially if we believe we are evaluating the culprit vessel. So I, I think I will be, for me, it would be enough uh, with this uh, evaluation and this area to, under to, to think that this is the, the lesion that we need to treat and proceed. Okay. So for the decision to treat, we won't need another technology to decide. And then I think your next steps will, how are we going to treat and, and which kind of sizings are you going uh, to use? And looking at this calcium, large arch, 104 degree, but pretty thick calcium, maybe. Should we already take a step in the kind of strategy, uh, Tom, or is that too yeah, early? Yeah, we could. So, we could. I mean, how are you going to deal with this calcium? We can maybe we could check again. The, um, can you can you play again the um, the video of the ultron yeah. to show the calcium? Because to me it it looks like there is uh, areas of uh, with some uh, yeah deep. Uh, I'm sorry, it's cropped out. Yeah, it's superficial bottom. calcium. Basically, um, there are areas where you have more than 180 or even 270 some thick calcium uh, in certain areas. But it's true that you don't have really a complete ring at any point. The calcium is also quite uh, superficial. Um, so it could be a patient where I might try first maybe with um, an specialty balloon, something like a cutting balloon, uh, instead of directly, for example, going to rotablation or any other option. Another option could be probably lithotripsy uh, yeah. with these uh, areas of um, big arc and thick calcium. Okay, so, so I mean, part of the reason for showing that was, was again, I think, this focus that we have now created of, of looking at the numbers. And, and these numbers would suggest that something has to be done. And again, that complex kind of chest inflation is about taking the sexiest tool. So I think there are many people who might look at this image and say, we take IVL. And that's one of the dangers, possibly, of the artificial intelligence, is we're allowing the machine to take over the thinking, and there does have to be some interaction with the imaging. And there needs to be a qualitative as well as quantitative assessment of the calcium. I think that the first thing was, was whether we can justify the intervention. I think you're right, Robert and, and Nieves, that this lesion looks severe enough. But actually, when we, again, look at numbers, these numbers don't equate to what the studies tell us, possibly. So imaging in terms of left main disease uh, is contentious, but IVUS has been given a 2A recommendation. And this was obviously embedded into the second part of consensus, which acknowledged the difference between possibly European and Asian uh, disease in terms of sizing, where there is clear evidence that an MLA less than 4.5 millimeters squared offers a mandate to revascularize in the left main. Above six, then it's reasonable to take a conservative strategy, and then you're left with this gray zone between 4.5 and six, where you might consider a physiological assessment. But in this case, we've said with the, the 
ACS presentation that the physiology is then harder to, to consider. But the left main MLA above six would suggest we don't need to be treating the, the left main. So then how about the evidence that surrounds use of an MLA in a non-left main position? And so we have now Forza and Flavor to, to consider. Uh, I was wondering if Francesco is in the room, but obviously the Forza study was comparing FFR versus an OCT-guided approach in the moderate lesion between 30 and 80, so not really moderate, quite severe stenosis potentially. And again, there's this issue around the fact that we're very comfortable talking about diameter stenosis, but we don't often factor in area stenosis. And then there's this often mismatch between choosing a diameter of stent, but then also wanting to achieve a certain stent area. So if we consider our patient's disease in this relation, actually she had an MLA in the, uh, left, in the LAD of 3.3, which doesn't quite match um, the, the requirement of Forza. And if we consider that against reference in terms of area stenosis, she doesn't play out in terms of being able to randomize to this study. So the randomization was either an area stenosis greater than 75 or between 50 to 75 with an MLA less than 2.5 or OCT evidence of plaque rupture. If we look at flavor, and obviously flavor was the most recent from Bong Kong Koo, who's also here and maybe in the room, um, was IVUS against FFR, and the numbers are different again, just to confuse us, but either less than three millimeters squared or between three and four, which we are, with a plaque burden of more than 70%. You might argue with OCT, certainly with this light, it's very difficult to make out plaque burden, but actually on estimating a reasonable vessel size, we get a plaque burden of 78%. So she could have recruited into flavor had it been IVUS, had uh, obviously a whole load of other issues, but potentially we can justify it by that means. If we consider the com kind of head-to-head -head comparison of the secondary outcomes, which are um, identical from these two studies, then we see that obviously the design were different, so the superiority nature of Forza actually showed in incorporating significant angina alongside the major adverse cardiac endpoint composite, uh, a, a positive result. Flavor was actually seeking non-inferiority between FFR and IVUS and demonstrated no difference uh, be between the two. So as Nieves mentioned, we, we uh, certainly acknowledged the calcium that was evident uh, within the OCT run, but felt that actually the, the area that we were likely to be stenting was relatively free of significant calcification. But in, in view of the kind of octogenarian nature of her disease, we took a, a slightly more aggressive uh, strategy here with an NC score flex rather than a simple non-compliant balloon. And so we're looking really just to treat left main LAD in a provisional approach. So I thought I'd then share some still frames from the second OCT. So the important thing here is about then you know, re-establishing whether we've done what we need prior to the placement of the stents. We've seen some complications already in the meeting today where stents have been deployed and only after the deployment do we find that we have dog boning or that we have issues around the appropriate sizing. So here we see on the longitudinal that we've made an assessment and this is an incredibly useful way of guiding the length We've actually had to go back into the guide catheter, but we have an 18 millimeter length and we're actually remote from those areas of, of greater degree of calcification. And then if we consider our landing zones, we have a distal landing of 2.9, 2.5, and it's into disease. This idea of avoiding 50% plaque burden actually in, in a vessel like this becomes incredibly challenging. And then upstream, uh, certainly um, in the area prior to the, to the catheter, uh, we see uh, a lumen that's eccentric, but three five to three millimeters in size. So the next step then is the placement or choice of a stent. Just distal to uh, the, the, or within the proximal segment at the level of the first diagonal branch, we see quite significant eccentricity. And this is, this is distinct from the bifurcation point, but actually then shows a vessel size that extends to 4.8 millimeters. So I, I wonder now about the, the selection of the stent. Robert Young. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I think that you excellently showed that, that we have good tools to, to optimize our procedure or not 
to be sure that we have good outcomes. I would say it's either FFR or imaging. Um, doesn't seem that one is over superior over the other one. Um, but none of them compared leaving the 3.3 .3 square millimeter area alone because they could not include it. Patient might have been treated. There is no randomization versus conservative or, or, or angioplasty alone, I would say. Um, but still on that, so we agreed to, to treat this patient and to achieve an optimal result where you already see that you will have quite some significant tapering. So you will have to overextend your, your stent, which you will probably size at the distal landing zone, and then do a pot in the, in the proximal area, and you probably know that you will have to go up to a five millimeter balloon. Um, you have done a very nice pre-dilatation with a result which makes that you can really open up this vessel with balloons, so we don't have to go for the shock wave or, or any rotablation. So very useful information you're getting from this from this OCT guidance. Anything I didn't mention, Yefes? What did you learn more from the OCT? No, um, I didn't see very well the the area of the osteal LED where, I mean, the area, the tightest this, this part, about, but it opened up with, uh, it opened up with, uh, with an uncompliant balloon and there's yeah. some fractures there already. So I think this is, this is really important to check that you've properly fractured the calcium before you go for a stand. And of course, this is one of these examples of how challenging it is to size your stent in vessels with diffuse disease, such as this one, and especially when you have this discordance in size between yeah. the LAD and the, and the left main. And of course here, the, the platform is uh, critical no? to, to achieve a proper, proper coverage. I'm very happy that we are not discussing anymore about trying to just osteo <laughs> nail the osteon, <laughs> and we are completely sure, everyone, that we need to cover the left main, even when in the left main the area was above above six, uh, as you mentioned. Yeah, Patrick. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, analysis. I'm sure that the rest of the treatment will be also quite exciting. Uh, one comment and one question. The comment is for, uh, in general, but for Nieves uh, in particular, <laughs> at some point she said for the proximal LED on OCT 245 is the good number and later on she went even to 215 to be honest without inflation so it's not the value which is important I think what is important is the uh, don't use cutoff criteria in medicine is very difficult we create cutoff criteria because medicine is a binary thing you do you don't do Okay, but it's not the best way. The second question is for you. Uh, in Bristol, do you have a software for the uh, FFR OCT? Because you know what you see now, a, a lot of trial, KEDI for instance is doing a trial opposing uh, physiology and imaging. The fact that we have now this uh, software for uh, OCT FFR, and I can tell you that it works pretty well pretty well, it has been validated again, pressure Y alone. And also uh, with Akiko and the people of uh, Prospect, we have a paper just accept on the IVUS FFR. So do, you can merge the, the imaging and the physiology and that might help because at that age, the troponin can come from everywhere. Yeah. yeah? And then we focus because we found something like, uh, you know, uh, the famous philosopher in uh, Athens working with a torch in the middle of the day, we see something and then we go for it. But as a matter of fact, it might be. So I think it's a beautiful uh, uh, question. The real aspect is after the treatment, will this individual free of troponin and free of angina and free of everything? That, that's it's fascinating. She fascinating. won't be free of risk. I, I think that's the reality. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, fantastic comments and I agree this issue around absolute values is something I want to expand upon in the imaging session tomorrow because I think that we are a group of enthusiasts in bifurcation in imaging and there's a comfort around using numbers but actually what's what's probably held most concrete in the community are absolute values and and that's a real danger but equally then there is an importance in terms of recognizing if i go back one actually the, the the difficulties that we are faced with particularly in left main in terms of the discrepancy in caliber from proximal to distal and so then we have choices and, and actually the imaging often you know maybe people why people don't use imaging is because we sometimes make decisions harder and so we're told we should avoid disease segments but actually we don't have a disease-free segment in this 82 year old lad 
So many could argue this isn't the right place to land, but actually from using the uh, longitudinal um, contouring, this appears a very reasonable place to go. It would suggest that in upsizing towards the nearest luminal dimension, we'd be looking at a 3.0 stent. But actually we want a vessel, we want a stent that can go above 4.8, and we need a stent that can uh, kind of accept the, the size of the left main. And so we need, we need to be thinking up front about an appropriate device that can, can expand across that, that uh, range. Excuse me. Yep. Um, sorry to interrupt. Would your imaging strategy have changed if the creatinine was elevated? What, what did you do in this case? And uh, what about the washout of contrast when you're so close to the left main? I mean, are there strategies to get good results with OCT? But, but those are two points I wanted to ask. Yeah, so, so the issue around, if we're, we're excluding the ostium, so is there an issue there in terms of us missing disease by using OCT rather than IVUS? In truly um, proximal osteal disease, I would favor using IVUS over OCT. I don't think that was an issue here where we had both angiographic evidence and no issues in terms of pressure damping of the catheter. And increasingly, actually, you can get a reasonable appreciation of the vessel behind the soft tip of the catheter, or in fact, use some of the guide extension catheters. Um, so the telescope um, from Medtronic and actually a more recent Siegler liquid um, catheter are both fairly transparent in terms of gaining OCT imaging. In terms of the renal dysfunction, uh, minor degree, you know, moderate to CKD level three, a creatinine of 60, I wouldn't be worried. Below that, I might be thinking either about using a saline 50-50 or in very significant renal disease, again, turning to use IVUS rather than OCT. So my practice it, it engages both imaging modalities, but they're, they're good comments. Thank you. In terms of the, the stenting, then I, then I think you know, it's important to consider the platform. And, and obviously, all companies now have some um, large uh, vessel um, uh, platforms. Zion's family has just recently expanded into the SkyPoint, which is altering the delivery system and uh, actually changing the IFU in terms of the upper expansion limit. So if we consider the original Zions, uh, or the Zions Sierra, which is what we have predominantly in our cath lab, then the 3540 platform will expand to 5.5, although we tend to get it up towards 5.7 um, off label. But this transition between 3 and 3.5 means we do have to oversize to the distal vessel. The SkyPoint now enables uh, on IFU to go up to 5.75, potentially larger. So uh, this is an important step in terms of now having stents that can achieve expansion across a much wider range. So here we are um, deploying the stent using the deployment software from Ultrion. And I'll just share with you then the um, subsequent runs. So this is uh, run three, having actually already expanded with a three and a 4.0 uh, pop balloon in the proximal vessel. And here you see the MSA values to the absolute values that we've just been told we should be trying to avoid, but with the 4.5 or the 5.5 cutoffs with IVUS and OCT. And then you'll see in a moment a comparator. So the beauty of the new software allowing us actually uh, to compare head to head uh, the images that we've achieved. So we see that following the initial 403.5 dilatation, we've got up to seven, seven millimeters squared. And then with more aggressive post dilatation and recognition of the area of malaposition in that area of a very eccentric vessel, we've gone back actually with a semi-compliant balloon up to high pressure and achieved adequate apposition. And with further more aggressive pop, we've actually brought the MSA, at the uh, ostium of the LAD distal left main up towards 10 millimeters squared. Now, importantly, we acknowledge we've oversized the stent distally, and so it's really important to exclude dissection, and it comes as no surprise that we see some degree of vessel disruption. But importantly, we only see that across less than a 60-degree arc, and you'll see a measurement of length extending less than three millimeters. So uh, using the uh, caliper profile on the longitudinal, we can make a measure. I'm sorry, it's cut off here, but it comes out at about 1.8 millimeters in length. So happy to leave a really relatively mild, uh, minor uh, distal edge dissection. 
that leads us to look at the stent optimization criteria. As I say, this real concern that, that we are using these absolute values no matter where the stents have been deployed. And so I think it would be quite common for people to hang upon these numbers of 4.5, 5.5 by OCT and IVUS. And yet uh, we have to be careful about considering the MSA in the context of the, uh, the vessel size that's being treated. So I've actually created this schematic for our cath lab because I think actually the companies probably need to change, change tack as well in terms of on the box maybe including both uh, the diameter and the area so that we can actually play between these numbers. But if we consider this trifurcating anatomy where we've placed a 2.5 millimeter stent and we have an MSA of 4.5, we see just a minor uh, persisting stenosis, then actually that seems quite reasonable. And if we're achieving the 4.5 millimeter cutoff, then actually all we've been left with is a less than 5% diameter stenosis, less than 10% area stenosis. We should be attempting to achieve 4.9, which equates to a 2.5 millimeter stent. But that is important. If we're actually treating into a distal vessel that's only two millimeters, a 4.5 millimeter area may well be far too big and we're gonna end up with disruption. Whereas if we then turn our attention to the larger vessel circumflex proximal LAD, then quite clearly this absolute value cutoff becomes completely inadequate. And so it's really critically important that we consider that. And that then leads us on to another element that perhaps we need to discuss at greater length tomorrow during the imaging session, which is about, again, the fact that this is well remembered, 8765 as a rule for the left main. This is importantly in an Asian cohort where that perhaps might be relevant to a, a, a smaller size um, patient cohort in terms of um, height and weight. But actually, if we look at the IVUS post hoc analysis from the Noble substudy, actually the, the, the areas that are being achieved in the left main are very, very different to those that we have historically kind of hung um, uh, acceptable results upon. And so here we see that actually, you know, MSAs of 13, 11, less than 10.8 was what, where we saw the greatest degree of hazard. So I don't know whether we want to wrap things up and conclude there, but Jan. Yeah, absolutely. We are running uh, three minutes late, but still, I think it is so much interesting. Did you break down these 13 square millimeters back to diameter for us? So that's a four row balloon. Four, huh? four point, yeah, it takes four you point above five. to sort of four and a half millimeters, I think. So that's what we did see originally on your first OCT pullback. We already again, said, I noted um, 4.8. So 4.5 or 5.0 uh, pot balloon would be optimal. And that's where you ended up. And also then you would achieve the 13 square millimeters. You were a bit surprised how large balloons then you need for even for this 82 year old lady and you're not disrupting the left main with this 4.5 balloon. No. Yeah. More comments on the case, Nyanyefas? No, I think, it's, um, I think it illustrates very well how you can use OCT for left main treatment because this, for some people still, is kind of uh, taboo. OCT cannot be used in left main. I think in the case of a distal left main or still LED like this one, OCT is, um, is a very good tool. And uh, especially all the automata automatization of the software that we have with the new Ultron, et cetera, of course, facilitates a lot the, the work in, in the lab regarding measurements, et cetera. And I, I fully agree with your last comments about how absolute values and also prof comments about absolute values. I mean, uh, really the, the size of the vessel is so different <laughs> in all the coronary tree that of course having absolute cut of values uh, doesn't make any sense. No, no, so then we're going to, to wrap up the case and, uh, and this session, I think you have uh, excellent demonstrated. That would be my comment that your first OCT already give, I would say 80, 90% of your information, avoiding a lot of additional contrast, a lot of uh, additional balloons, because you know you want to have a 3.0 pre-dilatation balloon fully open before you continue. Uh, so investing in the beginning will save you time, fluoroscopy, contrast uh, in the total. So usually if these patients uh, aren't on the edge of the renal failure and, and OCT is still a good investment. Yeah. Um, we have seen how we can use it as a um, guidance for treat or not treat. Uh, it is as good as FFR, FFR to make our decisions. The clinical endpoints, if you either use IFS or OCT are similar. And then uh, the details you get for your procedural planning and your stent sizing and how we can go up to the five 
uh, millimeters in diameter to get full apposition, I think was uh, clearly demonstrated again in this uh, a series of short images you, you uh, captured from your one of your last procedures, but very educational. So uh, I would thank you uh, for taking the time to prepare all this and uh, Nefes for sharing with me, uh, sharing comments and ideas with the audience. So then we continue to the next session. I thank you much for, for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good evening to all of you, and welcome to this uh, symposium that is supported and gratefully sponsored by Boston Scientific. The title of the session is really pertinent because the ultimate toolkit for modern PCI. Modern PCI is developed within the frame of precision medicine and outcomes driving medicine. We have everything we do in the, in the cab lab has to be supported by evidences and has to, needs to have an impact on, on the outcomes of uh, our patients. And we have two excellent speakers today. Uh, the first is Stuart Watkins from uh, Glasgow. And he's going to deal with imaging, uh, particularly IVUS. There are many trials uh, just uh, demonstrating that IVUS guidance PCI has an effect on heart, and on heart outcomes in patients, particularly in complex lesions. And we're going to see how to really uh, implement the use of IVUS guidance from the evidences to, to the essentials, you know, the essential to the pre s and post s workflow with IVUS. And the second topic uh, is uh, to, be the, to be developed by Jolanta uh, Siler Matula from Vienna. Eh? And uh, she's going to talk about the calcium. Calcium is present everywhere because it's the most feared enemy of our procedures. Uh, calcification is a, is a complex by itself, but adds complexity to any other lesion. No? If, a if a bifurcation is calcified, it's a worse uh, bifurcation. The left main, the CTO, the carpet lesion in a STEMI, if the calcification is the, over there, then we are going to have uh, maybe some troubles. But we have tools now to deal with the, uh, to tackle calcification. We have a good interaction between calcification and imaging, as we will see. And it's important to know what tool, what uh, the algorithm to follow in, in treating these situations. Then uh, the first, I think, is a tour, no? It's uh, about, uh, you will see that a simple framework for your next procedure, Ibus. Stuart, please. Thanks very much for the, the kind introduction. Um, I think I'm the only Scotsman here, and this is the first time that I've ever uh, spoken in Spain. So the first thing I thought I would do is review our football fortunes between our, our great nations. You can see there is similarities in the badge of the Scotland team and the, the Spanish football side. Now, when I did a Google search, I was met with horror by this result, 8-0 thrashing of Scotland. Uh, by Spain last year. This was a women's team. I don't think many people clicked on the highlights of, uh, of this game. 
So I then moved on to the men's national side. So believe it or not, since 1957, our great teams have met on 13 occasions. However, Scotland has only won three times. Uh, Spain's won six times. So overall, Spain wins eight to five. However, the population of Scotland is five and a half million compared to the population of Spain at 47 and a half million. So I think we win on the moral high ground of population size. Okay, so I'm going to go through a case presentation which makes you think about you know, how we practice medicine and uh, to make you wish you'd used IVIS uh, before. I'm going to go through a simple framework which has been developed by Boston Scientific in order to do an IVIS examination called IVIS 123. I'm going to show a case where IVIS was quite useful. I'm going to talk about, about a couple of forthcoming studies as well. So this is a 71-year-old man with an NSTEMI. He is a pigeon fancier. He's fairly athletic by Scottish standards with a BMI of 33. Um, he was turned down for bypass surgery in view of his poor lung function. Hopefully this will work. I hope it worked a minute ago. <laughs> yeah. Able to help at the back? To click on the video from the... Ah, there you go. Here we go. Okay, so he's got a true left main bifurcation stenosis. He has Medina 111. He's also got stenosis in the first obtuse marginal branch and at the time I treated death with uh, uh, a clot technique to the, the left main LED circumflex bifurcation and I performed a tap into the first obtuse marginal. Can you play that please? So I can show you my good work. There you go. So all in all I thought I'd done a pretty good job there. I'm quite happy. Um, however, three months later patient reappears with angina and um, they've got the dreaded osteo left circumflex restenosis. So a bit disappointed by that. And uh, this case was done a number of years ago, treated with non-compliant balloons, drug looting balloons. And you can see a fairly, fairly nice result. And you look back at, we did an IVIS exam, you can see a real calcified nodule. And it made you wonder if you'd noticed that at the start in the first procedure, you may have modified this further and prevented this. So I just thought we'd got rid of this patient, the pigeon fancier, four months later, they represent, uh, and unfortunately now, an NSTEMI, subtotally occluded circumflex, and they've now blocked the, the OM, which I'd tapped in the original procedure. And these are, the sort of, these are the cases that really stick in your mind as you go forward. Now, the, the image quality from IVIS is really advanced markedly since the early days now with the 60 megahertz optocross high definition catheter we get some really beautiful images and it's not quite as clear as OCT and the beautiful images which uh, Tom Johnson's just shown however it's certainly getting there over time and um, there's innumerable studies which have shown uh, the benefits of using IVIS compared to angiography uh, when guiding your, your stent implantations and there's even evidence of reduced MACE um, with uh, bifurcation PCI as well using IVIS. So that leads on to the IVIS 123 essentials. And this is a, a nice framework which has been developed by Boston Scientific so that we remember to do everything when we're doing an IVIS exam um, uh, in a nice clear stepwise fashion. So the problems that we're looking at, first of all, is how long is the plaque to be covered? Number two, which type of plaque are we dealing with? Is it lipid, fibrotic, is it calcified? And then what is the size of the vessel, proximally and distally? So number one, establish the length of lesion. So you can use your longitudinal view. And it can be quite nice to show you sort of landing zones proximally and distally and using your bookmarks to determine the lesion length. Obviously, a nice place to land your stent would be you know, here where the, the vessel is nice and normal. Obviously, you wouldn't want to land your stent here in a heavily diseased section and less than 50% plaque burden, sometimes with diffuse disease, which we often see in Scotland, unfortunately, is sometimes where you have to land your stents. Number two, we then go on to assess plaque morphology. So you can see in the left plane, we've got very lipid rich plaque, uh, which is hypoechogenic, and then you've got brighter plaque in the middle frame, 
uh, which is fibrotic. And then the brightest plaque on the, on, on the right hand side is calcium with a signal void beyond. Number three, you then measure the vessel size. Obviously, the distal reference size is the size of stent that you're going to put in. And also, the proximal vessel size is going to be your post dilation balloon size. So once your stent's in, you're post dilated, you're quite happy with your, your angiographic appearances. You then go on to one, two, three for the, the post stent workflow. So number one, check for geographical miss and the edge dissections. Two, look for malapposition. And three, check for optimal stent expansion. And obviously, you want to achieve greater than or equal to 90% expansion uh, where you can. Sometimes not possible in calcified disease. So number one, you can see on the left-hand plane there, that's a nice optimal landing zone. So using the dynamic uh, imaging tool, uh, if you've got the Polaris software, um, you can see that we've got a nice landing zone there and a piece of healthy vessel. Uh, in the middle frame, we've landed there within a, a stenosis and quite marked plaque. And on the right-hand frame, we've got an edge dissection. So both these need to be dealt with uh, before the patient leaves the table. Number two, we would check for malapposition. You can see in the left-hand frame, we've got some beautifully opposed stent, nicely adherent to the vessel wall. Whereas in the middle frame, this stent is malapposed uh, and needs further postulated. And you've got to be careful not to mistake malapposition for a side branch. And you can see in the right-hand frame there, um, we're at an area of a side branch, so you don't want to go postulating too much here. And number three is you want to check for optimal stent expansion. As I say, a 90% cutoff uh, is good and if it's not too calcified. So check your distal lumen reference area, compare that to your minimum stent area, and hope that you're over 90%. And you can see you do that for the distal stent and also the proximal end of the stent and deal with any areas of under expansion. I'd just like to present another case, if you don't mind. This is a 69-year-old lady. She's got severe angina, despite three anti-angina agents. Um, she's a positive ETT. Unfortunately, we use a lot of ETT still in Scotland. Um, she had a CT coronary angiogram, which showed a critical proximal LED stenosis. She came to the cath lab, and right enough, she's got a very tight proximal LED. She's got a, a diagonal branch with moderate osteal disease and some moderate disease uh, leading into that. So, as per EBC guidance, I've performed a provisional layered stepwise strategy, a uh, jailed wire technique, and we've placed a, a promisolite 3.5 times 38 millimeter stent in the LED. You can see the LED looks great. However, she's got really sluggish flow in the diagonal branch with uh, Karina shift and possibly some plaque. So we performed a kissing balloon inflation I did a proximal optimization after that, and you can see the final result was quite nice. And actually, this patient went home feeling great. She was discharged the same day. She was asymptomatic for two weeks. She felt so good. She climbed one of the Monroe Mountains in Scotland. These are mountains that are over 3,000 feet. Um, she was on a really steep part of the mountain when she'd got severe chest pain. Um, she had no ECG changes. However, troponin was positive at 99. She came back to the cath lab. And to my horror, you can see what's happened within the, the, the diagonal branch. She's got dissection. So I took a scion wire. Wire seemed to pass extremely easily into the diagonal. However, I passed an Ivis catheter just to be sure it was in the right place. And you can see clearly we're not in the right place. We're out with the, the vessel margins. And we've got lots of hematoma uh, around this vessel as well. Um, I'd like to think it was my excellent wiring skills or just a fluke, we managed to rewire into the, into the true lumen um, and uh, right from the, the LED stent, uh, we performed some balloon dilation. And we didn't take any further pictures, obviously, to propagate the dissection, but she, she did very well after that and had no further problems. I'd just like to highlight two superiority trials which are currently being random or recruited to um, optimal left mains, currently recruiting. This has been performed in the UK, Italy and Spain. Uh, hoping to randomize 800 patients with left main stem disease to either IVIS guidance uh, or angio-guided PCI. Another study is the IVIS CHIP study. This is in seven uh, European countries, including the UK and Spain, um, hoping to randomize 2,000 patients um, who have got CHIP or who, have, who are, are waiting on a CHIP procedure, um, be it angiographic heavy calcification, osteo lesions, true bifurcations, left main disease, CTO, instant restenosis, 
uh, or long lesions, or any PCI where you require mechanical circulatory support. So two exciting trials to look out for in the future. So in conclusion, good evidence uh, exists for the use of IVIS during PCI, including bifurcations. Using a simple stepwise framework ensures consistency and will help us achieve good outcomes. And we have further studies in the use of IVIS and left main chip cases, including bifurcations, are currently recruiting. I couldn't come to Spain without showing you a picture of my childhood hero, Severiano Ballesteros. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Stuart. Particularly grateful because I am from the same town that Seve. Dan, this is good for us. Yeah, from Santander, yeah. Great talk. I think it's uh, my reflection, my thought is that we have the evidences, but we still see figures in the penetration of imaging in the cab labs, and we still see very low penetration. Do you think that this is straightforward, really uh, easy to handle protocols, checklists like the Essentials 1, 2, 3, will help to, for people being more uh, prone to use uh, IVIS guidance in, in the complex, particularly the complex procedures that we are doing more and more lead main, more and more CTOs, more and more bifurcations? I think anything that simplifies any procedure is going to be a good thing and is going to increase the adoption of that. Um, certainly, it's not going to be a hindrance to it, that's for sure. Um, obviously, there are people who will use IVIS all the time and there are big IVIS users and will continue to use it. But I think for people who don't use IVIS so much, I think it's going to be a good thing and will increase adoption. Mm -hmm. you think, Yolanda, what's your opinion about the implementation of imaging in, in, the, in the mindset of the people when he's doing a procedure like a bifurcation or lead main, to have in mind I have to do ABUS in this way, pre, pause, uh, and finally a checklist to optimize because I think the good results that we see with imaging is not just because we use, we put the probe in within the artery, it's because we do something with the imaging. We turn out the imaging to be actionable. No? We, we take decisions based on the imaging, not just put the catheter and it's magic. So I, I am a big fan of imaging, honestly, especially for calcium and for the left main too. But I think we have always a time pressure in the cat lab. So we have a list of patients and there are acute patients coming in. So I think that's the challenge to stratify our patients and choose the right one for the imaging. Or we believe we can help them most. Because if we would have the time to image each patient and the cat lab staff and doctors are really trained in that. Because we know if in, in cat labs when we are using a lot of imaging, it's my, sometimes only 10 minutes extra. But it's not the case for all cat labs. Certainly where we work as well, there's a lot of fiscal responsibility. You know, Ivis and all these imaging techniques are, are expensive and you know, we are, we're constantly reminded how much we spend in the cath lab. So. Um, uh, it'd be nice to be able to do it in everyone, however, we can't always do that. Yeah. The money we spend in the cath, in the IBUS catheter, is uh, safe and is compensated by the money we save uh, with the patients coming less, with less restenosis, less thrombosis. No, that's clear. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to give you the, the, the mic and, uh, and the boys to, to give the next talk about calcification, which is breaking the calcified ceiling. And uh, Yolanda? Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to share with you a strong evidence that calcium matters. My conflict of interest. We know it, and we know it for years, that coronary calcium is a huge challenge in the cat lab. It limits the stent expansion, and of course, uh, increases the probability for stent failure and for adverse events. And it's what's really important, calcium in coronary arteries is really present. So we know that independence of the modality we are using, um, if we are just using um, coronary angiography, we would say any calcium is present in 40% of lesions. When we are using IVOS, it's even like 80% and OCT like 77%. So this is really a huge clinical challenge for us. And um, we know, and there is plenty of data showing that 
coronary calcium is associated with a worse clinical outcome. I could show you so many trials and studies and registry, but I will show you just one, but have a closer look on that. So patients who have a calcium um, moderate or severe, they have an increase in the uh, cardiac death, still not significant, but you can see here in percentages, but have a closer look on myocardial infarction. Patients with severe calcium have a rate of myocardial infarction of 13% during the follow-up as compared to those with moderate calcium. Target vessel revascularization increases too, and especially the maze rate, 24, 24%. So those are really, really sick patients and of course, coronary calcium very negatively impacts outcome. We know from our experience and all the data published that calcium is associated with suboptimal stenting. So there are many, many obstacles and challenges for us in the CAT lab. So we know we have to pre-dilate. So like lesion preparation is the absolute key. And with the patient has a calcium, and it, of course, increases with the calcium severity. So we have very often dissections uh, during the predilatation, um, which actually we are, we are, that's the aim to achieve such a dissection, like a lesion for the lesion preparation. But they are, of course, sometimes associated with complications. Uh, in many cases, we have incomplete uh, predilatation during the PCI, inadequate stent expansion, um, uh, challenges during the stent delivery, so we need um, guiding extension catheters, stent malapposition, malexpansion, and of course, post-PCI, if there's a huge amount of calcium, uh, we have an insufficient drug um, penetration. So um, the aim by t for, for treating patients with, with calcium, especially those with moderate and severe, it's to identify calcium and to modify calcium. So we have two huge aims. Um, as we have heard in the talk, so we have to um, identify calcium. We can do it, of course, using angiography, but it's not the best method. Of course, the severe calcium is visible. But for moderate um, calcium, in many cases, uh, we know that angiography is very often misleading, so we need coronary imaging. And I can tell you my old nightmares and complications I saw in, 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 in the cat lab and I had in the cat lab were always in patients with coronary calcifications. So um, we have to, um, we have to uh, understand imaging and um, recognize type of calcium, whether it's thin, whether it's thick, whether it's superficial, whether it's deep, uh, the length uh, and, um, and uh, the grade of calcium, because there are, you know, there are so many algorithms um, we can use in the clinical practice uh, to choose the strategy, the plaque, mode, plaque modification strategy. So, um, but I will show you um, one which was proposed, so if we have an uncrossable lesion that's very, very clear, we need um, a terectomy device like um, ROTA. And if the region is crossable, um, I always use imaging because for me it's really important uh, to know, you know how the, the calcium arc is um, more than 180 or less, the thickness and the length, so we have this um, rule of 50% uh, arc and 0.5 millimeter um, thickness and 5 millimeter length. So if we have all three criteria, we can try using um, balloons um, like scoring, cutting or uh, non-compliant balloons. And if, if all three criteria are met, some studies implicate even 20, uh, 270 degrees. Uh, we should go uh, in the direction of a terectomy for the plaque modification for nodular calcium steel. Um, um, there are you know, different um, approaches like shockwave, but also ROTA um, has been shown to, be, to, to show promising um, 
promising results. So the more severe the calcium, the more um, uh, uh, we, some say aggressive strategy uh, has to be chosen. So we have so much data with ROTA. I will just show you some of them. What's the good information that um, for each registry which are published, I will show you now here this, the SCAR registry is that um, we are using ROTA um, more frequently. So like 2005, 0.5%, 2016, 1.2%. Uh, we are using ROTA more via transradial access um, with intravascular imaging, of course, with drug eluting stents. We are using ROTA in high-risk patients, in older patients, in patients with uh, renal insufficiency. And um, although the patients are older and much sicker, we have better outcome. Of course, this is the sum of, of better uh, drug eluting stands and imaging and so on, but we are doing better. So um, what's really important, and we are talking about timing and time pressure in the cat lab, if we decide based on the angio, or maybe also imaging too, that uh, we, are, uh, we will use ROTA instead of predilatation with or another techniques, you are, uh, you, you, um, will need um, less pride dilatation balloons and have a look on those three figures here. So you are saving time, 20 minutes per procedure each. Procedure time, fluoroscopy time, and even a contrast volume too. So we are doing better with an early decision. And um, I will show you one of the big trials, the prepare calc trial, in numbers, but I think really important for us. This study compared uh, via a randomized design, rotational atherectomy via modified, modifying the calcific lesion with balloons like scoring and cutting. Um, and uh, the authors looked uh, at the angiographic and clinical follow-up at uh, nine months with a primary endpoint of strategy success successful stent delivery and expansion with less than 20% instant uh, risk stenosis. And um, as you can see, using rotational atherectomy, the duration was somehow longer as compared to balloons only, uh, fluoroscopy time and contrast uh, used in this study. Um, but uh, have a look on site branch compromise, less Still, with these numbers, statistically not significant, but there is a trend for that. Um, and um, this is the final result. So the study was positive. Um, so you can see here that patients uh, who were randomized to rotational atherectomy had a like, strategy success from 98% versus 81% using balloon only. And importantly, there was a 16% crossover rate for non-crossable non lesions or, or um, problems with stent deli delivery. So and another um, option, and this is something we are still and very often discussing, and I think it's also a challenge for me, whether we should try and at which point, or maybe we'll discuss this, still a cutting balloon. And this study published and uh, presented at TCT this year was investigating the cutting balloon, but not using uh, you know, the lower um, uh, pressures, but higher pressures, like with, um, with non-compliant balloons. Also in a randomized design, it was the COPS uh, trial, 50% in the cutting balloon or non-compliant balloon in patients with severe lesions, um, severe calcified lesions at IVUS. And this study showed um, that um, using, non, uh, using cutting balloons with higher pressure on average 18 atmospheres was um, better. As you can see here, the primary endpoint was uh, MSA at calcium site and also for um, some other parameters, also the cutting balloon at a higher atmosphere was better than um, a non-compliant balloon. But importantly, this difference was statistically significant 
um, if the calcium arc was um, larger than 270 um, degrees. And this is my last slide, and I think uh, my very personal information, we should not forget about um, uh, treatment of those patients after, you know, after the cat lab, and um, we tend to think that this is a, if a patient has a calcified lesion, so it's a complex lesion, we are prescribing that strong and long. I can tell you one, I'll, I calculate the bleeding risk score, the high bleeding risk by, recommended by the European Society of Cardiology in each patient before the procedure, especially for calcium. And I can tell you all those patients have somehow renal failure and all of those patients are uh, older and are at high bleeding risk according to the score. And this influences my decisions in the cat lab and also the duration of DAPT. And according to the twilight trial, and this, uh, there's very similar publication for master DAPT trial, this is if the patient is complex and has a calcific lesions, we should, and has a high bleeding risk, we should shorten the duct. That's so important patients. At high complex, uh, with high, com lesion, high complex lesions and calcium, as you can see here, they do very much benefit for short duct and then switching to ticagrelor in the twilight trial or in the master duct. Um, as you can see, much less bleeding during the follow-up, no more maze events, and there is even some, um, uh, some um, direction um, for, for uh, death, and also no more stent thrombosis. So this is my final message, not only calcium, but also the doubt after the procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yolanda, very clear and convincing. As, uh, calcium is a bad thing, not only for the, for, is a threat for angiographic results, but it's a threat for the patients, no? for the outcomes. And we have uh, imaging, we have IVUS to identify calcium, to categorize calcification, and we have tools to have shown nicely how rotablation, rotational ablation, and cutting balloon may help in the management of these lesions and really improve the results compared to other more conventional technology. Any comments, uh, Stuart, regarding this topic of classification, imaging, and these tools? Yeah, it's a big issue, isn't it? And uh, our patients are getting older and older, and almost everybody these days that you take to the cath lab has a degree of calcification. I think we're quite lucky to be working in an era when we have so many different tools which we're able to use to, uh, to, to modify calcification. As a Patrick, you want to comment? Yeah, yeah just a question. Just for the sake of uh, correctness, don't forget that global leaders, 16,000 patients before twilight and before stop up, uh, published the result of complex uh, PCI with ticagrelor and aspirin one month, and that was significant because there were more patients. Thank yeah. you for your comments. How many patients uh, were treated with rota in the... I, I was just asking Yoshi, you know, there have been uh, 48 papers on global leaders, but to be, uh, I have to confess that I don't remember, but I look that tonight. Eh? We will look to I, yeah. I'm really interested in that, and I will tell you why, because um, there are six criteria in the, in, in the majority of papers, who is a complex, what is what's a complex procedure. In some of those papers, classific lesion and use of rota was a criterion, and in some was not. So I think that that's important, whether we believe that using, that just calcified lesions are complex lesions. But thank you for pointing on that. I think we are I, still... I, yeah, I know. realize it's a, it's a Boston Scientific Symposium, but do you know something about uh, Orbital? I mean, I, I just saw today that uh, they have a new CEO called Fitzgerald, Imagine Fitzgerald the Great. Fitzgerald is now the CEO of uh, CSI uh, with the Orbital. Any, any information about Orbital? Any data that you have seen? You mean in... Decalcification? Yes, of course. There are some even comparisons between uh, Rota and Orbital atherectomy, but all are small studies focusing yeah. more on restenosis and MSA and I'm not aware of a study which would really compare clinical outcome yet. Right, and it, it's quite extraordinary that uh, uh, 
in the year 2000, okay, at the Grunzig lecture, I was presenting the orbital as the future, and you see you are 22 years later, and it's not yet seriously in practice. That's interventional cardiology. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Thank you, Patrick. We are definitely out of time, but we have maybe time for one last question or comment from the audience, just before closing, because we are five minutes late. Late? No? Okay. Oh, yes, over there. Great, Ada. Congratulations again. I would like you to briefly comment on the concept of complementarity with, of course, it's, I understand it's a Boston symposium, with uh, the IVL and the, com uh, the concept of rotathripsy, opening the way and then optimizing it, uh, which, are, which is, uh, in my mind, because of practice cases like that, it's not mutually exclusive, but it's rather complementary. Absolutely, I see it as, as, as uh, you. There are many patients having deep and superficial calcium. So in many patients, we need this combination. Absolutely, a rotacard, and there are many different strategies. So I think it's a case-to-case -case basis. On, we have to decide this. And, and sometimes we can't plan the procedure, something which is developing. So calcium, is, I think, it's so challenging. We have to be prepared for that. If there is a wave path or some guideline or some brief outline of how to perceive to proceed in cases like that, of course I, I know we don't have time, but if there is something because okay IVL is a fairly recent thing, and uh, whether it finds its way according to some guideline from experts like you. I, I know only case reports or, mm. or case series, but I'm not aware about the position paper on that. Okay. I think it's just really the case that you know, the IVL balloon is quite bulky and often you can't get it down these, uh, these heavily calcified vessels. So we call it rotor shock at home and we've done quite a few of these cases where you have to bore out a channel using a rotor pro um, and then to be able to deliver exactly. um, the IVL balloon. So we, we've done quite a few cases using that. But the fact that the, because I've done two or three ma myself, the thing is uh, it's another thing opening the way with 1.25, 1.5, but then really having to optimize in something like an RCA of 4, 4.5, you really don't want to leave any waste behind. Yeah, yeah these are case. Yep. Julio? Very happy to have you and Stuart on the podium because uh, as everybody, you experimented for sure that the more we wanted to see the calcium, the more you are in trouble with the calcification because uh, the catheters were mainly developed uh, to get uh, high quality imaging. And there was not enough attention to the fact uh, that uh, we needed to deliver first. Now there is a new attention to this aspect, the technical aspect uh, to get into the lesion. And uh, that is something that is very important and uh, they needed to be pushed away with uh, possibly a new solution to try not to have uh, in the bandy segment, calcified segment, the catheter stuck, the catheter loop. And uh, yesterday we were dealing with a life case from Milan and we were stuck with a new high profile catheter. And we can experiment the same with the OCT with any type of catheter. So it's a really a call for the importance uh, of the deliverability, resistant to the fatigue. Yolanda was mentioning how many times we wanted to explore the calcium before, during, at the end uh, to make measurements. It means that the catheter needed to, to be at a different uh, level. We needed to increase the bar of the technical characteristics. Absolutely, Julia. The worst thing is not to get the image, you know, it's just to be unable to cross and there is a lot of investment in technology to get good imaging, but sometimes the hypertube, the catheters are the same for years, the crossability is not improved, and uh, calcification many times is associated to tortuosity, to distal position, and uh, we need catheters that, uh, the same that we have delivery for a stand that has improved a lot, we need, uh, this is a call to the companies to, uh, to work on the, in the, on the more simplistic part of the catheter, it's not so simplistic, but it's much more simple 
simplistic than the technology of imaging of the software, then Julia is a well uh, broad topic. We are really late, sorry, we have to finish. Uh, thank you much for your attention and to Boston for the support. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we are not too late, but I hope that you are not too tired, because now we have a good session, a case session, and uh, at the end you will have to vote. So I think on this uh, screen you, uh, you can see how to connect to the voting system. We'll have uh, five cases which were selected by the board, among more than 100 cases which were submitted to uh, to the ABC uh, board. So uh, we have a very good panel and uh, we'll start with the first case. We have also uh, Georges Dongas who is uh, connected I think and Talid Jmawal who is connected too. So let's start with the first case by Dr. Uh, Christos Bourantas. OCT guided wiring of the diagonal branch obstructed by an ulcerated plaque. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be there, here and thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me to this interesting meeting. Uh, it's the first time attending and I really enjoy it. So, uh, the stage has already been set by the previous session and uh, in this case, I'm going to uh, underscore the value of intravascular imaging in uh, guiding revascularization. This has already been discussed, but I think that sometimes by having intravascular imaging data, you can become innovative and totally change your practice and your planning of uh, challenging procedures. So let's go to the case. We have a 65 years old patient who used to be also a professor in my university. He has a history of hypercholesterolemia. He was on a trip in Turkey and then he had an acute coronary syndrome. He went to the hospital, he was offered an angiogram, but he declined. He's coming back to the UK with increasing angina symptoms on minimum exertion, and he has been referred by his GP to the rapid access chest pain clinic because of this. The symptoms were typical, there was a history of MI, he was listed for a coronary angiogram. The ECG was unremarkable. He had an angiogram without having an echo. And uh, this is his angiogram. You can appreciate that the right is unobstructed. It looks normal. The same with the left main stem and the circumflex. Uh, however, there is some haziness in the proximal LAD. And this becomes more obvious in the next uh, view where you can see there is a lesion proximally to the diagonal and there is also a tight stenosis in the first diagonal. The LV gram showed a good LV function. Uh, he was discussed the patient in RMDT and he was decided to be referred for percutaneous coronary intervention as he had single vessel disease. Uh, when he came to the lab, he had optical coherence tomography imaging. Uh, you can appreciate also in this uh, geographic projection that the wiring of the diagonal is challenging because of this uh, protruded plaque. There was no significant disease in the proximal, uh, in the distal LAD, neither in the proximal. However, there was a tight stenosis uh, proximally to the diagonal. See the images in more detail. So you can appreciate the origin of the septal here. There's a disease-free segment coming to the 
diagonal or orifice, you can see that it's coming at an angle, and the next frame, there is a plaque that protrudes, making wire of this vessel challenging. Coming more proximally, there is a significant stenosis of the uh, LAD, and then you can see there is an ulcerated plaque, double lumen and ulcerated plaque. Probably this patient had a plaque rupture. That resulted uh, in acute coronary syndrome, and since the end, he has typical angina. Coming more proximally, you can see a disease free vessel. I don't know whether we should stop here for discussion or should I move on with the planning? Okay then. So, this is again a 3D reconstruction um, showing exactly the, same, the challenges in the wiring of that lesion. To wire this diagonal, there are some uh, techniques that has been nicely summarized in the paper of Burzota. Uh, I think he's here for Jesco somewhere. So one of them is predilatation of this in the lady and then try to wire the diagonal. Having the OCT data, somebody can understand that this is not possible because if you dilate the lady, the most li likely that you are going to have is uh, uh, block the diagonal and lose the vessel. So this is not an option in this case. The other that you can do is to, to create a bend, take down the wire, pull the wire and try to wire the diagonal. However, this was not possible in this occasion because there is significant stenosis proximal to the lady, and then you cannot take a loop, the wire in a loop, and try to wire the diagonal. In addition to that, the diagonal is coming at an angle. I'm not sure how easy it would have been to manipulate your wire and try to get to the diagonal. Dual lumen catheters is another alternative. Fine duo is one of them. The problem with these catheters is that, that the bend of the angle at which the secondary wire is coming is very narrow, usually 30, 45 degrees. In this occasion, you will not be able to, to you need a larger angle to get to the diagonal and therefore have been impossible to use this technology successfully to manage to wire the diagonal. And the third option is angulated microcatheters. And uh, I, I believe that was the most realistic approach here. Uh, there are different angulated microcatheter, microcatheters. One is the venture microcatheter. However, the major microcatheter gives you a maximum angle of 90 degrees. And in addition to that, the distance tip to bend is 4 millimeters. Having the OCT data, it is apparent that you cannot use this device because the maximum diameter that we have is 3 millimeters. So the most likely is to traumatize the vessel and has a complication. So, and we end up with a super cross angulated microcatheter. This has significant advantages. The distance tip to bend is 3.5 millimeters, so it's shorter. In addition to that, it gives you a maximum angle of 120 degrees, and that makes wiring of the diagonal probably easier. So the first thing that I did, I tried to take the angulated microcatheter distally to the, to the lesion, and I tried to, in a way, retrograde, go to the diagonal. That was not uh, possible. Uh, I, my wire always prolapsing to the proximal LAD. Uh, so then what I did, I pulled back the angulated microcatheter to the origin of the diagonal. I managed to twist it towards the right direction with a pile of 50 hydrophilic, hydrophilic wire. The wiring of the easy. So the procedure then became much, much easier. We have a typical bifurcation lesion, uh, Medina 101. Uh, I decided, of course, to uh, secure first the diagonal, which was the most uh, difficult vessel to wire. And I uh, move on to decay crash, implanting a 275 by 18 Zion stand to the diagonal and using of OCT, uh, the OCT imaging data that I had, I put a 3 by 18 Zion stand uh, to the lady, end up the procedure with a kissing with a 3 and a 275 NC balloons. Uh, it was not necessary to do pot in this case based on the OCT images that I have, and this is the final results. So, uh, summarizing, this case underscored the value of optical coherence tomography and kinding. PCI in challenging lesions. And I believe that whenever we have ambiguity, we need to use uh, intravascular imaging, in particular optical coherence tomography, because you can see details using OCT that you cannot see with IVUS. It was important not only to understand how the, how the, the origin of the diagonal, but also deciding what device to use by taking um, into account the information related to the lumen dimensions. And uh, I believe that uh, 
it has to be intravascular imaging has to be used in every case. We have a lot of data now showing that there is a 45 percent reduction in maize, which is much much higher from what we're getting by using statins to our patients. However, especially in complex cases, this is a must. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Borontas, for this excellent case. Oh, it is open for discussion. I just start with a question about the device. So everybody has this device available in uh, the CAS lab? Not everybody, OK. And in the room? Nearly everybody, OK. I think it's very important because you made the point that this, this device is very useful in p particular cases like, uh, like this one. So, yeah. The problem with this device is once the wire goes in, it tends to get straightened. It is um, a a slightly bit. difficult, actually. So, um, it helps, of course. Once you, your wire goes in, it tends to become straight. Yeah, there is another problem as well. You cannot use this device many times because the band, after you pushing in and out all the time, it's getting more straight. So there is a, you can do it three, four times, five times, but then you need to use a second, another one. Uh, it, the fact that it's getting state is not, is not a problem. You can change your wire, take out the device, you have a gel wire, and then you can move on with your procedure as long as after wiring it. But the problem is that I had to use two devices in this occasion because uh, after a point I lost the bend. Uh, compliments for the case because uh, I think in the practice, if you don't have all the devices and you start to do such a good imaging, it's a completely wrong thing. I mean, OCTs planned your strategy and you choose the right device. If you don't have this right device, you're going in a trouble to implement for the case. Yeah, adding to that, this procedure was done a few years ago when we used to do routine angiography before taking the patient for PCI. So I was prepared. Uh, and I, I had all the microcatheters in my disposal, and that makes things e easier. Yes. Of course, this uh, very complex lesion needed to be, uh, let's say, wired for uh, a side branch and main, main, main vessel. That was crucial. But uh, looking at the NGO, I would say that that was a calcific nodule. Yes? Am I right or not? No. It was OCT. That was, I thought OCT was very helpful. So what actually has happened, there was an ulcerated plaque Proximal well, who can uh, present it because I'm pretty sure that in majority of of of, of, uh, of cases it would be diagnosed as a, as a calcific nodule and in case of uh, lack of um, successful wiring somebody could use for example uh, the bulking techniques to decrease the 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 the, 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 the volume of of, of this uh, uh, structure so this OCT imaging was crucial just to indeed 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 yes. So a couple of things here, your wiring depends on the characters of the plaque, number one. If you have a soft plaque, you have to be very gentle. If you have a hard plaque, you can be a little more adventurous. Secondly, with these lesions, you can't torque, because there's no space to torque. So you have to give a very fine curve to the wire. In such lesions, we have done with an XT wire, with XT wire got a thinner tip, and you can give a real short curve, just go in, very, be very gentle. The moment it goes, it just goes in. So I think these are a few points that we have done these cases in the yeah, past, the, the, but without, without imaging, of course, because... Yeah, the tip of the wire is important. You, yes. need, you, you have, to, in this occasion, if I remember well, I make two bends, one to get to the diagonal and one to, to negotiate Absolutely. from the... To, uh, the, the, the and you may... The, the, the angulation the, that I had. The 1-4 yes. wire may not go in here. So you may need an XT or a thinner wire. Where a a filter is a nice wire. I would, say I would use Pilot 50, hydrophilic wire in this occasion, but filter is a very good alternative indeed. Thank you. Yeah, we have another comment in the room. Yeah, uh, another, another thing that you can do if you don't have all these type of microcatheter, whatever, is to put a 3.0 balloon no compliant to four atmosphere distal to the uh, diagonal branch and to go with a polymeric uh, 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 wire. If you don't have, in Latin America, I, I'm from Argentina, I don't have du uh, dual lumen catheter, I don't have super cross. But I, you should. I have to do different things. Yeah. So, in a way, I did it with the super cross. So I managed to go in a way at a great retrograde, which is the way that the balloon is working. It didn't work in this occasion. And there are another things that you can do. You, you can put a uh, fine cross, for example, and you can modify the, the angle with hot. So 
you put in the GATLAB, you modify, and you, and you have a 120 division. I do. So, so I think there are different things. That was excellent example why to use the OCT before uh, the procedure, uh, when the procedure starts and not the, uh, after we have a complication. So I think that is uh, excellent to show. But my question is, uh, why Pilot 50? Because it's very bulky wire and wire, do I mean, it's, th that one. It's, it's a hydrophilic wire, and as it's it's very usually it's, fi it's fine its way. It's a hydrophilic wire. Usually it's fine its way, especially in tortuose, a tortuous anatomy. It's a, it's a wire I'm usually uh, use with the filter. Uh, in a, a case like this, so, and it so worked. One short technical point is that you cannot use it with a six French guide. If you want to do a trapping balloon to block the, the wire, it's not, it's not possible. So you need to work with seven French. I, I have done it with six this one, but you have to, to be very... But you were lucky because uh, usually yeah. it no, it's not working. I, I have done it with... It depends on the cutter as well that you have. In some, some of them have bigger lumens. I, I think I have done it with six. Okay. Uh, so let's... Thank you very much. It was really a great case. So let's move to the, the next uh, case by Dr. Nicolo Chiardetti. Uh, a stent lost in left main bifurcation, an usual case of OCT guided mini crush. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for an introduction. I'm Nicola Cerdetti, a fellow in training in interventional cardiology at Careggi University Hospital uh, with Professor Di Mario's team. And uh, it is a pleasure to be here to present you uh, this unusual case of OCT guided mini crash to cover a stent loss in left main bifurcation. Uh, the patient is a 75 years old male, hypertensive and obese, uh, that was admitted to another hospital uh, in February for infralateral ST elevation myocardial infarction. And um, this is the angiography performed in the uh, other uh, hospital. Uh, and uh, the colleagues uh, was unable to cannulate the RCA and on the basis of the ACG they uh, thought that the, the lesion in the mid uh, circumflex was the, the uh, culprit lesion. So uh, they uh, decided to uh, delay the, the uh, lesion in the circ and then to advance the stent in the circ but the procedure was complicated by the entrapment of the stent in the distal left main and the proximal circ and uh, also with a ping pong technique uh, they was uh, unable to retrieve and also to advance further the stand so uh, they decided to cover uh, the lost stand in the left main with two uh, stands, uh, one more distal, one more proximal, but not in the direction of the circ, but in the direction of the uh, LAD. And uh, this is the first stand and the second stand, and this is the uh, final uh, angiographic result in the uh, in the other hospital. Uh, then they tried also to uh, recannulate the cannulate the RCA from the femoral axis, but uh, they failed also from the femoral axis. Uh, the, uh, in hospitals, stay after the procedure. Sorry. Uh, the in-hospital stay after the procedure uh, was uh, complicated by uh, recurrent episodes of ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, uh, so um, that required ICD implantation, and the patient was discharged then uh, with a severe left ventricular uh, dysfunction. Uh, the patient then was discharged, and uh, in the following months, uh, a new onset of dyspnea occurred, so uh, he uh, arrived to our attention, and we decided to to uh, perform a new coronary angiogram to understand if uh, there was uh, something uh, new in the, in the coronaries. So uh, this is the uh, coronary angiogram we perform at our institution from the right radial with a, a 7 French EBU 3.75 catheter. And uh, as you can see, uh, the, uh, there is also a, a, a osteal stenosis uh, in the left main that is not covered by uh, the stents that they implanted in the pre previous procedure. And um, we decided to uh, 
uh, understand if the uh, stent lost in the left main uh, was completely covered uh, using an intravascular imaging, and in particular, we decided to use OCT. But before to advance the OCT catheter, uh, we decided to perform a kissing in the uh, and the first obtuse marginal branch to facilitate the advancement of the catheter. So, this is the OCT evaluation. Uh, the uh, left main, the, the proximal left main, had a MLA of 6.18 millimeters square. And uh, in the distal left main, the uh, lost stent was not covered by uh, the, the stents. And, of course, in the CERC, uh, the stent is not covered because the, uh, they decided to stent it in the direction of the LAD. And uh, also, the ostium of the obtuse marginal branch uh, was diseased. So, uh, on the basis of the OCT uh, sizing, uh, we decided to uh, perform a uh, um, two stands uh, the technique, in particular a mini crush technique, and we decided to use a mini crush technique uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first was uh, that uh, we decided to cover uh, both the uh, proximal circ, the distal circ, and also the uh, first obtuse marginal branch ostium, so uh, the, uh, it was uh, uh, critical to use a two stent techniques, and we decided to use the mini crush over to the other uh, two stent techniques because uh, we uh, decided to uh, avoid uh, uh, two different rewiring that is in, in need, of course, in the in the DK classical DK crush technique. So we implanted first the uh, stent in the obtuse marginal branch, a 2.75 by 12 millimeter everolimal solutin stent, and then crushed uh, with a, a trio uh, non-compliant balloon. And then uh, this is the angio after the uh, implant, stent implantation in the obtuse marginal and uh, crush, and then we uh, implanted the stent in the in the circa 3 or, uh, by uh, 23 uh, millimeter everolimo saluting stand. Uh, then, after rewiring, we uh, performed uh, kissing with two um, and non compliant balloons that uh, was a conqueror non compliant balloons. They are a special balloon that has have a, a spheric tip uh, that aims to um, avoid the uplift of the proximal thrust of the stents when uh, they are advanced inside the stents. Uh, then we decided also to treat the uh, osteal left main because uh, the patient was uh, obese is, uh, and we, we thought that 6.18 uh, millimeters square uh, MLA was uh, critical for this patient. So we uh, decided to implant a zeotarolimus saluting stent 4.5 at the ostium of the stent. And this is the uh, final OCT evaluation that uh, uh, show an uh, absence of distal uh, edge dissection and a uh, good expansion of the stents uh, in the circ and in the uh, left main, and also a complete coverage of the uh, stand, lost stent in the circ and also in the left main. And this is the final angiographic result. After three days, after three days, uh, we decided also to treat uh, the uh, RCA CTO, and uh, this is the, the, the result of also of the uh, recanalization of the CTO. So in conclusion, uh, intravascular imaging with OCT was critical for precisely locating the lost stent, uh, guiding the optimal stenting technique for the bifurcation and for balloon and stent sizing, and uh, a two-stent technique was imperative to treat the bifurcation that was uh, uh, Medina 111, and to be able to cover the lost stent and to cover the obtuse marginal uh, diseased ostium. And we chose the mini crush over the other two stent techniques, in particular the DK crush, to avoid the risk of erroneous repeated rewiring within the cells of the lost stent. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Cargetti. Any comment from the panel? So first, first uh, congratulations for uh, excellent case. Uh, this is uh, this case should be used as for teaching the, the people how to 
solve the problems, uh, let's say, produced in the first uh, not well experienced lab because they performed a lot of uh, a, a lot of problems. Um, I guess that uh, that OCT especially much better in this case, uh, despite the left main uh, it, it, over the let's say the, the sup with superiority or over the uh, uh, IVUS. I know that Carlo Di Mario, the, the master of IVUS, also loves uh, uh, OCT, and I see that in this case this is crucial to to understand the mechanisms and to find the the, the, the proper. Uh, uh, let's say salvation of the of the of the, of the, of the trouble for, for the patient. So, congratulations. The, my, my, only my one question is: the the imaging was used during the first case or not? The f imaging or CT or IVUS was used for first uh, for first case for this? No. No. That was not used. No. The, and. Additionally, the, the, the distal of the first stand was dilated or not? Because this is also a very crucial point. It's normally I would I would redilate as maximal as possible the, the, the distal portion of the stand and crush the proximal one just to give the more opportunity to, 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 to rewire the circumflex artery later on. So that was done like that or not? During the acute the acute phase, no. The other hospital. Oh, so they, that they that was that was a mistake. Stand. That was a mistake. Yeah. So so can can you explain <coughs> why they <coughs> decide to um, to crush the lost stent in the circ by putting a stent in the LED? That was too small. It's very strange. I don't know why they decided to to to. <coughs> to Maybe the size. Maybe yeah. the size. That yeah. was a two point five something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so try to, to, to use 2.5 in, in a left main. No, it's probably. So, uh, comments from the, from the floor, yes. <coughs> Whenever you have a lost stent in the left main circumflex, one of the relatively elegant ways to put a guide wire in the circumflex, take a guide liner down and get the stent across the circumflex and pull out the guide liner. That way, there is no chance of the newer stent getting entangled with the previous stent. And you can deploy it, provided the diameters are favorable, the circumflex and the left main. And this, is, this is the way I have done one case when the stent was lost in the left main LED, uh, left main and circumflex. And actually, the stent got along and it was floating into the aorta. So we put a guide liner and then put the stent. That is one way to uh, treat such yeah. an uh, yeah, I think there is many ways to solve this kind of uh, problem. But uh, it, for me, it's always strange to see that uh, the stand was lost and there is no wire yeah, yeah, in the they, stand. They because the stand if you have a wire in the stand, you have always a solution to remove the stand. And ma in many cases, you see the, <coughs> the wire is out and the stand is still here. So I don't know. This is very strange to me. <coughs> okay, so if there is no more commands... We move to the to the next one. Thank you very much. So again, you have uh, to vote. You have to go to slidedo.com and EBC 2022. So next case will be uh, presented by Quentin de Emptin. Uh, treatment of a calcified CTO bifurcation lesion. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this case uh, we performed with my colleague, uh, Panagiotis Kzaplantaris. Uh, so the, the, the case presentation, it was a 59 years old uh, male with a smoking history. His history began in May two t uh, 2019 with an inferior STEMI. So the patient was admitted uh, and uh, a primary PCI of the RCA was performed. The patient was included in a study, in, in a study we were performing uh, back then, uh, best max study. It was evaluating uh, the implantation of resorbable magnesium scaffold uh, magmaris in STEMI, and subsequently uh, a CTO of the LAD was diagnosed. Uh, so the patient underwent a CMR that showed viability of the entire wall, and uh, we decided to start uh, medical therapy for LV dysfunction and reassess the angiogram uh, later. 
So this is the angiogram three months after the primary PCI of the uh, RCA. So we can see that the result of the, the resolvable magnesium scaffold in the RCA is, uh, is acceptable and uh, we can observe a short uh, mid-LAD uh, CTO uh, with a uh, bifurcation with a large diagonal branch. So after discussion with the, the patient and uh, together with the team, we decided to proceed with uh, an attempt to uh, treat the CTO lesion as the patient needed to stay uh, under the APT. So this is the double injection. So as you can see, the, the, the occlusion seems to be quite short. So we decided to start with uh, an anti-grade wire escalation. Um, so the, the, the first image shows the, the passage of uh, a Gaia second in the subintimal space in the mid LAD. Uh, we were able to redirect the, the Gaia wire and re-enter into the true lumen, but we got into the, the first large septal branch. So we decided to uh, try to predilate the lesion with the wire still in place in the in the, the septal branch, but as you can see, we have uh, uh, an incomplete expansion of the predilatation balloon. So uh, at that moment, uh, we we had to uh, to find a solution to uh, get into the true lumen and, uh, in the, of the distal LAD and uh, to uh, try to predilate that lesion uh, better. So we decided to use a dual lumen microcatheter to get uh, access to the to the distal LAD. Uh, so we advanced the dual lumen microcatheter into the the septal branch and with the side port we got access into the distal LAD. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, despite using non-compliant balance uh, with confidence as we were in the, in the true lumen in the LAD, we, we have incomplete expansion both in the LAD and in the diagonal branch. Uh, so at that time, uh, we did not have much option, so rotational atherectomy was not an option as the bifurcation uh, was, uh, the, 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 we didn't want to lose the diagonal branch and uh, we could not jeopardize uh, the, the wire in the diagonal branch. So the only option we had was uh, intravascular lithotripsy. We tried to advance the shockwave. It was a 2.5 shockwave balloon into the LAD, but we could not cross the lesion. So we buried the nose of uh, the, the balloon into the, the proximal, uh, into the, the occlusion of the LAD, and we uh, delivered three cycles. Uh, and then we also tried to cross into the diagonal branch, and the, the balloon could advance, as you can see here and we delivered uh, three cycles uh, of, sh of, sh of waves, but the, the balloon uh, ruptured at, the, at, the, thirst, uh, at the, the third cycle. But uh, it, uh, it ruptured, but uh, I think it, it made its, its job. As you can see, the predilatation balloon into the LAD is now uh, fully open, and then we could proceed with uh, a mini crush technique uh, of the LAD and uh, first diagonal. So we placed the, the first stent into the, the diagonal branch, a 275 uh, stent crushed with the NC trio balloon into the LAD. And then a long 3.0 uh, stent was placed from uh, the, the proximal LAD to the, the mid-distal LAD. Uh, we finished uh, the, the bifurcation with kissing and final pot with a 3.5 uh, non-compliant balloon. So we can see here the final result, which is, which is acceptable. And so, in conclusion, IVL uh, might be a useful tool in uh, calcified bifurcation lesions when you don't want to jeopardize uh, the side branch wire using rotational aterectomy. Um, it allowed uh, to modify uh, CTO, uh, the, CTO, uh, the, the CTO cap, uh, even though the, 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 the shockwave balloon was uh, inserted uh, in the side branch. And uh, the, the, the clinical course was uh, good, but the patient remains with uh, significant heart, heart failure at one year follow-up. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice case. Yes? Um, why didn't you try the scoring balloon like angio scalp, which would have been easier to take in rather than IVL? IVL balloon is bulkier balloon, 
and you have got already having a problem uh, of um, uh, taking any device inside. Why not scoring balloon? That is one. Second is um, this IVL balloon, when they rupture, it produces extensive dissection. And um, sometimes uh, I had one similar rupture, which is a middle lady it went all the way to the left main. So um, because uh, the hangoving uh, the balloon, they may produce a big impact, and uh, it can produce extensive dissection. So um, for the, the scoring balloon, yes, it might have been an option. Um, it was at the beginning of the IVL technology. We were quite enthusiastic with that technology, and we said, OK, maybe it might help. And the NC balloons were uh, not producing any effect despite going to high atmospheres. And so pr uh, probably uh, I think we, 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 we thought that it would not be such a, uh, much more efficient that, uh, than a, a conventional NC balloon. What, what do you mean? by I, uh, atmospheres? Ah, it was uh, 20 atmospheres, I think. We did not... So do you have OPN, balloon? Uh, right, right. You can yeah. go up to... 50. It might have been an option as well, but uh, okay, that was uh, the enthusiasm of the IVL. Uh, oh, but I think IVL was a good, uh, good option. B very good uh, option. All balloons may rupture, uh, even the uh, IVL balloon. Uh, then you went to high pressure uh, with uh, IVL or...? No, normal pressure with the IVL, so... Uh, so normal, is it? 10. Uh, it, it was uh, six to eight uh, atmosphere. Okay, so normally eight it's four. Minutes, yes. uh, it was four, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so we were a bit above probably, yeah. Just no, but it's a cause of rupture of AVL because you, sh you, are, you should go to four and then uh, increase to five after probably. Uh, it was three years ago, so pro uh, I think okay. we, we, we might have... Uh, yes. I, I think uh, they, they post-dilatated uh, the lesion after the shock wave. They sorry? They post-dilatated the lesion after yes. the shock wave. I didn't saw it. Yes, there was an image, yeah, uh, the, the, the balloon opened very well uh, in the LAD for, uh, after the shockwave balloon, yes. yes. Uh, about the scoring balloon, I don't believe in scoring balloon, I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't work, I mean, scoring balloon, <laughs> okay. absolutely. Shockwave, in this case, it's a good solution, but probably, probably, as your shockwave doesn't pass practically inside of the vessel, only the top of the, the proximal part, probably the, 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 the rupture of the balloon, which there is also a technique, a controlled rupture of a small balloon when you cannot dilate it, a vessel, probably the, the, the mechanism of the uh, opening of the vessel was the rupture of the balloon, probably. Might be, so yeah. if the, it probably, could be IVL too. Uh, sometimes you use the balloon. Yeah. So retablation and orbital uh, um, uh, at the rectum, uh, theoretically, uh, uh, helpful. However, they need they they need uh, special wires. Rewiring would be would be a big, big problem. But we used to forget about laser. So uh, Elka, it's uh, in my lab. In such a situation, probably I would try to to use laser. It's, it's a very good tool, but f very few lab are equipped this is with the laser. Problem. Yeah, this yeah, is we don't have it. But it's uh, a very good one. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this excellent case. I think IVL was very innovative solution. We have case reports of IVL in CTO lesions where IVL has been done in a side branch and which helps in crossing balloon in the main branch. And also I think the company is working on an IVL balloon where the emitters are at the edge of the balloon for balloon uncrossable lesions for similar situations. I think the company is working on it where the emitters will be at the distal marker of the balloon yeah, for balloon useful. uncrossable lesions. Would be useful indeed. Okay, so thank you very much for your, this excellent case. And let's move to the next one. Uh, so next one will be presented by Mila Kovacevic. Oh yes, okay. Miniculot technique to treat fenestrated restenosis after ostial LED stenting. Looks very complex. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, dear, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, distinguished chairman, chairwoman, it is my pleasure to be here and uh, I kindly um, Thank to, for the invitation. Yes, this is a complex uh, title, and you can see everything from this title. But so I, I won't repeat it again. Uh, the case report is a 67-year-old male patient with the risk factors hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Uh, the patient was referred for the recognition of mid LAD CTO in 2018. And his echocardiography revealed uh, hypokinesis of the mid and uh, apical segments of the anterior wall with the ejection fraction of 47%. This was his baseline angio. 
And as you can appreciate, there is a stenosis of mid-RCA, small, but there is. And also there is, of course, a CT of mid-LAD, and of course there is osteal circumflex stenosis. So what to do with this patient? At that time, we performed uh, functional analysis, physiologic, physi physiological analysis. So we performed FFR on both RCA and uh, also circumflex. So these first three measurements uh, comes from the RCA, so it wasn't significant. The FFR uh, with adenosine was uh, 0 0.86. And then we performed also FFR on osteal circumflex and the FFR was 0 0.96. So we can speak now about underestimation or overestimation of this um, assessment. However, we proceed with the recognition of uh, mid LAD CTO. Like in previous case, uh, dual lumen injection, anti grade viral escalation technique, uh, crossing with the Gaia second, and of course with the, with the help of a fine cross microcatheter. And then pre dilatation. Implantation of the first drug eluting stent, 3, 3, 0, 24 millimeters. And then second stent, you can see we used 3.524. There was discussion of what to do, whether to go to crossover stenting or just osteal stenting. At this point, as you can see on the second image, the, the pretty stable position of the stent. And uh, according to this estimation of the osteal circumflex, we decided to with osteal stenting, of course, bearing in mind that there, there could be possible a geographical miss uh, for stent to go down or to up in the, in the left main. However, that time, in 2018, we finished as osteal stenting, practically nailing the LAD. And this was the final result. We repeated FFR measurement of left circumflex and the result was 0 0.98. So we finished this point with the procedure. However, to make things more uh, complicated, and uh, probably you, you've been, some of you, uh, at the previous session of the complication, in other room, there was a similar case showed by our colleagues from, from Madrid, I think, so, uh, two and a half years later, the patient was admitted due to the effort angina and positive dobutamine stress echo. And what we can see now, this is his baseline angio. Whether this is progression of circumflex disease or something else and how to proceed. If someone has any comment on this. Yeah, thank you very much. Any comment from the panel? I would say that uh, I would never stand like that uh, LAD without uh, IVUS or, or, or CT imaging because uh, we have to take in, into consideration the uh, surroundings of the, of, of the plaque, the distribution of the plaque into the left main. And then in, in the, during such a, a approach, probably also the orifice of sacroflex should be treated in a one session. Yes, I, I totally agree about, uh, about intravascular assessment. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I also agree about the uh, uh, imaging at this stage, and uh, because we know that plaque uh, in 90% uh, uh, progressed to the left main. That's why yes. it's maybe not a good option to put a stand like, uh, like you did. Yes, yes, of course. According to the IVA study, it's less than 10% uh, isolated Medina Zero one zero and less than twenty zero zero one. So yes, it is obvious. But eventually, this uh, th this case, I think it was done uh, like uh, live in a box session, and all the audience uh, concluded to to finish as osteal standing. Now we know that this was wrong, of course. I think we have a good comment from uh, Yves Louvain. I know exactly what you will say. So <laughs> if it's a good comment, but. Uh, yeah, it's very difficult to stand uh, an ostium of LED, uh, and, uh, worse than the ostium of uh, circumflex. I think uh, in Massy we, we did that for in the past, a long, long time ago we did that, but uh, after that we learned that we have, it's bet much better to do a crossover stunting and to do a, a pot and to kiss with the side bench. So 
Yeah, I, I, that was that was a mistake because here, here you probably have you will see with imaging maybe probably have a strut coming from LED in yes. front of the sock. Of course. So it's as you said, it's exactly the same case as we have seen yes. today. Uh, so it's but a typical case of bifurcation refusal. You create an area of low shear stress uh, at this level and you promote atherosclerosis in the circ or sometimes in the left man. So I think it's a really typical case, and we have seen that in the past many times, but uh, now it's becoming rare because we learned. Yes, yes, so, of course. But th now the problem is how to treat it. Yes, <laughs> and that this was two and a half years later, not like in a previous case, when you can solve it by simple kissing and a uh, uh, pot. So after, of course, to be more sure, no, it doesn't work in. Okay, what's going on? Um, <laughs> After two years, we performed OCT analysis, and I, I just took the small run OCT run, so you can see what's going on and the distal part of the uh, left main and osteal LAD. But to be more more clear, this is the the OCT analysis. This is the proximal edge and also the indicator that shows that there, there is malopause struts, and of course at the cross section you can see there are malopause struts, stand struts, or free-floating struts in the left main. At the cross-section, where is the, the, the marker? We can see that the, the both wires from LED and circumflex are in intrastent, not abluminal. And, of course, when uh, we performed 3D uh, reconstruction, you can see that there is uh, fenestrated restenosis of osteal circumflex due to the endothelized struts of the stand previously implanted. And of course, we could, um, we could confirm the good wire position. I did, at that point, I wanted and I tried to go the distally, you know, but uh, when you have that small, uh, like, uh, stenosis of the osteum or circumflex, you're happy when you go to any strut. So, at this point, just to be sure what's going on and to properly plan our stenting technique, uh, we have to do just imaging, ju just or OCT or IOS, but for this case, uh, particularly, I think that the OCT is better. Then, of course, after the pre-dilatation of the circumflex, uh, and uh, after first after confirmation that the, the wire is at a good position in circumflex, we perform another OCT run, just to, to be more sure, and uh, also calculated that the length of the stent protruding about three millimeters from the carina to the left main, even maybe more. This is very difficult to, to estimate. This is the after pre dilatation opening open left circumflex. And after um, that knowledge was going on and the, the good, not abdominal wire position, but through the struts, we proceeded with the, with the easier part. And this is the stenting, of course. So uh, we chose the Ultimaster 4028 and decided to perform, of course, mini culotte technique according to the wire position. Uh, since the left main, as you could see on the previous OCT analysis, was uh, without disease, so I didn't choose to go from the osteum of the left main, just to, to, to choose the, another length of the, uh, di not another, just a stu enough length of the stand so we can do properly pot. Okay, and then the sequence is of very well known pot, rewiring, kissing with the boat, with the 4012 balloons, NC, and then repot with 508 balloon. And this was, uh, and after that, of course, we, we performed OCT analysis both from the circumflex and from the LAD. From the circumflex, what we can see, this is the proximal edge of the stand. Uh, no edge dissection, good, op good opposed uh, stent struts, distal stent edge, of course, the same, and the level of bif bifurcation that you can appreciate that there is a widely uh, open uh, side branch in this case, both circumflex and LAD. And another OCT run from LAD, where you can see that we have a double layer like mini culotte here and the distal of left main. And of course, widely open circumflex, and not just circumflex, but both side branches and nicely centered carina. And this was the final 
uh, NGO in the AP caudal, AP cranial view. And in the end, what can uh, we say when we have uh, to perform, to choose whether osteal, to perform osteal or crossover stenting, we should bear in mind uh, several things. This, th th these are pictures from one uh, review that um, I wrote together with my mentor Francesco Borzotta. So if you have a clear visual visualization of side branch takeoff, if there is no uh, disease in the distal left main, as you could see, it's less than 10%, wide bifurcation angle, and or extreme diameter mismatch between main vessel and side vessel that you want to stand, then osteal stenting could be an option, solid. However, when there is a very narrow angle, no clear visualization of side bridge takeoff, and when if there is unstable stent position that cannot allow you proper stent implantation, this is the, the, um, the, the place when you should do crossover stenting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mila, for this uh, excellent case. Uh, any comment from the panel? Yes? Uh, thank you. Uh, compliments for the case because the, the most important thing was something done in your cat lab resolved after the problems again in your catalog. This is really a good thing. Just a question about the first stent on the LAD. Uh, what kind of a stent? Because on OCT after two years and half, something like that, seems like a very new stent, no end utilization. Boy, maybe uh, what kind? The, all of uh, three, there were Ultimaster. Hmm. All of them. Two years. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Two Ultimaster in, in so we have LAD a and from, one. Uh, Thank you. From you Dr. Bakwat. So, so this is a watershed case in your career. You would never do osteal stenting after this. Agreed? <laughs> this happened to yes. me about seven yes, years ago. you're right. Watershed. This is a watershed event. Secondly, when you did the Nobody kissing did. balloon dilatation of the LAD, you incite, possibly would incite neointimal hyoplasia in an already well-settled stent, the LAD stent. So uh, I possibly would have, have a different, little different approach. I would have given the LED ostium the benefit of a drug coated balloon, sequent please neo or something, you know, the good balloons. So uh, after, after CTO recognition of LED, you would perform a drug coating balloon or? Now, now, when you stented the circumflex uh, ostium, left main to circumflex crossover. Uh, okay, after So the when you did a even kissing though, balloon. Even though there was nothing in the, in the ostium. Yes, but you, you never know how this behaves after six months. You, okay. you may get a new ISR at the LED ostium. Yeah. So we have uh, yeah, a CTO yeah. guy, who, uh, he wants to talk about bifurcation. Yeah, I'll just, I, I just tell a word. Uh, probably you, have been, you would have been recommended uh, a culotte in two procedures. I mean, uh, doing the, the course of a standing. Uh, Mila, you put a stand in the LED? Uh, no. The first, no. In the, the second, first time? No, no, no. Second, no, second time, no. No, no, no. no second time, so, no. Th this is, this is what Slightly. Thierry is calling a culotte in two procedures. Even if there are yes. two, uh, two and a half years between the two procedures. Yes, yes. This is Gerald. culotte in, in two steps. <laughs> in, in two years in, in between. Gerald? Yeah. Um, I'm a physiologist first, uh, not a CTO <laughs> person. Uh, so I doubt sometimes the FFR. Uh, you must doubt the FFR if there, it looks like a rather significant lesion. I know ANGIO doesn't, uh, isn't the gold standard, so I will question whether the hyperemic impulse was really sufficient. Was it IV adenosine? Was it a bolus? Was the bolus really sufficient? I heard today 98 micrograms for the LCA. That's too little in many patients. So I we must be critical about the hyperemic uh, impulse that we give. But you know, two Thank and a half years without symptoms. Thank you for your comment. Uh, yes, it, this was a bolus injection of adenosine. We used to, to do it only when we perform microcirculation, then is IV, but usually this is a bolus uh, intracoronary of adenosine for both uh, RCA and uh, circumflex. How much? How much? Uh, three, 300. 200 for left and 150 for, for right coronary artery. Could you tell us about the symptoms in these patients during this two and a half year? Uh, yeah. Did he suffer from angina or not? 
No, no. between uh, from the first procedure until the second, maybe three months before the second pro procedure, he was without any symptoms. Yes. Yeah, it's a very interesting case. Uh, you know, when you did the imaging, uh, there was no not much disease in the left main stem. The other option would have been to treat uh, this with a drug-coated balloon. So you could have crossed after crossing with the wire uh, lesion preparation and just treat it with drug-coated balloon. That can avoid stenting into the left main and make it, it complex because the risk uh, of restenosis will be a little bit higher here, either in the LED or the left main stem. Yeah, I get your point, but. Uh, at the first procedure, there was disease on left circumflex, and that's why, but okay, yes, it, it can be acceptable to perform a drug coating, but, but however, when you have the, those struts protruding in left main, I wanted to, to complete the procedure, not to complete, but we could do, okay, um, like kissing with the drug coating balloon, like in previous case that we saw from a guy from Madrid. However, I won't, won't be, um, sure that this is the best option for this patient. You know, I wanted to, pro to complete the procedures. Since the lesion in the left circumflex on the first procedure, it was longer than five millimeters. It was about 10 millimeters. There, there was uh, stenosis at the first procedure as well. Not yeah, just, not just fenestrated rest stenosis and just osteal circumflex after due to the stand strat. So maybe th there was a combination of both the disease progression and of course endothelized stand struts uh, into the left or in front of the ostium of circumflex. Uh, we have a last uh, comment from Dr. Zavik. Yeah, uh, nicely presented. Thank you for, for presenting this and uh, for showing us your moment. <laughs> Um, very, very helpful, and uh, it's really not a mini culotte, is it? It's a T stent, right? Because you, your no. LED stent, I think, only went to the, or your LED stent went to the left main, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Stent so, so. went to the left main. The original one. Since there was, yeah, mm. totally. It's a, it's a culotte. It's is a culotte. it a culotte? Oh, yeah. culotte? A short one. But it's a culotte. No, it's mi so, mini so, culotte, the, yes. so the original stand actually went into the left yes, vein? Yes, uh, un, yes. Un, unintentionally, of course. Okay. Unintentionally, yes. I yes. thought it just hit the ostium, but... Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, no. all right. It covered I, the ostium of the circumflex. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we have any data to uh, support using a DEB in, in this part of the procedure. Uh, if we had data, then that might be helpful, but th there's almost no disease in the LAD or left main, right? So I... Um, I, I think it's conjecture to, to think that we we're going to be helping with the DEB here. I, I agree with your approach. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mila, thank for you. this excellent case. And then we move to the last one from uh, Ronnie Mathieu from India. Left main bifurcation, decay crush that went awry. Right, good evening, and thank you for the invitation. So this case that I'm gonna show you was performed about two months back during a live national conference in India by me and Dr. Ziad. So, so this is the story of a 65-year-old lady, diabetic, she had an NSTMI anterior wall, she had a, a long LED lesion, which was quite tight. She had a circumflex OM that was also tight, long, it was a complex bifurcation. So we decided uh, uh, that we're gonna go with an upfront two stent strategy. So though on angiogram, the LM doesn't look all that significant on OCT, it was involved. And we proceeded for the OCT. So conventionally, when you pass this OCT catheter and you don't get a dye clearance, you can't do an OCT. So we, we decided to show how we can still do an OCT uh, by injecting dye through the flush port of the OCT catheter, displacing blood distally, simultaneously giving an injection via the guide and doing a manual pullback. And that's the OCT run that we did get. And uh, distally, or mid part, the LED looks good. As you come proximally, you see a lot of fibrotic, lipid plaque, 
and uh, that's the left main. So that's the left main that has got roughly 3.9 millimeter diameter. The distal left main has got an MLA of 2.64. Austral LED is diseased. And if you look at the Austral LED, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, you can see the EEL, but otherwise you can't see the EEL. So we were not very really sure if this is negatively remodeled. But anyway, based on all this data that we got, we decided to go for a DK crush. And uh, the first path that we, we uh, kept a stent into the circumflex, as you see, a 2.7518 zines, and uh, deployed that, and uh, subsequently crushed it. On the left panel is the, is the spider view where you see the LED, the balloon in the LED that's crushing it with a three millimeter, and that's the result on the right panel. So once we did this, we, I, I went for the step crush or, or what is called the pot crush. Again, on the left panel, if you see the shoulder is exactly at the stent in the circumflex OM. And uh, after this, <clears throat> when we did the angio, that's what we saw. And uh, it was pretty massive. And uh, there was a drop in pressures with collapse. So what we did is immediately removed this balloon, took another balloon in, a three millimeter balloon, and tried to occlude this perforation. So now we have two problems now. The one is, if you look at the left panel again, in that 15 seconds, there's been a massive filling in the pericardium. You can see the pericardium full of blood with contrast. And the second thing is this balloon, the perforation is so proximal that the balloon occludes the entire left circumflex. And uh, the patient's unable to tolerate that. So, of course, we did a pericardiocentesis, do the autoperfusion, that's the hand of the anesthetist coming in, and tried to stabilize her, kept the balloon a little more distally so that we have contrast flowing into the circumflex, uh, as you see there, and uh, the thought process started. So, uh, by the time we stabilized the patient, we, it was five minutes, and we tried to see if we had uh, any luck, but there's no luck, there's a massive perforation still going on, so we decided to go for the ping pong. And that is basically, we took an ATF guide through the left femoral, the, we wired the guide while deflating the perforation occlusion balloon, and inflating it immediately after wiring, and primarily to limit the leak that we were having, because the leak was pretty bad. So once we did that, we deflated the balloon, took it back into the guide, and tried to push the graph master in. But the graph master does not track into the LAD. And we don't have the papyrus in India. And, and, and primarily because the graph master has got a huge profile. And uh, that's one. And second is that maybe that the crushed stent in the circumflex is hindering the passage. So the plan one really doesn't work, and so we decide to go to the next plan, and that is we thought we'd take a guide extension through this, and uh, through the crushed l stent and deploy the graph master into the LED. But again, if you look at the graph master, uh, the, 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 uh, the guide extensions that we had of six French, none of this will take a graph master in. We tried on the bench, but the, the, the graph master doesn't go in. And in fact, just for information, it's only a 6F guide that can take a graph master in. Because the 6F guide has got an internal die of 070. And the graph master has a, a profile of 068. So since the plan two didn't work, we decided to go to plan three. And that was, we thought that if we go with the steps of that, that is first recross and kiss, maybe we'd be able to cross with the graph master. So recrossing itself took about 15, 20 seconds, and in that recrossing, it fills faster than we can aspirate. And again, she collapses, so again, we, 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 we aspirate, do autoperfusion, kiss with a three in the LED, kiss with a 2.75 in the circ, and then do that and do the pot, and then immediately try that. That is, remove again the balloon from guide one, into the guiding catheter and push the graph master through the second guiding catheter. But again, it does not track. And that's what you see. At this point, we had the balloon in the circumflex trying to help us push the graph master in. So we decided to do it without the balloon. But again, the graph master just wouldn't go in. And it, in fact, 
buckled back. And all this while, you know, the perforation, I mean, she leaks and we keep aspirating. At this point, we decided that, you know, uh, things are getting a little sticky and, you know, the ECMO team was ready to put in their lines and the surgical team was activated. And uh, before we gave it to them, we said, we're going to try one more. And that is, we're going to use a, a multi-purpose, like a mother-child. So we took a 6F multi-purpose 120 centimeters. This guide is 100 centimeters. So we try to do that, but again, as you see, the graph master doesn't cross because the graph master just kept, keeps hitting, even the guide keeps hitting onto the crushed tent. So what we did is we took a balloon, slowly inflated it, as you see on the right panel, and gently guided this multi-purpose across this crushed circumflex tent. And uh, the, 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 the multi-purpose just seemed to go in and uh, Luckily for us, the graph master did cross with that maneuver. So the graph master crossed, and now the question is to position it very precisely, because the graph master shouldn't occlude the circumflex, but circumflex is quite an important vessel for her. So we try to do it as best as we can, and uh, luckily it has not occluded the circumflex. So then we went and we kissed that, the partial seal, and, 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 and thank God, it looked as if everything was stable. But now she started developing a recurrent VT. So we shocked her multiple times, gave her drugs. So of course, we have not handled the, the, the LM, so we decided we're going to do an OCT at this point of time to see what's actually going on. Why is she developing this recurrent VTs? So that's the OCT that was done. So that's being pulled back from the mid-LAD. And if you look at distally, there is this dissection, pretty small, and that's the OCT inside the covered stent. Uh, I mean, it looks like an eclipse. And as you come proximally, you see at 11 o'clock, the circumflex ostium is not covered, luckily. But then again, coming to the left main, there's a huge dissection in the left main. And that's not surprising, considering what we have done with all these multiple guides. So that's the left main, there's a dissection, that's the graph master. With our luck, it's placed perfectly, and the circumflex ostium is spared. There's a distal dissection. So then, now it becomes very simple. So we said we're going to go and do a, do a crossover stenting, 3.518 from the left main into the graph master. And uh, then we did recross into the circumflex, kissed it with a 3, 2.75, did a pot, that's the second part of the DK crush. And then things look good. The distally, the LED didn't, uh, there was a small dissection, so we went and covered that again with another stent, a 2.75. And finally, after six minutes, 60 minutes of terror, we were able to get a decent result and stabilize the patient with the pericardiocentesis catheter inside. And uh, the follow-up was good. We continued the DAPT. We removed the pigtail on, the, on day two. She was shifted to room on day three. She was discharged on day five. And now we have a one month follow up and that's her echo that you see. And it seems to be going well, at least for now. Thank you all for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ronnie, for sharing this uh, huge complication uh, and uh, how to solve it. Uh, just one comment. Uh, I like very much what you said about auto transfusion of the patient. I think it's crucial to do that. So, can you explain how you do that? Right. So, when you have this massive perforation into the pericardium, uh, the amount of blood that goes into the pericardium, you just will not be able to transfuse that. So, what we do is take immediately a, a femoral line from the vein or a peripheral line, and you keep aspirating this and pushing it back into the venous system. We prefer a peripheral line, but with massive perforations like this, you're going to aspirate 50 cc in about uh, 30 seconds, and you've got to send this 50 cc immediately in. So, so this is auto perfusion, and I think for this lady, at least about 30 minutes of auto perfusion went on, and and and, and that's and that's a lifesaver because blood will come, but this helps. Yeah, I think it's a very important technique when you have this kind of complication. Yes, we have a comment. Mm -hmm. oh. Question. Yeah. <clears throat> well done. I think it was a nice case. Um, but when you were struggling with the Ultimaster, obviously it's it's hooking onto something. 
So I think what I would have done earlier was stent LAD into the left main, do a good pot that will take away all the ruffle part, all the things that where your Ultimaster is hooking on, and then you would be able to get your Ultimaster down much quicker. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, however, what we were trying is, you know, the, 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 the perforation was so massive and the pumping was so bad. So we were always trying to occlude the LED and trying to get a device into the LED. So uh, our main aim was to occlude the perfusion, uh, I mean the perforation at that point of time. Dr. Rabb? Yeah. So two, two comments. So do you think the pot balloon caused the, while you're trying to crush with a larger balloon, caused the perforation to occur? Because then the perforation should really have been at the ostium of the LED, not further down, unless the balloon slipped. And secondly, this graph master will close. I mean, the, the restenosis rates are very high. So what are you going to do prophylactically down the line? Would you offer cabbage or, or because this will close down? I mean. Right. So uh, uh, up. Question one, and uh, uh, that's regarding the cost for this, and that's something that we worked on it, trying to look at the OCT, pre-OCT, you know, in a lot of detail. So the left main was 3.9, so probably we should have used a 3.75 balloon. But again, what we thought was that the proximal LED, and that's what I pointed out initially, that there was possibly a negative remodeling. But you must appreciate that there is a limitation to the OCT to decide on negative remodeling because the EEL is not visualized uh, behind the plaque because of attenuation features. So probably that's a negative remodeling that caused this perforation because otherwise we generally do a pot crush and we don't find this. So the second part of the question, and I hope what you say doesn't come true, but we'll probably tackle it with a, with a, with, with a graph to the LED in case she comes to the restenosis. A comment from Gerald? Yeah, uh, actually also these two points that you just mentioned. You do OCT and then you draw uh, un not understandable conclusion in sizing the, the balloon. Yeah? The left main was 3.9 as I understood. So if we believe in all the laws of bifurcation, uh, the stand was definitely t too large. And, the balloon, yeah. Uh, the balloon. But, and I think uh, when I, in the setting of CTOs, we are supposedly creating more perforations. Uh, when we create a perforation, I always put a drug eluting stent first. This is the first rule that you should, when you do a papyrus or a graft master, put the drug, drug eluting stent outside, then you don't have a problem later. The graft master generally will not go through a stent. It's, it's, I think a papyrus will do that. And, uh, and you know, because the graft master is too bulky. Unless you really have a 3.5 or a 4 stent, it, it's very difficult to manipulate the graft master. Well, I had used you have graft that, masters okay. many years until the papyrus come. I, I give you that. The papyrus is a huge advance, but still you would have put your had a 4.0 balloon, you put a 3.5 stent there, and then you definitely get your graft master in. So you'll have three layers of stents, two of the graft master and one of the drug eluting stents. So three layers of metal. But at least some drug outside. Mm. I think in this case, uh, the purpose was to save the life of the patient uh, because uh, it was a huge perforation, and it's really unusual to have this kind of complication when you treat uh, bifurcation lesions. Francesco. So, uh, first of all, congratulations. I think that we may discuss a lot about uh, how to best do, but I mean, you saved uh, a life uh, in, a, in, a, in a condition that was really nasty. So, congratulations. I want to come back to the POT balloon used. Uh, one remark is the size. I think that we should have in mind the fact that uh, when we are using pot similar, uh, uh, balloon similar to pot, for crushing the stent. It is not a pot, really a pot. The aim is not to dilate anything. It is just to ensure that there is a better a position of the two stent struts into the part of the prox in the proximal part of the ostium, proximal to the ostium. This means that one of the aspects is the fact that the sides should be according to the lumen, not the media, like we do, I mean, in the po final post-dilation. And the other point is the fact that we should not reach the carina, because it's not the carina 
level that we want, but it is in the proximal part of the ostium that we want to have the backing of the balloon. So I think that this is what I learned from this, the fact that we should remember if using a POT balloon that the aim is to oppose distant struts crashed in the very proximal part, so stay away from Carina. Probably this is the message for me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I entirely agree with you on that. Okay, so everybody has votes. Because we have two people who are very, very close. So are you sure about your vote? <laughs> okay, so can we see the result? Oh, so it's, it changed every time. Okay, so you see they are very close. Or ex -eco. So Ronnie and Mila. But I have only one gift. <laughs> what can we do? Okay, so I will give it to, to Mila first. And then we'll find something to Ronnie. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it's not a tie, like in your case, yours, it's uh, many years ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Kiss. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, Roni, I, I will, uh, I don't know, we cannot share the, the book, but... I hope they, they have something else for the shared first place. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, Thank you very much for uh, being uh, so uh, present, even late. I think we are closing relatively early uh, compared to previous years, so it's not so bad. <laughs> Thank you, and see you tomorrow morning at 8. 8 o'clock in the morning.